All right, testing, testing. Oh, damn, I need to change this title. I need to change this title. Hi, TJ. I need to... Oh, no, this is on this one. Okay. Well, I just did my own testing. Uh, let me update. Uh, yeah, I don't like this title. Let's see. Uh, Black Preachers are Democrat pets. Black Preachers, no. Nah. Let's go with Black Preachers and fake Black Preachers and I don't know. Uh, buck, fake, I don't know. Fake black preachers, I said black people, Chicago. Uh, done. All right. Let's see. Let me see. I'm constantly changing this shit. Oh, uh, let me call him. I agree, Black. Oh, I missed that one. Uh, hi, Vanessa. I need to change this title. Fake Black Preachers. Black Leaders. Black Politicians. Something. This is Joe Black. Uh, he must be coming on. I need to change this title. I don't like this title. And it just came to me right now. It just came to me that I don't like this title. I need to change it to what I don't know. Hi, Blue Lion. Hi, everybody on YouTube. What I'm going to change it to, let me see. What exactly is trending? Corey Bush, Ilian Omar. Yeah, that's what I... Uh, uh, Fake. Actually, I'm just going to type their name in. Ilion. Omar. And. Uh, Black churches. Yeah, Corey Bush, Ilion Omar, and Black Churches, and then anything else. I don't need this World War Three shit in here. Um, done. All right. Let me, did I share this? I did share it, yeah. I think I should share it on here as well. Um, yeah, let me share it here. Send via direct. I'll send it here. Here, 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 here. 
here, here. All right. Um, okay, more people are coming in. Uh, I'm, I'm just waiting for the judge to come on, guys. That's all. I'm just waiting for him to come on. Um, so yeah. Sometimes I think that I'm, I'm and I may end up changing this title again. But I want to touch on Corey Bush, Elahan, Omar, and Black Churches all in one. Because the overall theme is you know, our own quote unquote black leaders are replacing us with immigrants. <clears throat> and maybe I need to change the title to that. Are black people being replaced by illegals? Because I'm thinking that other spaces have that same title. Are black people being replaced by illegals? <clears throat> I think that's a better title. Um, let me know what y'all think. How about black people questionable loyalty to that? That's too long for Twitter space. <laughs> Are black people being replaced by illegals? Yeah, that's what I'm going to change it to. I don't want to keep throwing all these damn names up in here. Uh, all right. Are black people being replaced by hashtag illegals? Yeah. Question mark. So under this topic, I get to touch on the different black congressional representation, the black church, and anybody else that is pro uh, migrants, pro illegal migrants. This is better. Um, so I'm just waiting for the judge to log on. So let me send him this. Let's see. No, not copy this. Let me send him this link because this is his Twitter space. And whenever he log on, we can start Black Church versus Black Community Wellbeing. Uh, that's a good one. But it's not a either or because I actually I'm combining um, Ja, the informant. I'm actually um, including the black community in that question. Like I'm including everybody black in that question. Are, are black people being replaced by illegals? And we are. And we are. Oh, I have to put his, um, I need to put his, what is this? Judge Joe Brown barbecue sauce in here, along with the link. Uh, and let me put this one. And then we're kind of early today. We usually start at five. And then I need the website. Let's see, JJB BBQ. JJB BBQ dot com. Hi, Negro. Uh, let's see. Copy and paste. That one. And then I want to put the Amazon one in. Oh, here he goes. Actually, let me make you invite to co-host. There you go. Um, 
Amazon. Can you hear me? You come, you're coming in loudly and clearly. How yeah, are we you? Hear you? Thank you. How are you? I'll manage. It's okay. So I ended up changing it, um, the title um, because I don't know. I just think this one sounds better as far as our black people being replaced by illegals because that allows us to talk about how the black church plays a part because we were talking about that earlier, how these congressional black represent representatives are playing a part because you have Elin Omar. They are calling for her to be deported, not even resign. They want her to be deported because she's saying that her sole purpose is for the Somalians. You have Cori Bush under investigation, but none of the black congressional representatives and even our local representatives are doing nothing to help their constituents, which are black, and they're doing everything to make sure that the illegal migrants are getting all types of social services and allowed to come here. So, And you see the Jewish uh, organization that is raising, uh, what is it, $100 million to try and defeat certain members of the Black Caucus who don't support Israel. So, yeah, it's getting real interesting. Yeah, it's getting real interesting, but I'm just like... Those same um, Zionists, they don't care about us being replaced by the illegals. So mm, maybe they. I, I look at it maybe. not so much care. Like, okay, I would support you getting rid of them as long as you are willing to help us. Well, yeah, that's it. See, they're supposed to be a mutual compact. That whole NAACP thing over a hundred some years was something that was of mutual benefit to the Jewish community. Um, I'm older than most, so I've been exposed to the NAACP my whole life. And I remember a lot of Jewish people being very candid about it. They helped out the NAACP because they were helping themselves out. In other words, if you couldn't do it to a Negro, you couldn't do it to a Jew. And a hundred plus years ago, things weren't good for them either. So, well, better than for us. And some of them own slaves, but they were getting a hard way to go. So mm -hmm. it is what it is. And then Thurgood Marshall said in a lecture I attended years ago, he said, my theory was since the Jews were helping Hello. Can uh, you guys hear me? Am I still on? Oh, you went out. Okay, yeah, you're still on. I, I just want to make sure so, it wasn't me. Okay. Thurgood Marshall said since uh, the Jews are helping us out, and their motive is if you can't do it to a Negro, or you can't do it to a Jew. Well, I'll take that one step further down since other than the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, there are basically no civil rights uh, case law or anything else on the record. So maybe what we need to do is expand it. And he came up with the idea that ASPCA, American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, had statutory regulations to protect animals so his theory was as if you couldn't do it to a dog you couldn't do it to a negro you couldn't do it to a negro you couldn't do it to a jew so after let's say 1906 to now um, oh that's a good 120 years let's say almost shy a couple 118 so after an uneasy alliance with all of the up and downs that went with it. It's interesting to see where it's turning to now. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Okay. Well, um, before we get into the meat and potatoes and everything, um, I want to say hello to everybody on YouTube. Judge, say hi to everybody on YouTube. Hi, everybody on YouTube. <laughs> 
And hello to everybody here on the Twitter space. Um, and of course, if you guys want to request to come up, please do so. I am going to get to um, the hands because the Negro and Kanye came up um, early. Um, also, I put in the Jumbotron two links to Judge Joe Brown Barbecue Sauce website. And the second link is the Barbecue Sauce on Amazon. So you can go to the website. And you have like more options, the barbecue sauce, the links, the sausage links and the seasonings. You can get it right off the website or you can go to Amazon and order your three pack of the original and spicy and chicken and um, seasoning um, on Amazon. So, you know, and everybody uses Amazon. So, yeah, those are links are in the comment and in the Jumbotron. What are you doing? What do you mean? What am I doing? I'm just. I hear rattling. Yeah, well, you might hear rattling. Um. So yeah. So go and support Judge Joe Brown Barbecue Sauce. Um, it's delicious. And I'm also gonna put it in the YouTube chat as well. I didn't forget you guys. Um. So okay, you were at a speaking engagement Saturday in Mississippi. Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, it's in Tennessee. Mm hmm. And you spoke, you was telling me some of your speech and I actually uploaded on um, the YouTube, the Real Judge Joe Brown 23 on YouTube. Um, it's like a two minute speech, Ricky tagged me in. But can you, let's start off talking about the black church, right? Um, and then I'm gonna go to the hands. Uh, but can you just tell people what was that event about and the basis well, of your speech? It was about Dr. King it was honoring him and everybody in the church was joyous and they were singing hymns and they were smiling and dancing so when I got up I said why are you dancing what are you celebrating you ought to be embarrassed I said uh, we live depending upon which way you take the road anywhere from about 25 minutes to an hour to get to Memphis. A lot of you live in Memphis. Said, and it's been 56 years since King was slain, and we have had multiple DAs, and not one of them has been required to answer why they have not reopened the investigation on who killed King. I said, we've got a lot of bad stuff up in here, but we're jumping up and down, singing and dancing with joyous looks on our faces. And I went on from there and I broke down what I'd learned as being the last judge on the case, which is essentially uh, James Earl Ray did not kill King. The FBI recruited two snipers from the Quantico Marine Corps Sniper School which was right across from the FBI training facility. They requisitioned five XM-21 weapons, 762, and 5,000 rounds of the ammunition that matches what got pulled out of King's body. And the five weapons that they had received in late December on invoice, the serial numbers I've recorded and put various places. Well, ballistic characteristics of those weapons and the ammunition precisely match the unique characteristics of what they pulled out of King's body. And then late April 68, after King is slain early in that month, the FBI was ordered to return all five rifles. They claimed they lost one. And I've got the serial numbers for the four they returned. So the missing one is the murder weapon. There's a whole lot of circumstantial evidence to get somebody convicted. And it was a two-man sniper team. And the shot came from the fire station, not the flop house, not the bushes. And I broke it down and I was saying, aren't you a little ashamed of yourself to be this near to a situation that so gravely impacts everybody in this room? What is your problem? 
And then they got to talking about some other stuff. I said, I was at UCLA a few years back. That's where I graduated from, got my bachelor's degree and my doctorate from there. And I was listening to some black folk talk about they wouldn't have gotten in UCLA because without rather Martin Luther King and his nonviolent demonstrations. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that way back when the dean was named Murray Schwartz. And he had entered into an agreement with the black students who are not this kind of boule little passive person, you know, today. But rather aggressive we were. And a certain individual who's now dead, his wife is on a federal appellate bench, a great woman, and he was a judge. But he's passed on. He was one of my mentors. Another gentleman was in there. He made a success of himself. Uh, he's passed on. And the third person passed on. And the dean's passed on. Well, the dean reneged on the agreement. And one of these gentlemen pulled out his four-inch python, cocked it, put it to the dean's head, and said, I'm counting to five. You either start signing that document or you die right here. So when we start talking about all of what we think God got for us by certain kinds of methodologies, there's a whole lot behind the scenes that is obscured by the mass ignorance of young black folk today who have no clue as to what really opened the doors for them. And I went off on that kind of um, bend, and I just broke down some people in the local area that actually could claim the status of hero, but got neglected. And I kind of sort of got into one of the preachers and he, he wound up agreeing that too often there is a thing where everybody tries to say everything that black folk got came up out of a church, but it didn't. So we see the spectacle, and I posted something. It maybe was last night, maybe it was the day. I don't remember, right here on X slash Twitter. And we were talking about, or I was talking about, let's see, uh, black preachers and some of the stuff they were doing, which is what I think prompted you to come up with this topic. So let me see what it was that I had something to say about that. Oh, you remember? Yes. I said, buck preachers always were favorite pets of the Democratic Party and their long history of breeding Negroes for fun and profit. Black preachers pray for Biden while using God to keep Black Americans voting Democrat. And I think back on something else that a lot of Black preachers need to atone for. And that was when I did have occasion to study the slave pamphlets that were on microfilm back in the, well, it's been 50 years ago. I was doing an intern thing with the DC think tank. I read over and over again that the slave masters were instructed to get a stud to increase their livestock for profitability and to generate labor sources. And that, I'm sorry, can y'all hear the Twitter? Can you can you guys hear the the Twitter? Okay, so Rod Rod Rick. If you can't hear the Twitter live, you need to go out and come back in. Okay. Well, anyway, back to this point, getting with the preachers. The slave owners were instructed to go buy studs. And they were sort of instructed to do two for one. Make the stud your preacher. And always pay attention to the churches, not to see what the preachers were saying but to watch the women. 
And when the women got hot and happy and got to rolling all over the ground, they were supposed to be coming in the heat. So you would have the preacher come visit them within the next three days if you wanted them to get with child or with a calf, they sometimes called it. So you could increase your two leg livestock. And that kind of thing has been going on for a long time and has not been that long. I used to represent the Black Baptist Ministers Alliance in Memphis 35 years ago. And I remember at one conference they had, I was sitting there as a minute advisor and they were talking about insurance plans. And it struck me as particularly significant because a lot of things fell into place when I started listening to this guy say, on average, assuming reasonable health, your typical black preacher preaches for 50 years. Now, this was in the 1980s. And then it hit me. I said, it's, 19, it's 1860. And you've got a slave preacher who's also the slave stud for the plantation or the surrounding area. 50 years means he's going to be preaching until 1910. When he's too old and a new preacher takes over, he will be trained up by that old one. That's 1910. He'll be preaching till 1960. When this person takes over, the third individual starts preaching from 1960 to 2010. Now, this was in the 1980s, so there was still 30 years to go. And I'm saying, you know what? That means that the current preachers in these big black churches are effectively just the grandsons of the slave preachers as a generational thing. And I think in my mind's eye at this point, when I'm visiting the churches of some of my clients, I'm thinking about all the women shouting and throwing themselves on the floor and rolling over and the nurses fanning them and throwing books and purses. And I start thinking back about what I was reading, where it went on from the early 1700s all the way up to right when the Civil War started. The slave owners were told to watch for the Negro females who got the shouting and rolling on the floor so you could make sure that the slave preachers screwed them and got them knocked up to increase your livestock. And that's a sin that needs to be atoned for. So I got to talking about what are we doing here? We talk about belief, but nobody talks about behavior. And somewhere in here, you have to atone for the things that have been neglected when it comes to doing what needs to be done for the people. Now, I'll leave it at that and just say that's what prompted our discussion the other day. Right. Um, can everybody please um, retweet or repost this space? And before I get to the hands and anybody else want to request to come up, um, I want you to answer this question, Judge. Are Black people being replaced by illegals? I don't think it's so much replaced as there is another motive. This is not about workforce. This is about getting numbers so that California, Illinois, New York, uh, New Jersey, Philadelphia, they pick up extra representatives in Congress who will be elected to represent people that can't even vote for them. And that's also behind this effort to make D.C. a state, which is to get a small, medium-sized city, two senators, and two voting members of the House so that they can push a certain agenda, a cult agenda. And that's what it's about. The problem with trying to get surplus labor, well, not surplus, but to get labor, is that we have a great surplus of labor, which makes this so abysmally stupid what's being done. 
There are not enough jobs that go around right now that pay the kind of money that the American public expects that they will get as wages. And that generates some abysmal responses to that problem. Labor is a commodity. And when you get a commodity glut, you do three things. You cut back production, subsidize the producer, and store the surplus. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that's why we have this problem with the pipeline from schoolhouse to jailhouse, because there are not enough jobs to go around. So what you do is you store the surplus. You put it in a jail cell instead of a grain silo. The subsidy is the welfare check that so many people want to get one of. And cutting back a production is the stuck on stupid you can pick up by just perusing what people post on an awful lot on X. You can see it. And when you start thinking like that, you basically diminish your employment opportunities or your employment worth. You also, when you get the clowning like it's so popular and ideation on half naked hippos and dysfunction and random purposeless violence and elimination of masculinity, then what you wind up doing is creating hell in impacted neighborhoods so they can't use the political process for constructive purposes of community self-help. And you got a huge, humongous jail population. I know, I know people work in the jails, but that's not because they want your free labor. They don't give a damn. All they're trying to do is keep the population orderly and idle minds mischief make. That's an all saying. So they want you occupied so you don't make mischief. But we got a wicked thing going and these damn fools who have caused it are trying to compound it and make it worse. And even though I don't think they want them in here directly as free labor or cheap labor, they want them in here for the political consequences or advantages. And by the way, that's article one of the constitution that talks about that. They are going to do what they typically do, which is not pay attention to the consequences, not think stuff through, but go off on an emotive mindset and make a worse mess of what's already a bad mess. Now, I'll pass the mic. Okay. That was just setting the stage. Yes. And um, it goes and I, back to black preachers. What are you doing when you're supposed to be a repository of moral behavior and moral fiber in a community and you tell your congregation what they do doesn't make any difference. Like the hell it doesn't. That's the problem. And then you turn around, all they got to do is believe and it doesn't make any difference what their behavior is about, dysfunctional or otherwise. And now, um, before I, I, before I, I yeah, I'm going to go to the Negro real quick. I want to say hi, Mr. Mark Carter. Mr. Carter, honey, um, if you want to come up and speak, um, you can and I'll make you a co-host. But I love Mark Carter because he's it's like, me. What? Um, uh, I love him because he's like boots on the ground, honey. Um, actually, let me make him co-host. Um, all right, go ahead. Um, the Negro. Um, uh, what's up, Dana Judge, and what up, King Carter? Um, the trio in the house, in the building, the place to be. Um, are black people being replaced by illegals? Black people in Chicago. Um. I'm gonna go ahead. And, I'm gonna say yes. That we are being replaced, um, and I'm gonna go about it from an academic standpoint. I'm in college, right? I'm in grad school, right? And and I see this um, notion that's going on when it comes to Black American people, our interests, our inventions, and everything that we've done in American soil. It gets circle navigated underneath the guise of globalism. Um, they want to talk about the atrocities all around the world to try to equate to what happened on American soil. Um, and I see that that it started off academically. And then now I see it's being perpetuated um, in the physical world. You know, um, when, when I go up to Yale, like several years back, they were talking about slavery through antiquity, talking about slavery throughout the ages in order to undermine, I would consider modern day slavery, which is the slavery of chattel slavery of the Negro. 
So when you have these type of um, ideologies flourishing, where that everybody on the around the world can get onto these concepts and say that they're American and they're not, it causes us to be replaced. And then you look at it from an academic standpoint where the children in our school, they're not getting the knowledge that they need to be successful and to build institutions in their neighborhood. They just, they're, they're um, going to school to be better students and better workers for white folks. Um, and, and if you have students that challenge or critically think about these type of things and these type of situations, they're not supported. Um, they're not supported with the books and the stuff that they need, or they're not supported by their professors and, and, and the institution itself. And that's half of it is because of the, that, that diversity, equity, inclusion thing and, and globalization. So like those are just some of the things where we're being replaced on all levels. But I'm just going to speak about it from an academic standpoint that I see it all the time. Um, I see it all the time. Well, yeah. let me ask you a question. Isn't that our fault? No, not necessarily. Um, I, I put up with it. We did. Uh, well, well, the years thing ago, is, 55 years ago, uh, trust me, it was not as easy then as it is now. They were lynching people. Police were shooting folk all the time. They still had places in the South where they had de facto segregation. They wouldn't even let you come up and look at a water fountain that said uh, white only. And they were shooting people. There were some real harsh consequences. We didn't put up with it. Why do you guys put up with it? I don't get it. Well, I don't put up with it, but there's other, what, what I say is, is, is that there's a um, culture within the school systems where they embolden or they support like the LBGTQ black male or they support the feminist black woman. And they do that at the expense of the heterosexual black man. Well, why don't you call him a punk? Call him well, out. Say punk. Well, 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 What's wrong what, with you? Brother, uh, you can say something about it. You got free speech, or are we supposed to? I thought. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've said things. Like, I have an article about, uh, that wasn't even what I wanted to um, discuss about even fully, but I have an article which talked about, that talks about specifically how they support modern day slavery, but they won't give us reparations. And I had to well, put that down. Like, 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 the thing is, they're currently giving money all around the world to these other nations under the fact of um, de facto globalism and stuff of that nature to basically discredit our, our justice claim. Um, and this is just, a, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't we have a strong congressional black caucus? Why aren't they doing something about it? Compromise. Half of, half of those people are immigrants. Like you talking no, about being no, replaced. No, the CBC, no, yes, no, no, the CBC no, no, more than. That ain't got nothing to do with it. Try this one. Congressman Steve Cohen, 9th District of Tennessee in Memphis, 92% black district. He's gay, he's white, he's Jewish. And he is the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus's Reparations Committee. Maybe that's why we don't get it. Um, what in the, well, his, his, net, his net legislative output for 19 years that he's been in is a binding resolution on Congress to use paper straws in the cafeteria. But that's who they put over the reparations committee. He didn't force his way in. That's the Congressional Black Caucus elected him to that position. And, 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 and so that, we have we, our representatives surely enough to get some legislation introduced, but it does not exist. Why not? It doesn't exist because half of the people that's in the CBC are not from our lineage. And some oh, of them are directly. Oh, 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 that's not half of them. What has Maxine <laughs> Smith done? She's been black her whole life born in America. I remember when she you mean ran Maxine for Waters? Waters. Maxine Waters, yeah. She ran the first time. What's her excuse? How about the fake one that's in there right now? Come Queen. Come Queen La Harris Imhoff, Mrs. Imhoff. 
Why in the hell, since she's trying to claim black now, hasn't she done something about it all the years she had a chance to? How about Cory Booker? Yeah, he FBA all the way, honey, and he's been a but, but the thing is, you're one. you're pointing to the losers of the of, of our community and expecting the them to pull a winning way, strategy, I, and I can't, I can't go them. The seats of power, and they don't have what it takes to exercise that power because they aren't one of us. They just look like us, and we're so stuck on stupid, we go on appearances. Hell, we want black. But then you got a Rolls Royce and you got a Volkswagen, one both of them black. So you got a choice between getting a, a, a gold Rolls Royce and a black Volkswagen and you take the damn Volkswagen, not you, but us over the Rolls Royce because it's painted black. Doesn't make um, any sense. I'm sorry. I mean, I don't mean to get on you, son. I'm just making a point here for the dramatic purposes of it all. No, um, you cool, Judge. You wait, cool, one, one second, one second, Negro. Um, before I go to Kanye, um, because I did make Mark um co-host and Mark, um, of course, Judge, you remember Mark Carter? Um, oh yeah. And he's in Chicago, so I don't know. Do you want to say something now, Mark, to the topics or? Cause I know you be busy, honey. Like you on the go. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I mean, just to go straight to the point, <clears throat> uh, be, because uh, well, let, let me say it like this. Yes, they were going to replace us without saying the, no different than they did in California uh, if we hadn't stepped up. And so, with us stepping up, it is a uh, uh, cause of a rift in the plan. And, and again, our city was the first city that that had the, the first of the new Americans. And so this Office of New Americans was set up to do just that and then to be spread across the country through City for Action uh, um, through these mayors. And that's where the real big problem is coming from. These Democrat mayors are giving these cities away. And I'm, I'm, I'll say this and just get straight to the point. You vote for the Democrat Party and whatever happens. So whatever happens to you when it comes down to your city being given away, it's your fault. I mean, it, it, there's no other way to say it. The Democrat Party is giving your city away. And if you vote for the Democrat Party for whatever reason, women's rights, gay rights, you know what I'm saying? Your ass end up homeless with your gay right and your women's rights and your whatever rights you went in as a, as a man or whatever. You get those rights and you homeless. It's on you. We, we got to get past just even talking about it. Uh, it is what it is at this stage in the game. You either going to vote for you and your family and your people and, and, and Americans, or you gonna vote for immigrants? There's no in between. And, and they're stuck on stupid. We got a new mayor just got elected in Memphis, a black female chief of police and a black sheriff. And the three of them are talking about making Memphis, Tennessee a sanctuary city. We are the murder capital of the United States and that's what their solution is. Not only that, they came up with a scheme. They had a press conference on. You know what it is? Let's pay the crooks to not commit crime. Now, first off, how are you going to identify who's a crook to begin with? I mean, duh. They don't think about that. And then you're going to pay somebody not to be a criminal? That's, that's, that's not doing anything about the problem. Doesn't do anything about character, purpose. It don't matter. White folks are claiming the biggest crooks and get the money from it. Well, but, but the problem is, I, I'm sorry. Can, can people stay on their mic? Like that—that that is a major pet peeve. This is not a nigga platform. Okay, now let me say this: problem with Memphis when you start saying that is that Memphis is a situation where only 19.1 percent of the registered voters are white. Only nine, less than 20 percent. 70 plus percent of the police department's black, the same with command authority. The chief is a black female. Same with the sheriff's department. The sheriff is a black male. 60 percent of the criminal court judges are black and female. 75 percent of the jury pool is black. Now, how in the hell do we get into white supremacy when you have those numbers? The majority of the city council's black. The majority of the county commission is black. 
the majority of the Board of Education is black. Now, how do we get to white supremacy when we look like we're running something, but we're not, and we're giving it away? Um, and see, um, that's what our problem is. We get stuck on one thing. Does this person look like us, which makes us feel good because we are stuck on appearance instead of substance? I can uh, tell you uh, from the yes. 1960s, one of the reasons stuff is so effed up right now is because it got destroyed what was in the makings at the late end of the 1960s because all of the snitches, informants, pimps, and hustlers that it infiltrated all of these community black organizations that just demoralized everybody because you couldn't tell who was your enemy. And mm -hmm. it had nothing to do with what your appearance was. Um, now, go, that's um, one thing we're stuck on. But anyway, I'll... I'll um, I want to go to Kanye, then I'm going to go to um, Ken Davis, and then Kira. Around for that. And um, Mark, you could jump in um, anytime you want as well, and also definitely support um, what you're doing in Chicago and what um, we need to be supporting um, nationwide as well. So go ahead, um, Kanye. Uh, how are you guys doing? Thank you for having me. Uh, when you see me with the space title, uh, at first I had a different title to it. It was talking about the black church and um, uh, just into something really interesting. He's talking about how it used to be like the cornerstone of morality in the community. And along the way, it lost that. It literally lost that. And I was looking into this a couple of years ago and, you know, George W. Bush found a loophole to get the black church money, with the church's money in general, right? 501c3. So what they did was they started to take that money to not tell the people the truth. And it's like you said, it's the only institution of slavery left and operate. If you go to a church now, any church in America, you go there on this black church on a random Sunday morning. You, If you're a man, you're going to be one of five males there. The other three are going to be the musicians. And the other one's going to be the pastor. Maybe some old guys on the deacon board walking around taking kids gum. But that's what it's going to look like. Because at the end of the day, they're not there to help us. And you have to ask yourself, why do they push Martin Luther King so hard? They gave him all holiday and everything. But if you go back in the archives and read what they were saying about him in the papers, they absolutely hated this man. But see, watch who your enemy give you as a hero. They give you this dude. They don't talk about Malcolm, Elijah Muhammad, you know, other people who were saying by any means necessary. But that's how freedom is won. And I'm just listening to this whole thing. It's like I was at a church a couple months ago, actually. And the preacher was like, well, there's an election thing coming up. I can't tell you what to do or who you should vote for. I'm just saying I'm going to do the right thing to support our kids. And he said, oh, it's the 501c3. You felt that comfortable to say that in a packed church? That you going to let the money and the tax exempt status affect how you speak to your flock? And you're supposed to be their moral compass? Like, that's the problem with the community. Um, but to answer the question, there are black people being replaced by illegals? Of course they are, right? But not in the way people think. When I think it was when Trump pardoned Kodak Black, and you started seeing a lot of people in the hip hop world speak about, oh, well, Trump, things are better under Trump. When that started buzzing, they knew automatically what was going to happen, right? And they wasn't going to leave it to chance. All right, let's replace it with the voter class. Now, in the last census, Texas gained a couple seats because more people left California, different parts of the country, and they moved to Texas because, you know, better economy. Now, uh, the judge was talking about, it. they let in a bunch of illegals and they Host some of these northern cities. That's why I try to get some of those seats back. This is all a numbers game for power. So you can expect, quote unquote, stiffer laws. This is going to sound real good. Oh, they bring stiffer laws to keep these illegal in check. But no, they bring a stiffer laws to target us, as they always do. Um, I don't know what a lot was said, but the NAACP is a joke organization. Um, and yes, other groups like Jewish people had a vested interest in the NAACP because when we won civil rights in this country, we fought very hard for them. They got religious freedom, too. So you couldn't, you know, discriminate based on a lot of other things. So a lot of other groups that were watching that, you know what I mean, with great anticipation. So now it would be illegal to tell somebody you're not hiring them because of their heritage, be that black, Chinese or their orientation. They put all that stuff in their own purpose. So every time we do something in this country, it benefits other people because we don't stand up. And like the judge was saying, Memphis, uh, I grew up not too far from there. Uh, it's the blackest city. There's no reason why anybody should be yelling white supremacy in Memphis. 
right? If you guys were literally no, it is none. Absolutely no reason why. None. If you guys stood on principle and stopped looking at, okay, he looks like me. No, what is his policies? Like you don't ask these people these questions. Like, hey, what do you plan on doing for us when you get in there? They asked the vice president what she gonna do for black people. She looked in the camera and said, "I'm not gonna do anything specific for black people." But then she run around with her pearls and her Chuck Taylors and repping the sorority and walking through the airport with a dried ass collard green and people eat that up, man. It's, it's like I, we have to start looking at this thing from what can you do for us? And when black people as a whole started saying things like we need something back, specifically when black people were saying things are better under Trump, that scared the hell out of these Democrats. Look at what they're doing with the border. Texas right now is defying federal orders to close the border. And that's just for a show anyway. So we'll see how this goes down. But I just want to say thank you so much, Judge. I was just listening to the, uh, the uh, when you was talking about the, the preacher thing. Now, that's really interesting, though, because I always thought it was something iffy about the black preachers in America because they all I mean, not saying this is not nothing personal against preachers, but it's always somebody wife they entangle with or something like that. So it's just like maybe this is a heritage thing they passing down. It's a legacy, but just my personal thoughts. But let, 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 let me let, let me say this. Uh, uh, a large part of our problem comes from ourselves. One, we try and make others black. Kamala Harris is not black. Agreed. Her own father went against her. I don't know if people paid attention to that, but her father basically told her, hey, look, stop mentioning my name in the mix of this stuff that you're doing. He's a professor uh, at one of those universities. I can't even remember which one, but... He was basically saying to her, look, stop mentioning me. Get me in the mix of this stuff that you're doing with this game that you're playing. Um, when, it, when it comes down uh, to Memphis, for example, we, it's something about us that we don't understand that black people can be just as racist as these white folks are. And all this talking about black people don't run stuff, that's not true. These black people run Memphis. They run Atlanta and all these different places. But you got all that classism, that black racism that 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 lets them look out for the Turleys and Belts. What's the name of the other families down there? The Fogersons and, and all of them. Corporation. Yeah. See, yeah. they got a game they run up in this place. Yeah, and, and then you got Archie Negroes. Willis' son. Yeah. You got Archie Willis' son. State who controller. Is- yeah. Yeah, you know, he he partners with them along with his sister, and they be they they do all the little. They do a lot of games. How people. do you let how do you let some white boys be the majority, and you come in as the minority in a majority black city, or set aside, or, and, and, or you got a CDFI community development financial institution? These people don't want to be in control. You put them in in, 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 in in the front seat, they get in the back seat and want, want some cracker to, to get in the front seat and drive, drive the car for them. You know, you're right. And what it is, is some greedy, selfish, petty-minded fools that sell out for crumbs and get penitentiary chances heaped on their plate. Every now and then they have a sting, and there's always there's some white ones, but there are a whole lot of black ones that go wind up going to a penitentiary because they took some little chalk change under the tape. And the idea is is they've got every opportunity of founding a new Detroit for the 21st century, and these clowns sit there and get paid for by chump change. And and, 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 and judge they they all of that. They got the power of zoning and permits. I mean, these are some dumb niggas. I mean, we we talking some certified dumb niggas with mass degrees, PhDs, but but common sense they don't possess. They, they do they not. Have, mm-hmm, they they have no common sense. And 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 how do you how do you go to jail for some shit? For, 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 this stuff is you in control of it, and you. Every single, do y'all know every single city councilman in Chicago, for the most part, went to jail for less than $10,000? For less than $10,000. We're talking with budgets. We all together budgets that they control $50, $60 billion, and they went to jail for less than $10,000. 
You could have had yeah. one of your family members to start a company and 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 help them do business with the city and 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 and, and just let them figure out a way to, to let you eat with them, but you go and take a, a, a kickback for five thousand dollars, you get caught. So you blow the community, the, the community and, the, and and black people's opportunity for five thousand dollars for some dollar. meal or a, a trip somewhere, versus taking family and friends and and other people and putting them in business the way these other. I respect what the Irish and the Italians and the the, the Jews and 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 the, the Hispanics do when it comes down to contracting. They make sure that people in their families and, and, and people that are connected to them eat. Our people get in position and close the door. They want to be the only one, and they stay the only one forever. Memphis is so black, like Judge is saying. Chicago, a lot of people don't know all the positions that black people hold in Chicago. The lieutenant governor, the speaker of the house, black, the mayor the county board president, the police chief, the state's attorney. And I'm not talking about just any position. These people have all this shit where they telling y'all that black people don't have no power. Stop letting them tell y'all that. Right. They don't use the power for you. They in power. All they talking about black people can't be racist. That's a damn lie. They got real power. And ain't nobody telling them what to do. Don't you think that, you know what I'm saying, that that when if, if they decide that they don't want to do nothing that, that they're being told, what the hell you think gonna happen to them? Nothing. Nobody gonna do nothing to them. Um, I want to go to. May I, may I point something oh, out? All right, your after mayor you gonna, up in, your mayor up in there, the last one you had, had every opportunity to do great stuff, and she and the state's attorney, Fox, and Lightfoot the two I'm talking about, what'd they do? They blew all of their political capital trying to save Juicy Jesse, who was after Demon Trump, the Baba Yaga. It was one of the most damn fool things I've ever seen in my life. Um, what is the matter with our people? I want to go to Ken Davis and then carry um, a reverend drop back down, FBA, then TAS and Matthew. Go ahead, um, Ken Davis. I think first, uh, hello to the space, everyone, you know, God bless. But I think first we must be able to define racism. Can most Americans define, properly define racism? You know? Well, well the thing is, why do we even care about it? To hell with racism. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. What difference does we it about, We worry about racism too no, much. No, no, no. No, I was agreeing with you. I was agreeing with you. No, I no, was no, agreeing no. With you. Okay, all right. no, I'm not saying you no, don't. No, no, saying. no, 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 yeah, yeah. I was okay. agreeing with you. Let, let's hear yeah. your point. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. When you say black people can be uh, racist, yes, we can be racist. But how can our racism impact the lives of white citizens or any other citizens? We can be racist and practice racism on our own people, which you stated, did you not? You didn't say how our racism impacts white people or any other demographic besides black people, did you not? Yes, because that is because their constituents are black. So what do let me say this? Let, let, let me say this. If judge gives a white man natural life or the death penalty, you think he ain't impacting his life? You think he ain't got the power to 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 give somebody the death penalty and it stick? It, it ain't gonna be reversed because because he was white. If the judge give him natural life or the death penalty, he gonna die in jail or the electric chair. Stop when thinking that these people don't have no, no power. No, 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 no. My whole point, I, I I drifted to that because you said that. But my whole purpose for calling you is to give you two examples. I'm gonna show you something. In Atlanta. In 1994, I was going to a warehouse, which I know a lot of individuals whom most of them were black. They came back the next week. They told them, hey, it's a drug test, mandatory drug test. 
and anybody leave here and don't take the drug test is automatically fired. Most of them did, didn't want to take the drug test because they knew they was dirty. And I presume they knew they was dirty too. Here's the reason why they did that. Fear. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, let me finish. And I came back to that same facility maybe four months to a year later. The whole, everybody that was sitting there working at White House was Hispanic. That was for a reason. And well, when you right. ask that question, no, 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 no. Wait, let me ask you a question, Ken, to that. Yeah. Because did, did they test, did they require the Hispanics to be drug tested as well? There were new employees is what he's saying. They weren't there to be tested. They replaced the ones that couldn't pass the test. Right. But when you, when you hire a new employee, you have to be tested. They do what they want to do. Maybe they were tested. I, I, I guess probably they were tested. No, because what I'm saying is, if they were not tested, that is you don't know racism. That. You exactly. don't know so, that. Then, so then, how can you call it? No, racist, no, no. Well, the whole you, point is, when I came back, everyone in that facility in that warehouse was Hispanic. Okay. Everyone, it was a majority black that had been working there for years. Okay. I know that. Okay. So I, I'm gonna tell you. Well, okay. Let me ask you a question here. You're saying that when you saw this and they announced this sudden test, the majority of the employees at this particular facility were black. You came they back were. four months later, and because of the fright engendered by the testing protocol, what winds up happening is everybody's Hispanic when you get back. Mm -hmm. So the inference that you are raising is that the black people would not pass the test, so they had to bail and lose the employment. Oh. I, I, I'm not saying well, that. No, but maybe you might. Yeah, yeah it, it, you I, I might. Mean, hold on, I'm getting to the 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 crux of the matter. Mm -hmm. Why are they high at the job? We can't sit here and say that they were high. Well, we can't were, say that. Did they take but the if test? they did not, if they did not take the test, then I will agree with you on that. Yeah, but I'm saying that these people knew each other. They know each other. They talk. I know them. That's the reason why I came there because somebody I know, I did some work with them through a contract months ago, maybe a year. Did more. they file a, cl a, a clash? Were. Did they file a class action suit against? No, them? they did not. Why not? Why not? Why not? Because most black people don't think like that. Well, hold on. If they had a test saying the condition of employment is you have a clean screen. The time zone you're talking about at the time this happens, yeah, that's a legitimate work requirement. And it's not that people don't get it. President George W. Bush, he went AWOL for nine months from the Air Force Reserve. Why? Because they had had such a problem with flight crews using drugs that they made a mandatory P test once a week. And apparently he couldn't pass it, so he went AWOL. He got mm -hmm. political connections some years later to get him excused from the AWOL situation. Let me drop so, something to you, Judge. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, you're right. But hey, it's a uh, it's a guy, 25 years old. He working with me, contracting whatever. Yo, he just passed the test. This and all this, like he's about to become a Boston police officer. A uh, what they call it, SWAT team. He's out of military. Interestingly enough, they always seem to have military individuals. They should. He's always, yeah, they should. they should. Yeah, because they have a certain mindset. They're, Hence no, the reason why they gun no, your ass have, down off the they, cliff. They have Dang. training. You yeah, that training that they want. Right? A, no, yeah, but you know the martial skills. You can shoot. You can hit your targets. Oh. You know how the uh, manual of arms and all of that kind of thing. So, yeah. That's why they hire you. You've demonstrated yeah. that you won't panic when the but shit hits the, point, the fan. Judge, judge I, I hate to well, interrupt it you. Is the point. The point. But it's an issue in Boston because it was several black officers saying, hey, we were giving a what type of drug test? Not the uh, urine. It's the what? The hair follicle. 
the black officers that was trying to get in the Boston Police Department were giving half follicle tests. The yeah. white officers that was doing it were giving piss tests. And, and I asked him, this was after the fact, I asked him, I said, what kind of test? And they sent him for two drug tests. Oh, they gave me a urine sample both times. And they yeah. still doing it. And I know this individual, and he told me what it was yesterday, day before yesterday. Oh, uh, a lot of cops what, do what, drugs. What, what exactly is your point? What is your wait, point wait, with yeah, the different type point? of drug test? The different type of drug test is meaning if I give you a hair follicle test, it's going to be in there longer. Oh, I see what you're saying. So did yes. anybody foul? Did That's what they're doing. Okay. You can look it up. All right, stop with the well, yelling. Okay. You're, you're, you're yelling too much. But my question is, did anybody file a complaint or class action suit? Well, see, but you wouldn't have had one lie. The point of the thing is, is yeah, you tested these people with a different protocol, maybe. They might have tested some white ones. I had somebody complain about that in my court, and I was the one giving the orders as to who was to get tested. And I'd just do it randomly. I'd sit there and I'd flip a coin behind the bench while I'm literally. If it came up heads, then they're going to give a piss test. If it came up tails, they're going to give a blood, a urine test, a blood, a hair follicle test. So I'm flipping coins. So they're complaining about the difference in the test. No, it was random. All right. I want to, um, I'm the sorry. The is, is like, yeah, if you're talking about marijuana, if you're around somebody who's smoking heavy, you, you get a contact high several times repeated, it'll stay in your system for about 30 days. And I used to tell people, I said, I swear to God, you come back in here and you get anything looks like a warm test. Madam court reporter, turn the uh, record off. Yes, Your Honor. This, this I'm guy is your a goddamn cocaine. ass. If you bring your tail back up in here with anything, that looks like a lukewarm test. You hear me? This right. guy brags about uh, using cocaine, though. All right. Well, it might be that a way. lot of us do it. Well, we don't need to be doing it. He said a lot of the officers, most of them, are doing coke. They don't need to do it. That's why they can't keep any goddamn order out there in the streets. And why you got individuals high on cocaine and policing the, the community. Yeah, yeah that's interesting true. concept. It All is. Right. I it wanna is really I wanna move up. on. You wanna hear something else on it? Uh you know where cocaine comes from? Yeah, I know where, where it comes from. Tell me where. The coca leaves. Okay, what else comes from that same plant? Coffee? Oh, different. Chocolate. Chocolate. Yeah. That's why they can't get rid of it. You'd have to get all the little old ladies get rid of their chocolate eclairs, chocolate cake, chocolate ice cream, and whatever else in Hershey bars. You can't do it. But you see, there's another thing, too. Royal Navy, they don't serve coffee. They serve cocoa, but they don't denature it. So when you don't take the, uh, the equivalent of decaf cocoa like we get in the United States, you get quite high because you get a good dose of what's in the coke. All right, I want to I want to move on because we're just, we're going away from the actual to topic. Sleep like your kid, but right, I mean, I wanna, but the bottom wanna, line is, wait, wait. The point I'd like to ask off of this is, why can't we just follow the damn rules? So I guess what Ken is saying that you should follow the rules, but it seems like the rules apply differently if you're not black. Okay, exactly. if the chief of police. So wait just a minute. Say wait that, a minute. Ken. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If the chief of police is black and the mayor is black, how come you got the problem? The chief of police can be black and the mayor could be black, but the system gonna stay white. Wait a minute, no, I don't know no, what you're no, talking no, about, Judge. No, no, I'm not no, tripping no, on you. I know you. No, no, you know, no. I, I don't watch I you and all this. I know oh, what it is. The system is white. It's not no, Miss Worth. No, no. All right, I want, you, I want to wait, Ken. Stop. When I want the, the judge mayor, to comment, then I need to move on to another speaker. Okay, when you're the mayor, you got to you can sign off or not sign off on stuff. When you're the chief, you can give the orders. So how come the chief doesn't do it? That's no excuse to say it's a white system and you got a black chief. The mayor is Michelle Wu. She's Asian. Well, that's what it is now. What was it back then? In terms of what? When you talk no, about this, 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 this has been going on for a few years. And the black officers finally 
created a class action lawsuit and stated something and hey we being treated differently saying that all the black officers that are you know trying to obtain a detective position and all these type of things it's a big thing going on in boston but all they right. don't they don't say that all right i want to move on because this is not all the right. topic i want to go to fba and i need everybody please just kind of like stay around the topic all right go ahead fba was, and then matthew then ashley then ricky then friedman all right thank you thank you what's up dana what's up judge um all right hey, hey uh are the blacks being replaced <laughs> i definitely think so um I think that um, I think that the Great Migration a uh, hundred years ago was socially engineered, and I think that this one, um, there's one that they've been um, put into our uh, put into our lives right now. I think people are uh, these black politicians are put into places like Chicago and Los Angeles, New York cities that you know Detroit cities that received um, the large influx of blacks, you know, in the early 1900s, 1940s, and whatnot. And uh, you see these cities are put into effect policies that are just outright damning to the black population. Um, I see this, you know, this isn't something that, uh, you know, it's, it's just, you know, one politician, you know, the Lori Lightfoot. No, no, this is a uh, this is this is a uh, this is a uh, nationwide effort by the Demo uh, Democratic Party, um, you know, and, and it just infuriates me because it shows that our people. We don't really have um, say in our destiny. You know, we can go to Chicago, we can go to Detroit in the, uh, you know, during World War Two years. You know, to go, you know, help out the uh, the industry while you know many of the you know white men were out, you know, on the battlefield and whatnot in, in uh, Europe. But you know, once you know they get back, you know, we get kicked out. You know, we get redlined. Well, we we, we were already redlined, but you know, we get you know. We get the jobs that we came up there for, you know, they, they get shipped overseas and then we, we're put in poverty, you know, the little economic enclaves that we have, you know, Hastings Street in Detroit, you know, you, you put a freeway through it. I mean, it, but like I said, um, they're definitely orchestrating this. This isn't something that I think, I don't, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I see the populations of Chicago, uh, Black Lives Matter Chicago, probably, you know, going down by at least a third in the next 20 or 30 years. Um, same with LA. And, uh, you know, they're just going to ship us back to the South. I mean, it's just something that, you know, I mean, we got to fight against this. We got to have our own. Well, yeah. may I ask you a question? What's up? Yes, sir. I think you're going there. The Democratic Party depends upon the black female voter for its core, one of its core sources of support. Oh, yeah. Since they are the ones that are implementing all of this, why are we as a people supporting them so enthusiastically? Um, uh, honestly, um, I would like to see the the age of the uh, of the voter uh, of the overall of uh, black voters. I would say people over the age of thirty five to forty. Um, you know, they, those are the primary voters, particularly those over the age of fifty. And in, in, in that group, um, and and these people do it religiously. Um, my grandmother, she's sixty-seven; she's about to be sixty-eight next month. Um, she, I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best to get her to see the light, as far as the Democratic Party is concerned. Um, you don't want to, you know, have these types of discussions with your grandmother. You don't want to, you know, be disrespectful because she's kind of stuck in a way. She's she's not gonna go out and vote for Trump. She's just not gonna do that. But at the same time, me and my cousins, you know, we we started to break it, break her down a little bit in regards to making her see that the Democratic policies are not working for us. You know, and, and slowly but surely she's starting to, you know, share our views. Now, I think the most she'll do is sit out of an election. I don't think she'll go vote for the other side, which I mean, it's like if they aren't if they aren't offering anything, then, you know, I wouldn't really advocate for that either. But um. You know, I see, uh, you know, I see it's it's mostly older black people. You know, they do this religiously and uh, they don't they don't think about this stuff, man. I, I mean, when 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 she hears me talk, it's, <laughs> you, know, you know, when she hears me talk, it's like, look, 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 <laughs> look, look, I'm 10 years older than your grandmother and you could not pay me to vote damn Democratic. So 
what's the difference between your grandmother who was 10 years old when all of this stuff was going around in the 1960s, Panther Party, Black Student Alliance, uh, you know, uh, this kind of thing, uh, militancy, burn, baby, burn. And your grandmother was in elementary school and the rest of us could buy whiskey and vote. So why is it that she is a younger generation to mine and she's so that way? I'm going to say this. My grandmother is, um, my grandmother, I love my grandma and everything, um, m much respect, but she's very much influenced by that bell hooks, um, that, uh, that, that color purple style, um, you know, mind, yeah, um, you know, if, if that makes sense, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I know. Let me, can I also add I something too? Okay. I want to add something too, because um, no, I agree with FBA because even in my family or um, older, uh, my father's 70, I have an aunt, um, she's in her 90s, I have some people in their 60s, they are committed to the Democrat Party. And I think that is because it is passed down from generation to generation to where you are, that's embedded in your brain cells. Like you don't know anything else and they don't want to change or, you know, look somewhere else because they just truly believe that Republicans are racist and that's never going to change. So his grandmother, that's not, that's not strange. You're just judge an anonymous, anonymously, anonymy, an anonymous. God, and, I can't. and that's what I wanted to say, uh, Judge. You well, know, hold I, on. I, let I, let, let me put this to you. <laughs> okay, let, 1960, black folk had a choice between Richard Tricky Dick Nixon and Rob John F. Kennedy. Most black folk in 1960 were not Democrats; they were Republicans. But there was this thing going on about that time with demonstrations down in the South. And Kennedy, enterprisingly enough, got on the phone and he called some of the Democratic sheriffs, most of the good old boy, racist, hicks, hillbilly sheriffs back then were Democrats. And he called them as the nominee for the Democratic Party that they were loyal followers of and said, do me a favor so you can get me in, uh, give some slack to uh, MLK. And they did. And that had an enormous impact on what was going on. I remember I, my social studies class uh, for high school, we had to write a paper on that or a short paper on it. And it was very interesting observing that switch of Negroes from being staunch Republicans who were tempted by Truman and FDR to going over to Republicans. See, there were a lot of Democrats, not Democrats, Black folk around who you would be cussed out if you said Democrat because they were alive when Woodrow Wilson the last Democrat president before Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the executive order to officially segregate D.C. They were around and they were young people when Teddy Roosevelt signed off, the one they named Teddy Bears after, signed off on a whole lot of stuff. They were off where Teddy Roosevelt had 26 black soldiers in the 10th Cavalry executed by firing squad or sitting there and being rebellious against some white officers from Alabama who wanted them to go out and beat up some black folk in Texas. See, they remembered all that stuff. So what I'm thinking of is if anybody is six to 10 years older than me, they came along at a time when nobody black was Democrat. They were Republican. Well, if their family, they, if their family was Democrat, then they're going to vote because that's passed. But down. I'm just saying, no black folk were Democrat then. Yeah, I mean, they were. At the, no, no, not in 1960. Yeah, that's they were. They, My no, whole when, family was. No, yes, they were. When, no, but I'm older than everybody in your family. No, but you're bottom, not. I'm talking about my grandmother, who was way older than you, and she died when I was 15. So 
Well, that's yeah, but, but that the generation be no 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 this is what I'm saying the generation before you passed it down to your generation which is my father you and my father in the same generation and then a lot of times that's passed down to their kids it's passed down unless well, you unless you unless it doesn't matter it's the same generation unless you in the, as an individual choose to to think differently and do differently I I want to go to Matthew and Ashley. Go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Matthew. Uh, yeah, so, like, on the topic about black people being replaced by uh, illegals and stuff, um, a lot of the illegals that are coming over now uh, come from, like, other places by way of Mexico, right? So, like, it could be Haitians, and and they're, for the most part, black. So, like, when we say uh, black people are being replaced by illegals, um, you see more of a trend going up in the Haitians. So, like, you know, uh, how are we supposed to, like, you know, understand or get, like, you know, what did you just say black people, right, are being replaced, but they're being replaced by other black people. So, I mean, I think it, it would be, uh, you know, wise to maybe look further into it instead of just saying black people. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're not American. They're not black American. They're immigrants. They just so happen to be black. They're not even immigrants. They're illegals. So that's the difference. I'm talking about black Americans, black Americans being replaced by illegals. So I don't care what color you are crossing that border. You're an illegal and you are here and you are allowed to come here intentionally to get all these free subsidies that I'm paying for and my people, black American people specifically and all Americans, you know what I'm saying? We're, we're, we are, our needs are not being taken care of. So go ahead. Right. And I think that there is a, there's a, um, a shift in where the left or whoever you want to call it is starting to pander to. And, uh, I think they do want more illegals coming in because, I don't know. Um, they say what any immigrant, like yeah, any immigration is good as long as it's illegal, basically because like they they can't get on food stamps or this and that. But now you start to see more states picking up, um, you know, sanctuary uh, status stuff like that, where they're giving health care and stuff to illegals. So it's kind of like shooting ourselves in the foot, and now illegal immigration is not even uh valuable you know um and i think it, this all goes back to what judge joe brown was talking about when it, in the 1960s civil civil rights that was the start of it to a very uh sinister plot to really uh use the minority groups in america until they become the majority right and then like once they once that happens they're just gonna ditch them and then they're going to go on to something else and, and, and always pander to the to the ones that have to go through the struggle, you know? Um, just mute for a second. Uh, I just want to say one more thing. Just mute for a second, Matthew, because a little bit of feedback. Um, and because I want to bring um, Ilion Omar into it, because just because someone has um, we have the, we share the same hue. Those are people of color. I'm just talking about when I say black people, black Americans, just like Elon. Can you mute up, Judge? Because it's too much. You're doing too much. It's too much noise. Can you just press the mute button? Elian mm -hmm. Omar, Elian Omar right now in Minnesota. Um, they're trying to deport her and get press mute. They're trying to deport I'm her. Not in the same room. Go ahead. I got to walk back to the room where the phone is. Yeah, go can ahead. you keep the phone with you and just press mute? Well, I've got the earphones on, okay. but I'll go back and hit mute. Go ahead. And so she's right now. They're they're trying to deport her, deport her, which they should because she said her allegiance is to the Somalians first. So her allegiance is not to black people. And yeah, she looks black, don't she? But it's not about skin color um, to people crossing that border and people who are already here. It is about, you know, your your lineage. So and I do want to bring and that's why I have her on a thumbnail on YouTube. But you look at her and people like her in Congress, representatives, 
and they are for specific groups, not for black people, even the ones that are black Americans that are in Congress, they focus on whatever donor is contributing to their campaign. So it's going to be Zionists, it's going to be LGBTQ, and it's going to be illegals because they're getting money to stay in office, but they're using black people at the same time, replacing them. Because how can a Jasmine Crockett in a 30th district in Texas, where you have mm, over 40% of her constituents are black. However, she's supporting open border because you know what? If you add up all the Hispanics, they have it white and non-white Hispanics, that's 40% or 45%, which means white people only make up 10% and then it's everybody else. But she's choosing to side with open borders and Hispanics and illegals. Well, what about the black people? You're black. So just because someone may look like me, that don't mean that they're for me. Um, anything you want to say, Matthew? Then I'm going to go to Ashley. Yeah, and uh, that's exactly right. That's exactly what I'm thinking about, too. Like, I, I understand what you're saying. And that's what I'm saying. Like, maybe they use that just that word alone, black or white or anything like that as a as a guys, you know, like as like a um, like a facade to really push what it is they're trying to push, but they're really not for what we think is black people. They're they're saying black people because they know, you know, people are gonna buy that up and they're okay, black is black, right? But at the same time, these these black people that are coming in aren't American, right? And they don't have the same values that we have. They have different values and they want to change things fundamentally to make their lives more comfortable. So. That's where I'm thinking maybe there might be another way. I don't know if you want to say classify, but like maybe we, you know, you really want to get it out there and like really like trying to like focus. Like I don't think you know just saying oh black people because that could be a very like uh, you know. Well, when I say black people, well, I, I get what you're saying, but when I say black people in the same senses of illegals, best believe I'm talking about black Americans because everyone else they're illegals. So I don't care what color you are. You're elite. You're not American. Non-American. Um, go ahead, Judge. And I'll go to Ashley. You know what? It's interesting that so many are saying what you just said, Miss Dana. Uh, the implication is that it ain't got nothing to do with white supremacy because if we say the distinctive thing is they're not foundational black Americans, even if they're black, what is being said or inferred is there's something about us that even other black people won't deal with. So if white folk, brown folk, yellow folk, and other black folk won't deal with us, what's that got to do with white supremacy? It may be just something about us. Now, we need to consider that. Um, goes back to the original topic, the black preacher and how I said uh, bulk preachers have been bred and trained for a long time by the Democratic Party. And maybe that thing there is what the problem is. Now, there's another thing that nobody wants to deal with, which is this. We've got an open southern border, but it's not Mexicans coming in. It's Central Americans and South Americans who's been who've been doing and Africans. caravans. Well, forget the Africans. I ain't no, they're about. coming in too. In I droves. ain't worried about Africans personally. I ain't got a problem with that because I know I how to deal with. I know how to deal with that. I, I got a problem with everybody that's illegal. Now, Africans, yeah, I mean, illegal's one thing, but as a philosophical thing, no. But here's what I do have a problem with that is a serious problem. Right now in Gaza, idiot in chief in the White House is talking about what he's going to do to retaliate for another Gulf of Tonkin situation where we were where we didn't need to be and got shot at. 
and we want to shoot back, they won't have to go through training people to hijack an airline and sneak anybody in to do another 911. They walk right across the border with all of the armaments, explosives, and the hookups they need because we have no southern border security and we don't know who's in and they're close to five million people that they have, don't know how to find that they suspect having come over here illegal and you get this thing with military age youth who have come across the border and see people don't get that they aren't going to have to sit up and start some kind of invading army that's not going to work but they damn sure can do another 911 real easily yeah um i'm going to go to ashley thank you um so i just wanted to touch on the the point of the room are black people being replaced by illegals um so i'm running for the congressional district two in illinois which covers eight counties so i get a lot of statistical information and quite frankly the answer is is that yes because of the the, the population of uh, black Americans in Chicago, when you look at it as a city, and then when you look at Cook County, um, because those are two different things. Most people just consider Chicago all of Cook County, but it's actually larger. Um, it, the, the amount of illegals that we're getting, the answer would be yes, is that they will, if we continue to take them, they will outpace uh, the black population. Now, the other thing about that is, is, and this is very important, is that as soon as we started getting illegals bust in, the state, our state legislators passed two laws that are critical to black Americans in our area. So the first thing that they did is that they passed a law is that you could not discriminate against illegals for um, housing or assistance purposes, which uh, we have a large population of black Americans that are receiving certain assistances in the area. Now, what that does is, is if they say you can't discriminate against an illegal for those same assistances, that means that anybody who's giving those assistances has to take a certain percentage of illegals and give it to them so they do not get sued, which means less of the black Americans that would have gotten those resources will be able to get them. Number two, it's for rental purposes. So now illegals in the state of Illinois can buy or rent property and they cannot be discriminated against, which means everybody who sells real estate or is in rental properties has to take a certain percentage and, and use that towards illegals or else the state can come in and investigate them and they can be facing lawsuits. So it's almost a way to force people to give illegals benefits that would have otherwise gone to black Americans or impoverished Americans, no matter how you dice it, it's not going to the, to the citizens. The third thing that they did, and this is where they're putting it against the black vote and all of this stuff, you guys can go look, you don't have to take my word for it. The state passed a law that will go into effect in July that illegals will be able to get driver's licenses in the state of Illinois. Now, why that is crucial is because when you get a driver's license in the state of Illinois, it is set up to ask you if you would like to register to vote. Now, that machine, or the paper that you can get sent to you does not know to ask you if you're a citizen or not because only citizens are allowed to get driver's license. The state of Illinois has admitted that this is an issue so much so that they said that they are going to set up with the secretary of state uh, um, a position where every application to for voter registration will be checked to make sure that that person is not illegal. But that now you're leaving that in human hands to make sure that they're throwing away that registration should an illegal decide that they want to fill out that paperwork. So there's room for quote unquote error. And I, I, I'm sorry, I don't trust the government enough and I'm running as, as a government official to say that somebody is going to sit there and officially go through all of that paperwork to make sure that the illegal's registration to vote does not get through. And that's just for federal. Now they're already allowed to vote in, in the state of Illinois in, um, county and municipals, whether they have a driver's license, anybody can vote who lives in, in Illinois or comes to Illinois can already vote without being asked for a photo ID because of state laws. So I'm sorry, I know this was kind of long-winded, but I just wanted to be able to give you guys the information that you could look it up for yourself. The answer, because of all of these things that the state of Illinois has done, the answer would be 
yes, they are replacing the black population with illegals by doing all of these things. Um, no, um, take your time because that is vital information that we need to hear and understand. The question I want to ask you, um, are white people being replaced in the state of Illinois? And if not, if not as much as black people, why do you think that may be? And, and, and if it is, you know, why is it that black people are easily replaced? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am. So all of us are being replaced. The difference is, is that the black population is being replaced faster because the the percentages in certain areas. So if you're looking geographically, if you only take a county or the Chicago land area, there's a larger black population there. And that's where more illegals are being sent. So it's going to overtake the black population in that area faster. If you take the whole state of Illinois into play, there's a larger demographic of white people and it will take them longer to replace the white people essentially just because there's more of them in those other areas and it will take them longer to get those areas to agree to take the illegals. But Brandon Johnson has come out in the news and flat out said he is putting pressure on the collar counties and the rest of the state of Illinois to start taking illegals. And what they're doing, that's part of the reason that they changed the state law to incentivize they can't discriminate. Nowhere in the state of Illinois can discriminate. They have to take a certain percentage of illegals. So eventually, even counties that do not want to have, to have anything to do with illegals, if they don't, they could face potential lawsuits or even prison time by the state of Illinois for being discriminant. So it's set up to force them throughout the state of Illinois. And there's they're not the only state that's doing it. It's just not being talked about because I'm sure a majority of the people in this space have probably never heard about this sort of legislation and it's already on the books. Yeah, because the governor of New York, she came out to the mayor of New York City and said, I'm not going to force other counties in New York State to take in the illegals because other counties, exec executives and mayors in the state of New York, they were going to sue um, or push back or pass policies to make sure that the illegals are not allowed in their city or county. Um, so is this something that a governor, she's basically saying, I'm leaving it up to the county execs and the mayors if they want to take them or not. In Illinois, is it the opposite to where the, the governor mm -hmm. is allowing or forcing the counties to somehow take in the illegals? You get what I'm saying? Let me offer a suggestion here that would settle the whole damn. Let me offer a suggestion, Madam Candidate. I want you to hear this. Most of my career was spent as a criminal defense lawyer, and I tried a number of clients charged with conspiracy, criminal conspiracy. This is on the federal level. Harboring uh, or concealing a federal fugitive. Now, the precedent's been set that there is no respect to be given to office. If you can prosecute the president of the United States, you can prosecute a governor. It is a crime to enter the country illegally. If you aid and abet or conspire to assist someone who has broken a federal law, you are chargeable with harboring secreting or giving aid and comfort to a federal fugitive. It is a felony. If we can get the jackass in the Oval Office out and get somebody in who will sit the U.S. attorney on this, every governor, every mayor, every councilman, every congressman who has assisted given aid and comfort conspired to assist these people from breaking the law to break the law is arguably chargeable with the federal felony of harboring or aiding or abetting the secreting of a fugitive so we can get rid of some of these people that they made this a law in Illinois that says you have to break United States law in order to stay in compliance. That's just absolutely absurd. But you see too many of the people in charge of administering the law, adjudicating the law, or prosecuting under the law are ignorant of the law because they lack the practical experience. 
too many of the people that are in charge right now who the nation depend upon to apply the law are basically amateurs. They're like doctors who have book learning, but have never done internships nor residencies at a hospital. So they don't know. You've got judges who haven't tried five cases in their entire career as an attorney. You have noted civil rights attorneys who have never tried a case. And you have prosecutors who can't even find the criminal courthouse because they've never been there before they became the chief prosecutor. And you've got a lot of that garbage. You've got a U.S. Supreme Court member now who can't define what a woman is. And she has scant trial experience. It is a travesty. So let's get somebody in there who will give the green light to the U.S. attorney the attorneys through the attorney general of the united states and say you have the laws on the books and what these people are doing aiding abetting giving comfort to concealing and conspiring to break the federal law which is still good law when it comes to illegal entry into the United States, they all ought to be prosecuted. Um, go ahead, Ashley. Um, and also, I would tell people need to vote for Ashley Raybones for Congress. We need more people Hello. like her. But go ahead, Ashley. Hello. I'm sorry to interrupt. I wanted to know if I could say something. I got to go real quick. Uh, just to answer the question, are black well, people... Well, I'm, I'm sorry because I didn't say yay and nay. So can I have Ashley finish up and then, um, you know, it is it is an order here. So I, I do want Ashley to finish up. So did you, Ashley, you ha you could go ahead. Um, just to answer your question real quick. So J.B. Pritzker is a Democrat and we have a super majority Democrat in the no Illinois House and Senate. And we also have a majority Democrat on our uh, judicial system. So there's essentially no recourse for any of these completely atrocious laws that are being put on the books. And if you have a, a governor who is sane and who is willing to, you know, allow the people in the different counties and districts to be able to maintain them correctly and in the order that they should, then yes, they would, they should have the choice whether to take the illegals or not. But unfortunately in the state of Illinois, we are essentially handcuffed to the laws. What I, I get what judge is saying. They may not be right, but those are the laws in the books at this moment uh, that we have to abide by. And that gives illegals a huge amount of incentive and power to come here. Thank you, Ashley. I appreciate everything you just laid out. Um, now, Pick them up. Um, Justin, you have Ricky and Friedman ahead of you. So you need to ask Ricky and Friedman if you could get in front of them. No, I can wait. I can wait. Thank you. Um, and Ashley, I'm going to send you a message on the back end. So, and, you know, just to let you know ahead of time. Um, Ricky. All right. Good evening, Judge. Good evening, Dana. So all Black people being replaced by the illegals. We had the 2016 election. They were saying then that illegal immigration and tolerating it was important. We had the rise of sanctuary cities. In the 2020 election, uh, all of the Democrat candidates stood up. I'm a leftist, but all of the Democrat candidates stood up and said, you get free health care. If you get free health care, right? You get $6,000 for rent and you have a sanctuary, then that's open borders and you never have to go back. And in these locations, I know in New York, the local politicians have been very clear that they intend on replacing the population, right? And going with what Ashley was saying, I heard uh, like local uh, elected officials talk about people voting a while ago, a long time ago. That's nothing new, illegals voting. All right. And to go with what I was saying earlier, we we're talking about these black politicians and how they don't advocate for black people. And then Dana talked about how Ilhan Omar should be deported. Right. She should not be deported. I don't like Ilhan Omar, but she should not be deported for advocating for her people. We don't have anybody to advocate for us. 
but she vain, very plainly in front of her people, she says, I'm going to do for Somalians. I'm going to do for my people. Uh, they were ran out of Somalia due to our meddling, due to U.S. meddling in the region. And they came to northern Minnesota or wherever Minneapolis is, and they took it over. They're doing exactly what we try to say we're going to advocate for. But then when somebody actually does it, we're scolding them, right? I'm sure most of us heard uh, the city council over in L.A. and what Nuri Martinez says. She says, you're doing for the blacks. You better do for the Mexicans. Do for my people. We should be admiring what Ilhan Omar is doing, right? I'd never vote for her. She's very anti-Black American. But she showed us the way, and we're acting like it's bad that she gives a shit about her people. And I'll answer. Real quick, though, I don't know if the judge is going to respond, but... Um, um, I, 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 well, I, let me just say well something real stated. quick. It's no, it well is well stated. stated, but you know what? Because I thought about that earlier, right? And I thought about how you have other representation, um, congressional representation in Congress or on a local level that kind of do the same thing when you talk about United States, how we um, go hard for Ukraine and, you know, Israel and the state of Israel. So it's kind of she's doing the same thing. However, some of her language is anti-American. So that's my only caution and pushback with her. She was never, she don't care about black Americans. And you're right. We need to put people in office that are for us, no matter what color they are. But you also have to demand from your representation who you elect. But her rhetoric sounds more anti-American. And that is a problem because she's talking about Ethiopia. She's talking about Kenya. She's we talking did about all these other country countries. Up, though. You know where, where the reason I, I, is. I don't, all the I don't people care. Here. So what? So then why are you here? So then why are you here then? Why did because you come we to blew the same country? Wait, 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 wait. So you come to the same country. Yeah. You came to the country that quote unquote blew up your country because this is war. This is what we this is what the world does. So we blew up your country. We did all this stuff in your country. So did Kenya, so did Ethiopia. But you come here, you 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 know what I'm saying, and 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 you become a politician. Just so you could look up for Somalians so they could have political power here. Yes, that is anti-American because that automatically says that you are underhandedly committing tre treason. So, yes, she should be deported. But those are Somalians that are living she in Minnesota. She should be deported because they're she they're is Americans committing now, treason. They live here. Not for the state of Somalia, for Somalians living in Minnesota. But they also have a connection to their country. They send money back there. So she, she should go should to the be, United States. Yeah. yeah, so she should be deported because of treason. Yeah. Look, 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 look. Everybody in this country always tries to help out the people who have an ethnic connection with them. Look at the Irish, look at the Italians, look at the Japanese, look at the Chinese. Look at the Native Americans, look at the Mexican community, look at the Puerto Rican community, you name it. So why do we find it unusual or offensive for somebody to advocate for their ethnic group of origin? I don't get it. Well, did you hear her speech? I did, but I don't care. That's not outside. So of I'm, what did you hear? Well, what I heard was perfectly within limits based on American I don't think you history. heard the recent speech that I'm talking about. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. It does, because care. she's talking about she Kenya, is, Ethiopia. She's talking about the president of Somalia. Right. That's all right. All of the oh, it's all right? Yes, no, I'm, is, I'm sorry. Listen, I think listen, I was. Let, let me just get, wait one me, second. No, me, one second. Let me, me set the no, stage. Every, I need everybody I to it, stay. Stop. Everybody needs to stay on their microphone. It's to stay on your microphone. Amendment. It's called the First Amendment, freedom of speech. When somebody is on the Congress floor, there is total immunity under American law for anything said traveling to and from. D.C. back to your home place or on the congressional floor or on uh, in the process of conducting your congressional business. It's totally immune. That she said what she said may be offensive, but it doesn't make a damn bit of difference. There's a thing called the First Amendment. 
And that's what's of concern. We cannot restrict the exercise of the First Amendment because the thing of it is, is the free exchange of ideas and the rational, logical, and reasonable process of ideas competing with each other so that we arrive at a consensus. All right, now, me... that she did what she did is permissible. And what the remedy is, is if you are one of her constituents and you don't like what you heard, there is an election coming up. All her constituents are Somalian. So 80 percent, well, over 80 percent. And they love it. So then, so right. So my, but wait, does. wait, let me, let me throw this scenario in and then I'm gonna go to Friedman. So they are, and, and I'm pretty sure the Ted Cruz and all these other people that want to deport her or whatever, they know what you just said. They know that. But if you replace her, if you're able to deport her, get her up out of Congress and you could replace her with someone red. See, that is the game we're playing. Whether whether it, it goes against First Amendment, because this stuff that this administration is doing that goes against all goddamn amendments of the Constitution. So for the basis of, you know, keeping the Congress red, would you really object to her getting the hell up out that seat? That's what I'm saying. If her constituents decide to turn her out, more power to them. They're going to vote what her is, in. Well, that's their business. She so if the it's another about- way, no, no, the question I'm asking. I, if if it's another way to get her up out that seat and everyone from the squad up out their seats and flip those seats to red, does it matter how we do it? Yeah, it does matter how you do it because you set a precedent. I that get it, is but the other side is good. not playing fair. Well, they you, never look, play look, fair. So you have to, we're all breaking the rules here. So I no, want to win though. My focus is to win the, the war. I want to win the war. Every, no, that loses the war. You see, when you break those rules and you set the precedent that these idiots are precedents, plural, that these idiots are setting, they lose the war because in five, 10 years, the script gets flipped and they get put on them. See, America is a bitch. When you set up a rule, that rule applies to everybody. And if it doesn't apply to everybody immediately, it shall one day. And when it does, you got a real live mess. So okay. rather than having a mess for everybody, because somebody is against the popular trend at a time, or somebody's popular trend, it becomes self-defeating in the long term when you break the rules. All right. Now I want to I want to go to Freeman and Justice, and then F Arkansas Drew and FBA. But Freeman is up next. Good afternoon, family. Um, I actually just want to, I want to know where we are right now. I've been on and off the conversation and in and out. I've been here, but not really listening. Um, but when I came in, you were talking about our black people being replaced. And then there was a whole bunch of situations going on with Ken. And then I dipped out and I came back in and I thought we got back on it, but are we there? Are we talking about black preachers? I mean, I got a little something for everything, but I don't You can really- talk about the topic or you could okay. talk about anything else we mentioned. Okay. So uh young lady, I believe her name was Ashley. She's in Illinois. Um great information, great data for uh Dana. Um no pun intended, but yeah, kinda. So what I'm trying to I'm sorry. Well, why do you mean no pun intended? What what I got to because do with what she said? Because you're Dana with the data, you know, I was just a little, little Oh, off, I, you know. I that went over my head. I'm like, <laughs> is it shade or he's just saying no pun intended? No, was, absolutely no shade. Absolutely no shade. I listen to okay. the all the time. So oh, okay. Um, so no, nah, no, no shade at all. Um I I'm I'm just I'm silly like that. But the, the main thing is I'm in Michigan and I know a lot of people. Um, when they think about Michigan, they, they think it's just hunky-dory up here, um, more hunkies than dories. But, you know, my biggest thing is what I'm looking at is a lot of what Chicago has. And it's because a lot of these Democratic-led states or and I break it down to local politics because I think that's where we really need to be as American black people. We need to be on local politics and not be, really be worrying about what happens every four years at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, They've made basically every Democratic-led state or Democratic-led territory believe 
that they are a sanctuary territory just by what's happening in Chicago. I mean, it's social engineering at its finest. And they've made people believe that a place like Chicago can be taken over by illegals. Other places can be taken over by illegals. Well, I live in a territory that I wouldn't say it's being taken over by illegals, but they are being pushed in very strategically. Unlike what is happening in Chicago, where they're dropping them off in densely populated black neighborhoods, what's happening here, they're bringing a different type of illegal here or a different type of illegal is landing here. And not to say that they're more educated uh, because they're because they got to Michigan, but University of Michigan is here. And there's a lot of people that come here for the university. And we've got a bunch of colleges in the state itself. And what happens a lot of times, we're not just getting Spanish speaking folks here. We're getting Ukrainians. We're, we're, we're getting Russians. We're getting Afghanis. We're getting all types of people. And they're elevated, educated people from other territories. And the, the jig that they're pulling on us is, oh, what's happening in Chicago will never happen here. We well, are absolutely right. Because, yeah, we're not being replaced. We're being displaced. And a lot of higher level, high, high elevated employed Black Americans, where I use American Black now because we've got to delineate. We've got to get to back to being Americans first. And they're being pushed out of their jobs. They're being pushed out of their jobs for people that are coming over here that are getting legitimized. Hell, some of them aren't even getting legitimized, but they're being pushed out because they have that education from their territories that they fled from. They make it seem that every person's coming over here, you know, got bare feet and they're wading in the water and shit. No, some of these people are actually getting off planes. Some of these people are literally getting off planes, walking in here into these territories and living better than most American black folks from day one. And we really got to get on our local politics. I appreciate that sister that got in that was talking about this because that's what's happening. We're they're trying to blind us with this election that's going to happen in November when we really need to be literally boots on the ground locally and voting out our city council members, our county commissioners, our aldermen, whatever your, your area has, you need to be voting them out. If they are pro, and I'm talking, I'm talking pro-immigration to the point where they don't mind illegals coming in, because if you come in and get your paperwork right, that's one thing. But if you come over here and live up under the, uh, the, the radar and steal jobs from American black folk. I can't really concern myself with anybody else because I ain't never been nothing else. But if you take jobs from American black folks for $7 an hour, when that job normally went for $14, $15 an hour, you are illegal. You are not a migrant. You are not an immigrant. You are illegal. And you're definitely not seeking asylum. So they need to quit all that mess that they keep talking to people. These people are fleeing a country that's at war and they're in trouble. Well, what are we doing? We've been at war for over 400 years. We ain't fled nowhere. We ain't went nowhere. So if we can stay put, they need to stay put. But it's too late. There's three or five million of them over here that they don't even know where they are. And what she was saying is happening. Getting a driver's license is a prelude to you getting a voter registration card. Getting a driver's license is a prelude. If they let them drive, they're letting them vote just by default. It happens in Michigan here. My daughter's only been driving a couple of years and literally because she look, looks a little mature, they asked her, they literally asked her, they said, you know, do you want a voter registration card? And I'm like, she's not even old enough to vote. She's not even old enough to vote, but they're so used to asking it because of the illegals that are coming in. And don't you know that they're being told to say yes. They're being told to say yes by the caseworkers at DHS or by whomever is facilitating them being over here. Say yes, say yes. So when the election comes around and they have a voter registration card, they're not going to care about their status as far as being naturalized. If they got a voter registration card, they going to vote. And I'll land there because I, I like the whole little decorum and I don't want to be too mo much longer winded, but that's what's yeah. happening. We got to get into our local politics, folks. This has never been done in American history. This is the first time, and it's causing a problem because there are local ballots, state ballots, and federal ballots. And the problem is, is that as a matter of convenience, most 
states combine the local and state ballots with the federal ballots, at least on the same offices on the same ballot. There is another problem that everybody listening is going to confront, and that is this. At one point, not long ago, there was a presumption that the state had attested to your citizenship status and your true identification. Remember when you got your first driver's license, what you had to go through to get it? Well, now that yes, California, sir. Illinois, and New York have allowed illegals to get driver's licenses, now we keep getting a date put back, put back, started off because of COVID-19, but now it's coming up at the end of the summer this year. You're going to have to have a black star in the upper corner of your license or you won't be able to get on an airplane. TSA will not accept that as a valid driver uh, identification. So now because of these three jackass states, everybody in the country is going to have to go back and get a new driver's license. And it's unclear as to how the state is going to attest that you are in fact an American citizen or that you are a legal alien and that your identification is valid. Are you gonna have to go get your birth certificate? Hell, I'm 77 years old this year. I haven't seen a damn thing in a long time, decades. So can, I interrupt, can I interrupt real quick, Judge? Yeah, go ahead. I got a gold star right now and I was wondering what does the gold star in the state of Michigan mean? Does that mean I'm an that means, citizen? That means your identification has been authenticated by the state of Michigan. Thank you. If you don't have that gold or black star, you're in trouble when you try to get on an airplane. You're going to need your passport. And uh, that means, uh, see, that that's a problem for the rest of us because these selfish bastards in these damn states they decided that they're going to pull an in run on everybody and uh, get oh, extra sorry. representation in Congress. All right. Um, I kind of want to reset. Um, I want to, Matthew and Ricky, would you mind dropping down? Because a couple of people want to come up. Um, I don't even see Justin anymore. Well done. And um, I want to go to um, Ashley again, then the Negro, and then I'm going to go to the new set of um, speakers which would be F. Arkansas, Drew, FBA, Shy, Latasha, um, and Real Queen. And please tweet out the space. Um, all right, what did I say? Okay, Ashley, then the Negro. Um, the What we call the people that Freeman was talking about, those are actually called diamond diggers. So the reason that they're called diamond diggers is because these are people who came from places where you had to you had to work and you had to work hard, you had dirty hands, but they were given the for very low cost, like India is a good example of that, they get skills that they know they will be paid well for when they come here. But they continue they maintain like what you were talking about with Ilhan Omar, a loyalty to where they came from. So these people are, like you said, they've been given skills and they can take jobs away from Americans in higher paying areas. Um, and they'll do so very aggressively because they were taught to work aggressively from where they came from. So that's why they call them diamond diggers. Um, but I, unfortunately, I have to go because I'm actually a full-time student still. So I have to go to class. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate wanna... you coming up. Yeah, so I just want to say thank you for letting me share that information with you, um, and I, I appreciate your space. This has been very it it's it's been very educational for me as well, getting the opportunity to listen to all of you. So everyone, God bless and have a great night. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, and I did reply to your message, so looking forward to that. So I appreciate you coming up. Um, all right, I want to go F Arkansas. Is he still up here? Yeah, F. Did you fall asleep? I'm not saying a whole four letter word. F. Arkansas sucks or whatever. Going once. F. Arkansas. Okay. Yeah, what's up? All right. Go ahead. Uh, well, I don't know what to say. Uh, we got all these sellouts. Got all these Memphis sellout. Yeah, I'm taking jab at you, Judge. Oh, oh let me. <laughs> all right. So first of Podcast. all, you know, you live in Memphis. Come find me on the street. 
if you want to come up here, you could come up and speak, but you better come up here and be respectful, whether you have a disagreement you or not. Half step. Don't be coming up in here half stepping, you damn fool. What are you, one of these rainbow sissies? Go ahead. You go on mute. Because I said this is not the nigga space. So go ahead and unmute F Arkansas. Look, this is all about us getting what's ours. You know what I mean? If anybody's seen the Purge movie, remember when Candy Girl said, I come back for my fill in the blank candy bar. That's us. See, we're not like Candy Girl. We ain't determined to get out here and get it. She came back with our homie to get that candy bar. Now, what are we doing to get ours? Nothing. But go to basketball game. Yeah, let me stop. I don't go to basketball games. I think they're a waste of damn time. Julius Caesar said, give them bread and circuses and they won't care what the hell you do. That's been 2040, 2060 years ago. So what time is, would you come up in here talking some nonsense like you're doing? Who the hell you think you're going to get away with doing this about? The hell's the matter with you? All right, if you don't have if you if you don't have nothing else to say, I'm gonna drop you because you know yeah, this is a very productive ass. space. Uh, uh, what are we doing to get our candy bar? That's what I want to know. Right, you, you go find out. God damn it! I've been I mean, about what are we doing? You tell me. You got Kamala here. Harris hijacking the Selma uh, speech, talking about Ukrainian, uh, you know, being bombarded and all that stuff. And then you got Jim Crow Joe going to a black church and hijacking that. Next. I mean, what's going on, black folks? Yeah, let me drop his ass because, nigga, you were coming up here talking about a candy bar and then you tried to come for the judge and you fell flat. Stop. <laughs> um, um, I did say the Negro. I'm sorry, the Negro. And then I was going to the new speakers. Um, Go ahead, the Negro. And then I'm going to go to Drew, FBA, Shah, Latasha, Real Queen. And then I have to bring up a couple more other people. Um, Selling, let me see, selling out loose. You seem like a troll, honey, because I went on your page. I don't have time today. I don't have time today for it. So let me know if you're a troll or not. But go ahead, the Negro. All right. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Judge, for allowing me to speak on that. I, I definitely want to circle back to this Ilhar um. Omar woman. I, I thought candidates um were beholding to the constituencies that they're um that that got them into the office in the first place. And I thought that um that they have what they call an oath that they have to maintain. And I feel like she in some regards violated that oath, which she should be removed off of that or removed from her position due to the fact that she does have a um um I would say a conflict of interest with other nations. Um, is that something I, I don't really know the political field with that aspect of that conversation, judge. Is there something that we could do or that we could hem her up on some charges no, or a can't. fine off of that? No, you can't see. Here's the thing. She, if she's representing her constituents, the whole scheme is on this. It's up. See, People get selected by the process of democracy. They don't have to govern that way. There's a thing, a series of pamphlets and papers that was produced called the Federalist Papers. If you read them, you will find out what they were trying to do when they were trying to encourage the ratification of the Constitution, which happened in 1789. And the Bill of Rights, which happened in 1791, they explain their reasoning. And what goes on is each group of people, as delineated by the latest census, is entitled to representation. If they're satisfied with their representation, that's on them. If they don't like it, they can turn the person out. They do not allow other groups to get rid of somebody's representation because you disenfranchise them. Remember this quasi-mystical moment called the Boston Tea Party where the charade was no taxation without representation. See, that's what it's all about. Now, a rule in American law 
everybody hates congressmen except for one. And that's usually the one that represents you. So it is what it is. And it's kind of late to change the rules right now without creating a disaster. And in fact, that's where the problem comes in is people want to change the rules. As long as this person hasn't broken any law, you cannot remove somebody for an opinion or for advocating something you don't like. You can only remove them for one, treason, two, bribery, three, committing a misdemeanor or felony in office. Those whoa, are the whoa. only reasons you can do. Okay, now, the, the, on a the, local level, you have things called recall. California has recall where if you don't like what the person does and it's a state or a local office, you can recall them. But on the federal level, no. Well, well, Judge, didn't Ilhar Omar um, marry her brother or something, or allegations of that, where she done um, unethical things to obtain the position that she obtained? Why is that has not been challenged? That, that that's, that's where kind of the that, angle where, that's, where I'm coming from. Up. That's up to the House of Representatives, or if she were in the Senate, to the U.S. Senate. Occasionally, they do exercise that authority. You will note that Adam Clayton Powell, the famous representative from Harlem, who was pastor of Ebenezer Baptist in Harlem, was ejected from Congress for what they claimed was taking bribes and wrongdoing. His constituents returned him to the House. They rejected him again. And then on the second go around, they rejected him. And the governor of New York wound up appointing a replacement until there was another scheduled election. All right. Um, I want to go to Drew. I don't see FBA. She must have dropped. Go ahead, Drew. Wow, that, that was a lot of information. Uh, Judge, it's nice to hear you. Dana, man, you guys had so many points. Ashley laid out how they're doing it. Judge, you laid out kind of why they're doing it and how they tip around doing it. Dana, you pointed out that we have to play by their rules if we expect to beat them. We cannot, we just, uh, it'd be nice to be able to do that, Judge, but I don't think we'll be able to. You cannot beat a cheater. I mean, they're going to cheat. They've cheated before. They're going to cheat. Expect them to cheat. And the things you guys can do to help as far as local representation, Scott Pressler, man, he does a lot of work for the African-American community. As far as going there, cleaning up districts, helping, registering voters, like he travels the country, ex like explaining there is a replacement. Yes, the answer is black people are being replaced by illegals. You are. Absolutely. I mean, there's no way around it. You've got to find a way to take it on, Dana. You're right, man. Damn the rules. They, I, I mean, mean we're talking no. about defamation of character. I mean, look at what just happened. That's an attack on free speech. Donald Trump was just fined $86 million for yeah, saying he not, didn't. That's not going to stand up on appeal. I know it's not going to stand up on appeal, but it happened. It happened to a yeah. president. Yeah, that that's the game we're playing. They don't hesitate throwing these wild ass things at us every week. Can you imagine? Yeah, I can imagine. And so see, let me. Son, oh, what you're talking about is one of the what you're laying out is why we shouldn't go for this bullshit we hear so much of. Because when the press rah rah rahs this, they give the public the impression that that is American law. It's not. And there is another thing in American law, too. When you're talking about a defamation action, truth is an absolute defense, though some people don't like that these days. Uh, primary thing means you call a son of a bitch a son of a bitch, and if he feels bad about it, you're supposed to pay him. But that's not what the law is. If he's a son of a bitch, call him out. <laughs> 
It is. Um, let it me is. let me say this as well, Drew, um, because you're right. Black people, black Americans are being replaced by the illegals, but white people, you're next. And this is why I would say white people need to support black Americans more so than any, you know, more so now than any other time in history, because you're being replaced too. It's just that, just like Ashley said, it is quicker and easier to come at us first. So they're replacing just about all Americans. So this is a we thing. I just want to keep that in mind for everybody. All right, I want to go to Shah. Thank you so much, uh, Judge, Honorable Judge. Always good to hear your uh, common sense of the, you know, the my my folk, my older folks, and uh, on top of your you know, exposure to all the intellectual pursuits you've been through. And Dana, thank you for hosting. Um, I'm going to flip the script a little bit and uh, start off by saying the only thing uh, Ilhan Omar, if, whatever her name is, can do for us is what resources does Somali have? Uh, I believe that we need to identify these African populations. For example, Houston, that has probably... Uh, the, one of the largest Nigerian, probably Yorubas and Igbos, uh, and begin to create sister cities with Houston and uh, whatever, Lagos or whatever, maybe even a smaller country, um, a sw smaller city in Nigeria, and and begin to do some, um, some in some created, uh, uh, what they call supply chain with regards to whatever resources that they have, that something that we could utilize or even middleman, it could be things that we in our own communities can use, or it could be something like what Kenya is, uh, creates a chip, is creating a, a, a semiconductor chip, I believe, in Kenya. In fact, my I, I get this kind of spirit because I grew up in uh, Nairobi, East Palo Alto, California. They, we were nicknamed Nairobi. And actually, Nairobi, Kenya was a, uh, an honorary sister city of East Palo Alto. Now, imagine if we had been able to do some things with them. Uh, we would have probably been able to maintain our, our uh, black population, which was at, at the highest was 80 percent, probably around 90, 1990 or something like that. Uh, now we're down to four, four or five, six percent now, uh, mostly Mexicans. So uh, we need to begin to, to you know, get rid of these food deserts in our communities. And we need to be looking at uh, what we can, what kind of business we can do with Africans and those Africans and Caribbeans uh, that uh, come with knowledge of culture. Um, and they, maybe they come from uh, the jelly classes or grill classes or babalaos or whatever. They, they are cultural, uh, uh, you know, kind of treasures of their, of their community. We need to bring them into the community centers to teach. And we need to, you know, have language programs where they can be teaching our kids Kids can be learning uh, Malinke or uh, whatever the language is. And uh, so that part, we need to, you know, uh, have something where Africans that are coming here have to spend a certain, do a certain amount of community, uh, you know, um, volunteer service in the community, working with other young, young folks to do something positive in our communities. Uh, we need to flip the script so that we can begin to create a uh, economic base for our people here and we have a connection with some folks in different places where be they south america africa the caribbean and instead of always looking things you know looking at things from from the worst point of view we could actually utilize that and um you know really develop relationships africa has all these resources this would create a problem with white folks that this the, the crackers would come out if the minute we start doing something profound like that and actually dealing with building our economic base. Um, can I ask you a question? Are you a Pan-Africanist? You could say that. I mean, uh, I just call it a, a black person that, you know, took a lot of black studies classes in the eighties when I was a college kid. And um, the, the directive was going to community and make it better. And so the reason why I ask that, though, because I hear what you're saying, right? And you do have other groups here, well, usually immigrants, but they're coming from another country. So that connection is already strong. They have dual citizenship. So, you know, you have to ask the question on the other side of the coin for me is, do different countries, those countries, Nigeria, Ghana, whatever, 
Do they want to link with Black Americans here? See, that's the question. Do we have dual citizenship? No, because we were never a citizen there. Um, do we have open visa? No. Kenya, they, I think they just passed something for Black Americans for us to have a open visa or no visa. We don't need a visa, right? So you have to, it's not us. You have to look at the different countries, those ones you just laid out specifically in West Africa. Are they trying to do anything to help bridge that gap? Or are they just doing whatever they need to do to make sure that their particular government officials stay in power by access and trade with the United States government, never mind Black Americans. And I'm talking about now in 2024. See, there was a time to where that was the focus, maybe in the 60s, a little bit in the 70s, but that shit faded off. So now we're talking about the new group of people coming from these different um, continents in Africa, whether they're coming here illegally through the border or whether they're coming here because they come from an um, affluent family in different countries in Africa, they ain't fucking with Black Americans because they're focused on what can I do to make sure my wealth is expanding in Nigeria, in Ghana, in South Africa, or what have you. They're not being taught because you have to understand a lot of different countries in Africa are very much colonized. So the question I ask, are those countries passing any policies to specifically work with Black Americans and to help bridge, you know, help create a bridge for trade, for infrastructure, for commerce? And then also, do Black Americans have the money to start these infrastructures or these ventures in different countries in Africa? So there's two things going on here. Okay, I'd like to answer both of those. There are some small or nonprofits that are, are dealing with some of these these uh, questions that you're bringing up, like the African Development uh, African Diaspora Development Institute. That is one headed by uh, one of the former AU members, uh, Arikana Kwao. And uh, there's some other organizations too. But even in the '80s, it wasn't uh, a big thing. It wasn't like that was the thing we were doing. No, it wasn't. Um, and I think that on an individual le level, any brother or sister from Africa, they're coming here to get an education or make money. And if you have a business proposition for them as an individual, they want to make money. It, it may not even be about a love fest. Like it, it may not, that may not even be. No, the question I'm asking, do they have a proposition for us? Whether you're so on an individual so or whether the gov, whether I'm talking about the, the government officials, let's just take Nigeria. You know, um, now individually, yeah, for the Nigerian, if we're in the same class and we go to the same school, we may become friends and do some business. That's I'm not I'm talking about. Are they trying to make a proposition with us, the government in Nigeria? Uh, I would not say that anything that I know of, but I will say that uh, Ghana is very open to ideas like that. And Sierra Leone, as far as citizenship, is very open, but as well. If you just go on the surface, any I think any country any in Africa would be open to doing business with Black Americans, as they call us, right? Uh, it's just that I think that there just is not enough interest on either side. You know, no one has said let's let's do this or let's do that. I think that I think have. that needs to. I think I think more research needs to be put in that because what I'm seeing, and for the little bit that I've gathered, right. They're not really, you, you have, unless you are a major player here in America, yeah, you could go to anywhere, but particularly in different countries in Africa, if you have the connections. But make no mistake about it. Let's stop thinking that the continent of Africa is Wakanda or these different countries in Africa or Wakanda, because they're not. And I'm talking about the more advanced ones where you're talking about, you know, let's just take Morocco and Egypt. Now, my grandkids, their father, he's Egyptian, even though he was, you know, pretty much raised here. However, he could go to Morocco and because he's Egyptian and even though he's American, right? Or he, because he has Egyptian lineage and yes, he is Muslim, but he has Egyptian lineage. Never mind him being America, but he is America. He automatically can become a citizen, dual citizenship. See, Morocco, Libya, Egypt, they do that. They automatically, no matter where you're at in this world. Dana, you, you can going, do that. No, you're I can't. Your listen, intelligence. Listen. No, 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 no. You're not listening. I'm talking about the Moroccan government, the Egyptian I, I government. 
You right. cannot, we do not have dual citizenship in Ghana, in Kenya, in South Africa, in do Nigeria. You have to, to we do don't this. Do you, you have to have say, wait a minute, you're not stop, stop, stop interrupting me. What I'm saying is, if you don't even have the basic public policies put in place for limiting of getting rid of the visa. Let's start there. Forget about the dual citizenship. I still need a visa. So you want me to do business, but you always want me to come. You, you, you're, you're talking as if we need to go there. What I'm saying is they're not putting any type of policies in place for us, for them to come for us. You're talking about a country where they have government officials and a majority, 90 percent of them are fucking corrupt. That's not utopia for black Americans. Well, this ain't right. utopia either for Black Americans. No, it is. It is. It is. The United States. It is. Is not yes. It, no, yes, it's, it is. Yes, it is. It's utopia for me. Why? Yeah. You know why it's utopia for me? Because I could take my ass outside and I could hustle every motherfucking day and I could become a millionaire in, in, in 12 months, right? Or I could become a bum. I could become whatever the fuck I want to do because my lineage here helped create this country to what it is today. The black Americans here, what makes us different than any other black person throughout the diaspora is we actually in this country and help shape and mold and create what this country is today. So if it's a utopia, why are we talking about the shit we're talking about? Because, we, because we're talking about politics and our politics is we're, we're talking about what is going on in American politics. It's a dog. It's a doggy dog world. So it, it's utopia because I could do whatever the fuck I want to do, and I and, and and I could make something. I can't do. I we we can't do this. Have this space in Nigeria or Uganda. Why? Because if somebody like Transis is in the room, they ass gonna get locked up or worse. So and, they, and I'm just using that as one example. So what I'm saying is, even though this world is quote unquote evil or whatever. America right now is utopia, and I'm just trying to keep it my utopia. Yes. Judge, but go ahead. Judge. And remind him, um, Dana, that the oppressors there look just Yeah, like can everybody please just stay on your mic? You, I'm coming to you. I just need, cause you, you're next, Latasha. You're next. Um, I get he wants you, you to Dana. speak, Judge. I get you. What, you. what do you think, Judge? Uh, it's like this. First Amendment gives you free speech especially if it's said on the floor of Congress, either the House or the Senate, or going to and from. Now, you can't do anything about it. There it is. So That's not what, what I was talking about, to... Dennis. No, we're yeah, talking about I mean... connection with, with, with uh, making connections with Africa and build our economies in yeah, our own I, communities. Well, that, that's what I'm talking about. You see, it's freedom of speech. Somebody said it. We may not like it, but the point is, it's said, and what is implied by that particular speech is that, hey, somebody that's got this shit together overseas has got representatives over here in the new Rome in the world, and they're making it, and they want to collaborate and reach back. Our problem is we've got nobody to reach back to. Now, if you take a DNA test, you can find out who your people are in Africa. Most of us came from West Africa. And a uh, overwhelming majority of us came from Nigeria. But we don't know whether we're Yoruba, House of Fulani, uh, Igbo, or any of the minor tribes over there. So the point is, is this person knows where their connections are and they are making connection back to the old world that extends into the new. And we can't do that. And another reason why we can't do that, because you have tribes, let's just stick on Nigeria. They don't even fuck with each other. So if I don't know what tribe, if if my DNA was to trace back to what we what we call Nigeria, right? Because that was colonized. If it was to trace back to Nigeria, what tribe did I come from? I don't know. And it could be a tribe that's on the lower caste system. Because make no mistake about it, they got a caste system in these different countries in Africa as well. So I'm gonna give you the last word, Shad, then I'm gonna go on to Letitia, Latasha. Well, and I'll close with this. 
them them white folks is making have been making and still making hand over foot money millions and millions of dollars in Nigeria and all these other countries Ghana Togo you name it they're at the top of the food chain got these these deals sold up the mines and uh put the corrupt leaders in place and uh it's a changing of the guard I feel that the young people are tired of the bullshit and I think it's a great time to to make connections as this thing is starting to change over um and then certainly you can be under the radar with a lot of projects and and do things because at the end of the day as long as people are making money that's that's what you know makes the world go round so I, no, no i listen if it's about business i agree with you but it's so much red tape that we're not really privy to it is a lot of fucking red tape but that whole concept i don't disagree with you all right i want to go to the uh, Latasha, May I right? offer one little oh. perspective very briefly? Nigeria will soon be the fourth largest country in the world. It is the major oil producing country in OPEC. It's the largest, not Saudi Arabia. Uh, a former roommate of mine uh, majored in nuclear physics, and he was former head of uh, energy for Nigeria. He knows how to make a nuke, knows it well. So they may have nukes and they have a pretty large army. They have some things they have to work out, but it's not a bad place in terms of, uh, well, it's like being somebody connected to Great Britain, France, Germany, the People's Republic of China, Japan, or place like that where they happen to be a world economic or military power so it doesn't hurt um yeah and I, and it's like i think you know dark clint in the comment section saying america is limited utopia not maximum for black listen well then go go to fuck the africa then and and, and you and then you let me know how you turn out that's that's all i'm gonna say with that dark clint love you um latasha Hi, Dana. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to speak and uh, grand rising to you all, um, Judge Joe Brown. And uh, Thank everyone. you. I appreciate the space. Um, I myself, I speak from the vantage point of a misclassified American Indian. So um, allow some grace because I know that's a hot button for some. Um, I just want to speak to a couple of things we talked about in here. The one, Ilhan Omar. Um, I think you're absolutely right, Judge. She speaks to her constituency. Um, her constituents in that area are a majority of Somali people. And I do believe that what the brother was talking about, um, for one, I can tell you I have some land still in um, Palo Alto, a barbershop or two. And I can tell you that um, we would never have referred to Palo Alto as Nairobi. So I'm not sure where that came from. But either here nor there, it speaks to the migration and immigration patterns of United States. As an um, American history researcher um, and a member of an organization that does research on real American history and how we got to the situation that we're in today, um, misclassification has been a huge part of that for quote unquote black people. Um, I don't agree with us having roots to Nigeria if Nigeria was founded in 1961. We were well on our way at that point. So we would have to find another point of origin if, if we're going to try to make this an African thing. But if we're going to talk about America, we do have to talk about the fact, and I'm not sure if people understand it wholly, and Judge, maybe you could add some con context uh, for people who don't understand the legal side of it, is population trade agreements have gotten the United States corporation the populace that it has today. We have individual agreements with different countries for certain sects of their population to come here to become citizens, i.e. what Dana was talking about, how we will not hold dual citizenship in a lot of these countries because dual citizenship is something that is held for the people that are actually of the blood of that country and that have chosen to come to the United States because the United States is an amalgamation of different ethnicities sitting on top of a people that they have misclassified. So when you fall and you pick a black or white box, and that's what you choose, everyone that comes to this country gets to pick a black or white box. That's just what it is. 
And those people come here in, by way of the United States paying for these people to be a part of the union. This is not new. This is a very old thing. And going back to 1870 Naturalization Act, you're going to find that once they naturalized all of these people to become quote unquote citizens, you'll find around 1910, the exact same thing that's happening now is happening then. Everyone who was like, wait a minute, I've been here. I'm the real American, right? But immigration was happening all the while. So those new people that were coming in, this is why they had to stop and do the Racial Integrity Act by 1914 to say, okay, hold on. Some of these people are old country Americans and some of you people are new Americans. This country is only 250 years old. So we can't get into this place of the immigrants aren't coming because they're always coming. The fact is, if you're not American Indian, you are an immigrant here. That's everybody. OK, black or white. So because we've decided to come and check a box and fit ourselves into a, in a, in a position, then this is where you get your political parties, right? Political parties are based on nation states. Nation states are racial states. So for a long time, the quote unquote black people or some were Negroes at the time, not the same thing, were voting Republican, were Republican soldiers, were Republican Confederates. That shifted about 70 years ago. Everyone decided after the quote unquote black power movement that we were moving Democrats, right? So now we're in a situation where we've got 9 million new immigrants coming from everywhere. Let's not play the game that these are South Americans. We're all on Twitter. So we see these videos of military age men entering the country from the Eastern continent. And these people, when they come here, are not checking a box because they aren't even considered citizens yet. And like the brother was saying, we're offering these people driver's license. We're offering these people right to work to fill the gaps in the gross domestic product, which by far the United States has way more resources. These oil resources that we're talking about in Africa are refineries and production factories. Those of us that are studying this know these things. So, of course, everyone's coming here, right? What are we going to do about the fact that these people continually get pushed into, quote unquote, black neighborhoods? That's not new either. This is how we went from 1970 being seven out of 10 business owners in black communities to now less than one. So this isn't a new play. The United States continues to say it's been working. Why change it? And now that they have decided that Negroes were black and blacks are now African-American, and now they've got you all doing DNA tests to get you to countries that are less than 70 years old. Well, congratulations. They are creating a way to replace you because they're asking you to go to these places that they've just newly created. So, yes, there's a there's a group there. But like Dana just said, if you're from here and you know you're from here, this is the best place in the world to be. We have to build constituencies that represent the people here, not just people just like someone said, doesn't matter what color they are, or who they are. No, bloodline. We need people that are going to be standing for the people that are here as long as us, understand our values here understand our misclassification here and are prepared to do right by those specific people. Most of the people that look like us that are in office are a part of the same immigrant class that you guys are complaining about. They just don't have the right title. So because they have a black face, it's okay. But you're not getting anywhere. So that must tell you that there's still Im immigrants first, right? And your black class is second. So all I'm saying is we have to find people that are actually going to stand up for their lineage here in America and don't want to play, don't have to play the game, don't feel like they need to play the African game or the Kumbaya game, but stand on American values. We've been here a lot longer. We've been doing this thing a lot, a long time. And we have to have people that are willing to speak on that. I know Judge Joe Brown in the past, I've heard you speak about your Choctaw heritage. I also have Choctaw heritage. Well, that hello not, there. That should not be like 
misplaced or a thing that's not important because that sows you to this soil. And that means that your values and interests here should be paramount to people who have come and left. And people should see that as a genuine quality of why would he mess over his own land? His ancestors were buried here. Right. But we we, we don't want to acquiesce to that. I don't know if it's dangerous um, still for some to feel like that's a, a place we don't want to go or whatever it is. But if we're not standing on us being from here, then why would anyone think we care about this place? And I'm long winded, so I'll land there and I appreciate the time to speak. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Royal Queen, you're next. Then Lou, then Brooklyn, Nicholas, Light, Troy. Um, I see, wait a minute, one, one second. I see Justin and Drew. Uh, I'll bring you back up in a minute. I just want to get through the new speakers. So go ahead, Royal Queen. All righty, all righty. First and foremost, I want to say they're not replacing Black Americans in a conventional sense. It's a yes and no, no kind of double-edged sword thing, because first you've got to run something socially, politically, tangibly in order to be replaced. And before you say, oh, oh she's talking down on us, no. Tell me what Black Americans run, own, and control in this country. That's number one. So they're not really replacing Black Americans because oh, you, you shift gears and say they're replacing us in the sense that we are a political consumer class or a consumer class and a permanent underclass. Yes, they are taking that over. Okay, because what Democrats are doing is bringing them here to become a um, permanent underclass and a new voter block. Okay. And Blacks have been quite dominant in voting for Democrats over, uh, I guess, 100 years now to no avail to us. And so I also want to say um, this whole notion about, oh, illegal immigration and they were replacing us as a conversation we, we shouldn't entertain because it got started from the FBA ADOS thing where Ignorant people like, what's her name, Yvette Carnell, went online and started talking. And now we're seeing this whole era of black xenophobia and anti-blackness take fold where we're hating ourselves. If anything, a black African will come here and up our mere marginal 13% of the population. And that's a good thing. We need numbers. So I just hear a lot of ridiculous conversations being entertained and silliness that really we're in a unique position to ignore, okay, because we, we cannot be replaced in this country. If that were the case, many years ago, whites would have replaced us already. It's impossible. It's not possible to replace us because in a lot of ways, your economy is tied to your, your, um, your, what is that called? phenotype, your hair, how you look, how fast you can run, okay, things like that. When it comes to sports, we're dominant. They can't replace us in sports. So I'm hearing a lot of talk that it really isn't beneficial to us. That's a waste of time because we could build something first and then we'll worry about being replaced. We're not there yet, in my particular opinion. So... Um, let me ask you a question real quick, because you just said uh -huh. that um, the question I want to ask you, you just said, you know, the let's just say the black Africans that are coming over here, that helps us in numbers. Um, how does that help us as far as numbers increasing our population? Because they delineate from us. They're just their their numbers don't it, it don't spill over to public policies that advance us. So they don't they don't the, especially the ones coming over here now they separate themselves from black Americans and create their own hubs and public policies and elect well, their officials. They do that, or is that a topic? And we're we're talking about know. Elon Omar. We're talking about Elon, mm -hmm. Elhan Omar. That's, that's, is that, and that's a prime example. Yes. So how the increase in numbers do not directly is, is not a direct positive effect on black Americans. It's actually the opposite. 
Well, she's like every white person doesn't benefit white people, though. Okay, she's an individual who's obviously working for the Democratic establishment. Okay, she has an agenda over black people. So she shouldn't serve her master. You can't serve two masters. Okay. That's what's going on there. But yeah, but she is serving two masters. She's serving a master here in um, the American Constitution and Congress, and she's serving the masters over in Somalia. But the fact is that she is here to make sure her people from Somalia comes to America for a better life, you know, well, to well, enhance well, the next generation. Well, they're not black Americans, but they're black people nonetheless so. but her policies her public policies locally benefit somalians not black well, americans really? what's wrong with mm -hmm. that i'm not, yeah, I'm not saying that i'm going to her point to where she say that we should champion them coming here because it helps us in numbers and what i'm saying is it does not help us in having their numbers increase with ours. It actually does the opposite. Well, let me put it this way. A people, okay, who are not anchored to anything they control on and operate, as Claude Anderson says, mm, really can't be represented by policy, good or bad, okay? The Chinese can because they own and operate Chinatowns, you know, so... You know, a consumer class of people cannot, though. So what happens with her and Somalians has little weight or effect against us. And that's a good thing, though. But you just said well, their numbers me... benefit us. And that's why you just proved my point, that their numbers do not benefit us because they're not here for policies. self. Those policies will not affect us, but the numbers can benefit us. How can the numbers benefit us is if the policies are because not benefit? See, the purpose of numbers is policy. We're going to count them on the census as black people, okay? And black and white are, are just... It doesn't matter. So fuck, fuck the numbers. Because you have to understand, if 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 I need more bodies for a policy, then that's what I need. But if I don't need Black Americans' bodies, but I need my own people' bodies or whatever for so public policies, then that's wait, wait, my wait, focus. Wait. So when the I'm number, wait, 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 so stop. The number, of, the number of bodies means doesn't mean shit unless policies is attached to it. So you're telling me when a black Somalian becomes a, a, an American black Somalian, okay, that doesn't help. Uh, um, but black there's no such thing as an American black Somalian. They're just yes, Somalian American. No, yes, they're Somalian. They're Somalian American. They're okay, Somalian now. American. Okay, just oh, like when you saw, just ladies, like Elon ladies, Musk. Ladies, Stop. Ladies. Let me finish. No, let me finish my point. Elon Musk is African American. He's not white African American. He's African American. Yes, yeah, he may check off. He may Gallup. check off white. He may check off, and I need people to stay on a mic. That is a pet peeve, and it just ruins the flow. He may check off white, but he is African-American. The Somalians, they're not checking off black, but they are Somalian-Americans, not black Somalian-Americans. But if you want to put black in the front for the sake of their skin color, whatever. But they're Somalian-Americans. Let me ask you this. Can they claim black American as a status or ethnicity no yes no no yes, they they're no, black they not no they're immigrant no well unfortunately oh, when they be they now they can claim african-american but no. so can elon musk but which is why become, we want a separate box when they become citizens they can claim black american yes but they, they can. don't they do not number one they do not because it says, mm -hmm. because it gives them a box of being an immigrant. It does say African on these boxes. But okay, look, 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 look. Hold on one second. Hold on one second, ladies. Look, 1967, 68, at UCLA, we had Somalian, Kenyan, we had Nigerian, we had Ethiopian students. We had black students, but we didn't have that many of them. So when we all put together, we had more clout than we had operating separately. And we got a lot of things done because of our collective power.
Like what? Now, and well, what well, year? What decade was this? This is in the sixties. Yeah, this was is in, the, What was the percentage back then what, of wasn't Africans very high, but, immigrants? Well, it, it was less well, than ten. It was not. Matter of fact, it was yeah, less no, than five. No, it wasn't no, even one percent. Stop a second. No, because in, the numbers well, matter, right? Stop a second. When I got in UCLA, we had one hundred and forty-five full-time black students. We had 73 full-time grad students and 72 full-time undergrads out of a total student body of about 62,000 full-time students. Between the Africans who were foreign nationals and the American Blacks, we had about 260 or so. So we essentially doubled our numbers by putting ourselves together, and we wound up getting some programs that got implemented. We did some things which didn't consist of begging. It was delivering consequence at the time, and we got stuff together. That was in 19, the 60s. Yes, 19. But in the 2000s, on, wait a minute, on, let me just say on. this for context purposes. In the 2000, and actually in 2000, that new batch of Africans that came okay, over here because now, it was a wave, they are not aligning their priorities with us. I will tell you what I have learned about that. We have lost all respect in the intervening 50 years with just about everybody because we have fallen for this glorification of dysfunction. And instead of the young black man being in charge of his racist future in this country, we are looked at as disgraceful embarrassments to masculinity. We have become sissified. We have become advocates for the rainbow cult that is destroying our families, and we get no respect. We have become pimps drug dealers, murderers, thieves, and every miscreant that the rest of the world tries to put in a jail or diminish the effect of, and that's what we are becoming known as. That's why we don't have much respect. We had it, but we lost it. As an example, very briefly, 1972-1973, Frelimo, the guerrillas in Mozambique were raising a revolution. We managed by hook and crook to get several thousand pairs of combat boots new in the box, and we got them on board an aircraft that was going to ship them through the Caribbean and from there on into England and from there into Mozambique. The State Department didn't like it, so they seized this huge load of combat boots. We had chartered a DC-8, which is a four-engine airliner that Douglas used to make. They don't anymore. And what we wound up having to do once they confiscated them was to raise money by putting on a concert wherein... Aretha Franklin, Stevie Wonder performed free, Pharaoh Sanders, Oscar Brown Jr., and Gene Pace. Uh, and we raised a hell of a lot of money for them, and we sent it on. We got for years on end cooperation from the powers that be in Mozambique because of what we did. And several times we even got the Mozambican Council getting involved in some stuff that was happening in L.A., which I wasn't immediately privy to because I'd moved to Memphis. Now, that is how when you give something, you get something. We weren't just begging. We put, our, we put up rather than having to shut up. We said, we'll help you. They said, fine, show us. We did. And it was for a cause, and they were grateful afterwards, and we got a lot of stuff that came out of it. Uh, Yuko Babu, who was the person that was the honcho on this, got influenced, so he wound up setting up the Pan-African Film Festival out in L.A., where they have a conference every year. It is well attended. A lot comes out of it. Sanity comes out of it, and he still. Well, they runs don't have it, it anymore. Years no, they still have it. No, they don't. Yes, they do. No, they don't. I, I can tell you right I now, they an, don't. 
I got an invitation two years ago. Now you're talking about have... you're talking about the Nigerian. Um, no, um, I'm not talking about. What's Nigerian. it called? I'm no talking about or something. No, not about Nollywood. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm ain't no ta- Pan Africanism Film Festival in LA Pan anymore. African Film Festival, a Yuko Babu. Let me just say this: the, 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 the exa- I, I'm not going against your example, but what's the I'm difference in 2024? How many coups because happen in these different countries throughout lost, the decades? How many governmental lost, coups? We've lost. No, we did, respect. or did the African countries we've lose? Lost Real don't blame that on uh, black no, Americans. No. Yeah, when, they, when you got no, no, no. This lost. is the point that I'm making. We've African lost. countries, different African countries, need to take accountability for their no, fuck they ups don't too. Need to take accountability. Yeah, they do. We need to because no, we need to take accountability at, for us here. Yes, and we they need watched. to take accountability for them there. 50 years. If you ago. don't, we not we we'll never be able to make a bridge to work together. But don't well, sit up here and act like the African the countries that they simple. shit together because they don't. 50 you know, years one, ago, black yeah. Americans were looked at as the front line for doing what W.E.B. Du Bois talked about 120 years ago. He said the problem with the world, the whole world for the 20th century will center on the color line. The solution to that is for the American Negro, the top 10%, to bootstrap themselves up and every other member of the race. Well, the top 10% the world. sold out Black Americans. We That's what the hell happened. No, that is not what happened. Because where the top 10% at that right now? Did not now, because the top 10% is no longer what it used to be. It's not because the they pinnacle. sold out. It when we look at that Congressional Black Caucus, that's out. our top they, 10%. percent did not sell out. What happened was, is the top 10% who did not have affirmative action, who had routine and rigid but segregation. But who helped push affirmative action excuse in? Excuse me, if you let me finish, I'll get there quickly. Now, what happened is this top 10% was able to push through the brick walls of segregation. It was able to achieve in spite of everything going against it. And when it kicked in the damn doors, burnt down the towns, and did other things like that, some of the things I will not mention, what happens is you got this second tier worth of weak Negro who did not have what it took to get in the front door or kick the doors in, didn't have what it took to stand up and do what was necessary by any means necessary. They punked out. They were boule, bourgeoisie. They snuck in and they have flooded every damn thing and it's gone downhill. The All rest right, gonna, of the world, wait uh, a minute, one other point. The rest of the world, black, that was trying to work with American black folk now no longer has any respect for us because we wear our pants sagged and bagged. We're in the hip hop gangster rap. We don't respect our families nor our women. We don't protect womanhood and childhood and promote manhood. We've copped out. In the black leadership that was trying to be where Sam Bra- uh, uh, Tom Bradley was, being where the mayor of Chicago, uh, Washington was, being where the governor of Virginia was, and doing the things that were to be done, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, H. Rap Brown, being exemplars of bravery and courage all have black now Americans. been replaced by the likes of cory booker That's, I'm, not dis- I'm not disagreeing with you with that but the, the point so i'm trying to make no here respect. um first of all i don't need a uh, african that's fleeing their country respect because if you had so much pride where you were from then why the hell are you trying to not trying to cross in our borders here illegally why everybody. you know no 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 why you know why they're coming here? Because their country ain't shit either. So the well, fact is, wait, wait, wait. So the fact is, whether you, whether you sold you, so it's not utopia. So don't give me this like, yes, black Americans, we do and have our people. Wait, no, my utopia. point is, 
Black Americans, we have our own internal fuck ups that we need to straighten yeah, out. Look, look. But I'm not going to sit up here and say, well, the Africans got their shit together because if I they did, they then did. the millions of people in Congo will uprise were, against all those corporations that got them digging in the fucking mud for minerals. So at the same time, we have for... our internal. No, let me finish. We have our internal issues here, and they got their internal issues there. It's just that they're taking the punk out way by coming here illegally instead of standing there and fighting like we once did here. So I'm gonna go okay. on the loo. Wait, 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 one second, one second. No, we had at one point, not lately, we but that's were what we're trying. No, no, no. It. But that is what the new movement is doing now. There is no new movement. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. About yes, it now. is a new movement. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And we'll talk we about that next week on the space. Because it is. It is. We had wait, wait, wait. Like, wait. I, I, I want to go. I want to go. Now. I want to go to Lou. I, we don't. Listen, we don't you know have to we don't have are? to pick up arms, Judge, because your no, generation you did that. No. But we do have you to fight back. It it's just a different way we have to fight you back. Know what it was? No, I don't it really was, care what it was because we ain't in 1960 no more. We're in 2024. Yeah, that's and it's why a new it's black pathetic. American movement. Because the rest of the world was looking to black America to provide the leadership. Yeah, but you but you still looking we to America. But they still didn't. looking to America. We abdicated So why they still looking to America then? Everybody, here. They're coming everybody here. Everybody left some place where they didn't but make it. But they're coming really here. here. They're Even they're, Native they're Americans here. couldn't make it in Asia and came across uh, the Bering exactly. Strait they're when there coming, was a land right. bridge. So, right, exactly. Or exactly. an ice bridge. You, you, you just made my point. They're coming here. Group. They're coming. Everybody see, but see, this is the thing, Judge. No matter how Everybody fucked up black Americans are, group. no matter how messed up we Everybody are, we are not fleeing going there. They're still coming me. here. That's we the difference. Have the embarrassment of it doesn't, being I don't, I don't care, but we're not leaving. We're not going of, anywhere though. We're we not fleeing. We're not fleeing though. We're not fleeing. I don't stop? care. I don't care. But no, Will because I'm stop? moving on to the next speaker. We gotta stop? go to Lou. No, Will no, because I'm briefly. not going to agree with that. The point is an important one, and it's not. I don't. I don't really care what that point is. To hear it, I don't know. We now heard stop it. Stop it. No, you haven't heard it. Yes, the you just said is, we are an embarrassment. Is that we were on the way to redemption with burn, baby, burn. And what happened is we copped out over the last half century and we started glorifying dysfunction. Now, instead of being somebody to be looked up to, we are looked down on and ridiculed for being fools. And the bottom line is, is everybody in the world is coming over here. Everybody left. The English, the French, the Germans, the Swiss, the Italians, the Greeks, the Turks, the Norwegians, everybody left. The Native Americans long before everybody All right, else. You're not even I want to move on to Lou. Let's move on no, to that's Lou. That's where it is. Go ahead, Lou. You can speak, Lou. No, Queen, I got to move on to Lou because it's, no, I'm, uh, first of all, your phone sound like pure shit right now. And I don't want it to mess up my algorithm on YouTube or the X space. So just mute up. And I got to move on to Lou, then Brooklyn, Nicholas, Light, Troy. Right, if they're still up here, and I have seven people in queue, and I do want to kind of end this at eight and may go a little bit over. So, um, Lou, you can unmute your mic. Yeah, how you doing? Uh, it's a great room. What up, Judge? What up, Dana? How y'all doing? All right, so I'm got it, all right, Lou, your phone sound like shit too. Come on, come on, come on. With the Wi-Fi people, go somewhere with strong Wi-Fi. I'm, going I'm on out. Wi-Fi. I'm out the country right now, but I'm on Wi-Fi. Y'all hear me? Yeah, yeah, exactly. My point exactly, Lou. Thank you, Lou. You out the country. That's why the Wi-Fi. No, nah, but I'm on up. Wi-Fi. Yeah. I'm on Wi-Fi. Y'all hear me? But you ain't in Hello. America. So you ain't. Oh, but we can hear you. Go ahead, Lou. What it's country been, you in? I've been waiting for an hour, man. Y'all hear me? I know, I know. Go ahead, Lou. We can hear you. Yes. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, Luke, can, all right, can you guys hear me? But it, yeah, we can hear you, Dana. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. all right, one second. See, this is what I mean by the fucking Wi-Fi. You're at, you're at a restaurant, number one, and it's noisy, so you can't hear, and then you're going in and out. 
Everybody, I need to everybody stay on a mic. Lou, unmute. Lou, where are you? Lou. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. All right. So, where are you, where are you calling from? Uh, I'm Black American descendant of slavery, from? but I'm but uh, but I'm in I'm but I'm in uh, May I'm in Mexico right now. I'm in Mexico. I'm in Mexico. Okay. All right. So Go I ahead. just wanted to say this. So um. I want to respond to the to the lady real queen first, and then I'll go on my little uh, about the topic. So uh, queen mentioned earlier, we don't own anything. How are we getting replaced, right? If we own something, right? Because when you own something, right, n nobody can take that from you. So when you say we don't own anything, that's why we can't. Uh, how are we being replaced? The point is we're being replaced because we because based off your uh, point, we don't own anything, right? So you can be replaced when you're employees, Laura. Let I'm sorry. All right. So let me, let me let me say this real quick. So uh, I think Black America need to be more proactive than reactive, right? And I feel like based off how we voted the last 50 years, right, we actually voted for our demise, right? And it's a it, and it's a harsh reality, right? But I feel like once we hold ourselves accountable and do what we're doing uh, in recent times, right, with this ethno uh, pride, right, which which is a beautiful thing to have, but we didn't always have this mentality as a collective. So I feel like. Uh, most of our problems, the replacement, us being pro BIPOC, us being allies with Asians, and then they step on us once they're done getting what they want, us allying with every other group, right? Should be over, right? But but we 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 also got to keep it real because uh, my family, my my pop side from uh, LA, right? And they, they've been talking about. I was born in the '90s, but they've been talking about um, we better learn a new language since the '70s. Right, because they like other uh, domestics coming in, and we voted in favor of it. Right, we've been we've been uh brown and brown and black coalition for the last fifty years, and right now, right, what we're doing is we're being reactive. Right, we seeing what happened to us all throughout the country for the last fifty years, and we're getting tired of it. Instead of keeping the play, right, and then uh making the right test moves, right. So, I'm saying um. What we need to do now, right? I think um, the replacement, and a lot of people are gonna uh, feel some type of way about this, but I think the um, this quote unquote being replaced is is, is kind of necessary because um, it's time for like the black one percent, like the you know, because if you look at in every community, there's a group of uh, women and men, right? One percent of the community that's employing the rest of the ninety nine percent, right? And what this integration did was it gave us. Uh, uh, we got uh, kind of complacent and uh, cool with working for these white folks, right? And then we start being in competition with each other in this corporate America instead of creating our own black corporate America and empowering the 99%. So I'm saying I'm 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 actually uh, uh, glad this shit happening to us because now instead of being in competition with us, we can actually build our people as a collective, right? Instead of uh, black entrepreneurs competing with each other. Instead of doing this Kobe versus Shaq, I mean, Kobe versus LeBron, uh, black intellectuals versus other black intellectuals, right? We need to come together as a collective and compete with these white folks. And that's what our ancestors did fresh out of slavery, right? They, they, they had an opposition as a collective, right? They probably had a lot of internal issues, but everybody didn't see it, right? So I think it's time for uh, black America, uh, women and men, right? Because our women is working for corporate America, getting 60, 60 cent on the dollar compared to their white counterparts that's working the same position. Uh, our women is have to change their hairstyle. That's why they just recently implemented the Crown Act, right? So I'm saying fuck white corporate America, right? Let's let's because individually, right, we do great, right? Individually, Black America do, do great as individuals, right? But how we gonna get us to the next level is us coming together as a collective and that. And I'm talking about the higher ups, right? The black business people, right? The, the people that got some a, a, a little I I institutional power, right? That way, uh, we come together and have a um, external um, uh, enemy, right? So that's what I'm on. Uh, I'm with the pro accountability. Uh, we fucked up. Uh, we voted 90 percent one way, and everything we complaining about is our is 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 to our own demise, right? Uh, white people gonna do what they always gonna do. Non-black people are always gonna uh, look down on this, right? But uh, 
until we start holding each other uh, each other accountable for this crab in the barrel shit uh, in the community and start moving uh, as a collective, uh, we still gonna be um, reactive instead of proactive. Thank you. I appreciate you um, tapping in from Mexico. Brief comment. There are some black people and people look like me. There's no way in hell I'd work with them because I know from the 60s that some of them are snitches, pimps, low down, backstabbing, and they work for alphabet agencies and they're trying to kill you off, get rid of you or get you put in jail. And they are our profound enemies. And there's something we need to do about them. We can't unify until the people that want to be unified with the rest of us are tested, proved, and engaging in collective activity in a way that is not harmful to us. Can you see being stuck having to work with a Cory Booker or a fake like Kamala Harris? No, I Yeah, no, I'm saying this. Oh, 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 OG, I mean, I'm saying that, this. That, it's just a reality. I understand. The no, 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 but I'm, but I'm saying this, oh, oh, OG, because I'm, I'm looking at the cup half full instead of half empty. Right? There's 40 million black Americans, right? So I'm more so focused on building, because there's cones, there's sellouts, there's low vibrational people in all cultures, right? But instead of acknowledging them, right, let's focus on building with like-minded individuals, right? Instead of like, because I feel like we... When we bring up other groups of people and what and what they're doing right within the community that we don't like, it's like a cop out, right, to not build with the people that's actually on the same page as you. So I'd rather build with somebody that's like minded, that's that's morally aligned with me, that's Black American, before I build with a coon. So I'd rather focus on that aspect of it than just focusing in on people that's coons. Like, oh look, uh, somebody like uh, Kamala Harris, okay. Fuck Kamala Harris. Let's focus on somebody that's um yeah, that's like minded F-bombs. like you. That's a woman. You know what I'm saying? Cause I, cause I be feeling like a lot of this shit is excuse to not build uh with with the people that's like minded. Right. Okay, I agree with you. I agree with you. But the problem is inherent in this. How can you tell who's a coon? The people that are gonna hurt you, get you killed, snitch on you, set you up, ruin you double cross you are not going so to So we going to wait for Jesus to come? No, you're not. You're going to have to do some things. There's some things you're going to have to do, but you got to get ruthless. And the thing you need to understand is that the person that's going to be dangerous is not the one that's going to look like the coon. The person you're calling the coon may be giving you some sound advice because everything is not going to go the way you want it. So I will tell you this. The people that are the ones that are being most black are most likely to be the ones that are acting least black behind the scenes. That's what you got to work out, look out for. All right. I want to move on. No, I appreciate to that game, Juan. But Thank I'm you, saying Lou. this. So I, I feel like uh, now, Wait, well, Lou, now that we got I'm like sorry, can Lou hear me? Right, amongst black can Americans, Lou right? Hear more me? ethnic based. Because if you look at strong. I don't know. I don't know if Lou can hear me or not. Can you guys hear me? Thank you. Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Um, Lou, I got to move on. You. Lou, you have a delay, and I need to move on to the other speakers because it's 10, 12 people right now in queue. I need to go to Brooklyn. Hey, shalom to the space. Dropping in, representing the Israelite School of Universal Practical Knowledge. I'm just going to go against the grain real quick. You know, respect to the judge. Everybody's been in here saying valid things. And I'm in New York, so, you know, I'm in the middle of it. I, I see it every day. I hear this every day. But it really seems like we're falling for the okie doke and playing into their hand. We're here fighting for the lowest rung on the ladder when we're having this discussion about illegal migrants taking jobs and votes. And meanwhile, every Asian, Arab, Indian comes into our communities, sets up businesses, takes fights for our spaces and universities. There's just been a lawsuit last week where they're, where they're suing the city over a STEM program for black and Hispanic kids. They are literally the parasites in our community taking Josh, our spaces. please, can you mute? Just mute. Go ahead, and, Brooklyn. And, and, and the point is, 
you know, while all of that's going on and they're taking up the entire tech industry and, and every top industry in this country, we're being pit against the other poorest group of people in this country. And we're fighting over the lowest rung on the ladder. It's just a distraction from the things that we should be focused on. And I mean, I would, I would really like to, to hear that angle addressed. And I, I mean, am I the only one that sees that? I'm sorry, what was, what was your question? The, the, the question or the point is that it, whenever we have this discussion about illegal migrants and talking about minimum wage jobs and talking about are they replacing us, it really feels like we're being used and pit against each other to fight for the bottom. And I mean, I just want some, some feedback on that. I just want to hear people talk about what's, that what's aspect of it because I don't what, hear that. What, what aspect is that? What's your question with that? I, I, I kind of don't understand. It's not, it's not really a direct at. question. It's not really a question so much as just trying to steer the conversation because we're, we're this conversation has been going on so much lately. I hear it everywhere. But you're steering the conversation to what angle? That's what I'm trying to understand. The angle of we're falling for the okie doke here. We're, What's the okie doke? We're fighting over the okie doke is being pit against the other poorest group in this country of talking about minimum wage jobs hmm. while we should be looking up. I see what you're saying. Okay. Right. So the pro, you know, you're right. So I don't have no disagreements there. I think for me, it's no, I think for me is I don't want to pay for non-citizens, right? Because they can't do the work that I do. Now you do have some coming over here and some do want to be content creators. You can do that anywhere. But if you come here to America, that monetization is way more money in the U.S. dollar than it would be in pesos or any type of token in country in Africa, what, what have you. However, you're absolutely right as far as they've taken our jobs. And I don't hear all Americans, American citizens, that's not really, that's not the argument that I'm hearing is the job. What I'm hearing is you're giving away all this goddamn money. And I got and I got potholes in, on my fucking street, and I own a home. See, that's that's where the that's where the complaints are. It's, it's that angle because okay, Americans that's... Americans don't want to pick oranges. You know, black people we already clean toilets. We should be advanced, but the argument is I got potholes. I got a shitty library. The public school system is a mess. Paying all these taxes, inflation is high, gas is high, groceries is high, but you giving these motherfuckers food stamps and you letting corporations cut my wages or keep my wages where it is and not increasing my wages with the increase of the economy. That's the that's the that's the pushback black Americans and all Americans are having. So really, this is more of a bias fight, not bias, um, bipartisan fight of all Americans, because black people are on the same page as white people when it comes to the illegals. It's just that when it comes to being replaced, just like Ashley said earlier, we are the first ones to be replaced because it's easier and quicker to replace us. But white people on that chopping board next. Go ahead, Brooklyn, and, then I want to move on. Oh yeah, everything you said is valid, but it, it, it's still the same point to where you know, like like what you said about roads and things of that nature and in New York, we hear a lot about, um, you know, public services and, and and public assistance and things of that nature. But it's it's the same talk where they weren't finding the money for these things for us before. And if the migrant problem went away, they would use that money for something else. So making them the villain is just a distraction. Well, we they are the villain. Well, they're not the villain personally, so I don't want to say that. But the policy that this administration um, is passing or allowing to happen, right, going against the Constitution, all this other stuff, and breaking the law, and the money that the federal government is issuing out, issuing out, and the money that on certain states like Illinois and New York that are issuing out, the fact is that no, 
you can't, you don't know for sure. And, and I am definitely pushing back because people who are complaining about their potholes, they have been complaining before we had this crisis, right? And they're complaining about it now. It's just that you told me before it was no money in the budget, but you just gave $200 million in 12 months to people who are non-citizens. So bitch, I want this pothole filled. I, there's no more excuses. So we, people who are homeowners, people who work, you know, um, they always had these complaints. It's just that our local and federal government was saying, well, um, there's no money or it's not enough. But now we're saying, now we realize you're liars. There is money. You're just allocating it to break the law. So now we got to vote you up out of here. Um, anything you want to well, say to that? Because I have to move on. Yeah, just real quick. And yeah, there's always going to be money to be found somewhere, but it's always going to be easy to brush it aside if it's not in your face. And there's a difference between a pothole and, you know, 50,000 people on the streets. So one thing has to be dealt with, but they don't want to deal with it. And they're always going to find a way to try to push off the issue. Yeah, my pothole is more important than the 50,000 illegals. Um, Nicholas, then Light, then Troy, and then I'm going to bring up the the new batch of new group. Um, Nicholas, go ahead. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Hello to the host and the calls. I just wanted to uh, address a couple of things I heard. First of all, to, to Queen, I wanted to respond and say uh, Somalis are not, they're not black. Uh, I know a lot of Somalis, you know, I interact with them. They're proud people with a strong identity. They identify as ethnically Somali and racially Caucasian. So they're, they're not they're not black. They identify as Caucasian. And um, to what Judge Joe Brown said about black Americans coming from, from Nigeria or whatever, that's just not true historically. Um, that's not my opinion. That's just a statement of fact. You can track the transatlantic slave trade database if you want to look at regions people are coming from. Over half the people came from uh, two regions, Senegambia, which is like Senegal, Guinea, Mali, Gambia, and um, Central Africa. So that's just not true. And um, from the genetic side of it, there's been probably a, a, a dozen, a dozen and a half studies done in the past two decades on black American genetics. Um, there was a study done, Tish called 2009 on Africans and black Americans. There was one done by the uh, University of Pe uh, Philadelphia. Um, our brother Rick Kittles out of DC has a, a DNA testing company where he tests Y DNA and MT DNA. I mean, to say that majority of our, our DNA comes from Nigeria or is tied to them just isn't true. There were some Nigerians in the United States, but um, by and large, you know, those those people wouldn't have been Nigerian. Most of those people went to the Caribbean and South America. So can I ask you a question, Dan? Hey, wanna make a bet? <sighs> I need everyone to stay on their mic and real queen. Honey, absolutely, you absolutely. I, I would love to make a bet. bet. How much you want to bet? However much you want to. I would love. That's a, that's a historical fact, not not my thing. You the one. Put the money out there. How much you want to bet? Whatever you want. Whatever you want to go okay, for. The, the bet is that the majority, the majority. Well, maybe not the majority. No, no. I say the more Black Americans came from Nigeria than any other location. How would you prove that? Brother? How, would you, how would you prove it? Uh, easy. You can do DNA uh, analysis, and they've got it. It's on record. They do these things. While we talk smack, people pay attention, and they analyze, and they're curious, and they want to find out what's what, so they have the information. Right. Now, so I don't say this off the top of my head. I was curious myself, and every data that I get into that is not done by anybody with a particular agenda. That's what they say. Now, I may be wrong, but I'm willing to bet that what I got as the information is the good 411. See, and the other thing is, right now, you've got a situation where what is soon to be the fourth largest, most populous nation in the world is Nigeria because it is an area that had an extremely dense population and it has for the last thousand years. So a lot of folk came out of there and there was that thing where the Dutch dealt with the uh, same subject with the well, right, so woman I can, king. I can, I can, I can respond to that. Yeah, uh, so anyway, I mean, it's, it's breath no, no, of I argument. It just, just dig up your stuff. We'll bring, we'll, we'll have, 
usually do this every week. So is there no, I, I got you. I got you. I just, I just, week? brother, I just put something in the jumbo trying from the history channel. It states clearly what I said. This is a historical fact. You can check every slave database, all the records. The and I'm talking about the United States specifically, not the Caribbean, not well, South not America, not, not oh, no one second, not Brazil. Oh, the majority, majority means 51% or more, more, more than half. More than and half where did they come from? Sen 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 Greater Senegal, Gambia, which would be like Senegal, Gambia, Guinea, Mali, Sierra Leone, and Central Africa, more than half to the United States. Second, when you brought up the DNA testing, uh, I would ask, what, what, do you, what DNA testing are you talking about specifically? There are several different sources, but what I said is the place that has the greatest number of American descendants is going to be Nigeria. That's not, now, that's not, that's true. not that's look, if you've got, okay, that's like this. I can this is the last the, round of that. Okay, I, it's other you, yeah, I know. If you take West, if you take white population, which country is going to have more representation than any other country? If you that's, talk about America. But if so you that, talk about everybody, you're going to, of course, have more people from Western Europe than you do from Great Britain. But when you talk about Great Britain, you're going to find that they have more representation in the current American population than any other country. What I'm saying is, is Nigeria is going to have more representation in this group of black Americans than any other current country of the 54 that exist in Africa now. That's you not true. Have, I can prove. All right, prove. can we can, can we can we prove it next Tuesday? It yeah. All right, so actually, thank you, Nicholas, next you, Nicholas cuz next Tuesday that will be the topic hey, um, next Tuesday, quick question, Nicholas. Please. No, wait, wait, I, we can't listen. Lou, you in Mexico, honey, and I hear the um the um i don't know they instruments over there honey in the background and you got to delay lou which is wait a lou wait then if i could just get 30 seconds close on that uh, 30 seconds close and i gotta bring and then i gotta go to t roy go ahead Nicholas. Thank 30 you. Seconds. I, I, when you say dna testing i'm assuming you mean like ancestry 23 and me if you were to take that to a geneticist on, I, no one second lou if you were to take that to a geneticist and i speak to them frequently that would be good for, you know, a hint, a guess, something that gets you kind of close to a degree. But what's actually taken seriously in academia is a genetic study. Like I said, on black Americans specifically, there's been over a dozen, probably about 15 to 20 that's been done in the past 20 years. None of them, none of them point in that direction. And like I said, even our brother out of D.C., Rick Kittle, says a genetic testing company where he tests uh, Y-DNA and MT-DNA, which is very accurate as far as telling you people that you could be tied to. That, that's not the case. We're not tied to people in Nigeria to a large degree. It's just not true. All right. Thank you, Nicholas. And that we're going to follow that up on next Tuesday's yeah. space. And I'm not um, referring to 23andMe either. I'm not right. referring to that. There okay, are various I, I, and sundries. Just to get your information together for next all right, week. All right. we'll yeah, take a next look week, at next it. week, next week. I need to go to Team right. Roy. Lou, you on uh, the Alamo Wi-Fi in Mexico, honey. Just think hey, you. Um, can I ask my uh, uh, no, just can I ask you a question? Real quick, Lou. quick question. Go ahead, I'm Lou. Here. Lou, go ahead, go ahead, because he All on right, a delay. So I was probably reading this book about uh, with Thomas Sowell. Uh, he was he he talked about uh, black, red, and white liberals, right? And Thomas Sowell, Bill Cosby, people like you, y'all remind me of my granddaddy or whatever. Y'all like real. What's the uh, question? Accountability. Right, so you was bringing up uh, earlier about uh, degenerate culture that we embrace, right? And he was basically breaking down how, you know, he's basically. I hell no, uh, yeah, uh, uh, what, uh, no, 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 no. We've been up here going on four hours. I got eight God, people damn. in queue. I got eight people in queue. Y'all seem like a Nigerian. That's crazy. I know. And how in the hell I got eight people in queue. And I got other people that had, I got to go to T-Roy. It's too many people. And he, he's giving a, I don't just ask the goddamn question. I don't, we don't need to know the background. That's all I'm like, listen, Lou, just hold it. Go have a, a margarita. And can you press mute, Judge? Because you stirring up grits. Go ahead, T-Roy. 
Damn, that's what you like a refugee. What's going on? Yes, honey, yeah. You down at the border with the rest of them, yeah. Make sure your Lucky paperwork... You, you all right? Listen, listen. Make sure your paperwork, paperwork is correct when you about to get on that plane, honey, or you driving, shit. Or you be crossing the Rio Grande with the rest of them. Go ahead, T-Roy. Hello? How's everybody doing? Uh, Dana, Judge Joe Brown. It's uh, Dana. What the hell Long A. Long A. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, hold on, T. Yeah. Roy. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't think he can hear you, Dana. Hey. Lou, you can't hear I Dana. Hey, can't Judge, hear. you heard Lou. me? Tell him you he can't, can't hear me. Dana. Tell him to drop down. Drop. Tell him. No, to drop I can't down. hear. No, I can't hear. Yeah, he can't hear me. I'll tea. I will tell him to have a damn margarita. Drop down. Um, go ahead, T. Roy. Uh, or black people being replaced by liberals. Uh, see, here's how I look at it. Um, you know, black people are kind of you know, late to this whole, you know, American, you know, patriot. We're kind of late to all of this. So, like, because, you know, back then, you know, 19th century and 20th century, we've always advocated for, like, immigrants to come in. And we were at the forefront of all of that. So, like, they, like, a lot of them backstabbed us up until this day. Uh, we finally getting on board on this, uh, on this like i'm not trying to say i'm a patriot or none of that but we finally get on board to these how these immigrants really act towards us um there was various instances that like that's happening around in our communities um people are dying you know people people are getting robbed there was a, this instant uh this instance that uh happened in uh occurred in nyc that these um newly dropped off hispanics were going door to door with knives and uh, robbing people. And if you didn't give them what they gave you, they would kill you right on the spot. So it's stuff like that. Um, I really want to post something in the Jumbotron real quick. Please don't. Um, I don't like to put <laughs> don't. stuff in the Jumbotron. Just, oh, okay, just, okay. Yeah, and we we about to go on four hours, honey. And my patience is like or a, a thin hair. So if you got a question, just, just <laughs> nah. answer the question. Just ask yeah. the question or make your statement. I, I definitely understand that. Um, well, I was just going to post um, this Black American sister. Um, yeah, she said her her brother got killed by an, a Liberian immigrant, you know, from uh, in front of a club. So it's stuff like that that's holding us back. It's not really about the jobs. I know that's like a talking point people love, love to bring up, but it's hardly ever about the jobs. Um, black America's been doing these jobs. Um, we've passed that. Um, so yeah, we're we're all we're definitely past the the whole job thing. Uh, and to speak on the uh, the whole Nigerian thing, um, the most of Nigerians that landed in Virginia was probably like eighty at best. Yeah, um, honestly, the Nigeria even. is not even a topic. That just it, it evolved to that, and we're going to table that to next week. With that, that's not even a topic. Nigerians are not that important for me to talk about right now. It's just so happened. Nicholas and the judge will be um, presenting their um, resources for next week, Twitter space regarding did we come from Nigeria or whatever. But mm -hmm. go ahead, finish up, and because I need to go to um, re-up, and then I'm going to bring some more people up, and we're going to close out. And that, uh, yeah, I might tune in for that as well. But, um, yeah, I'm going to just, like, See, where like even the white people even though right they even telling us they're like wake up you know even immigrants themselves are saying to wake up you know wake up black americans wake up because we we've been advocating for these people for the longest and it's leading to it's honestly leading to leading to our destruction but i'm gonna just go ahead and land there and yeah thank you for having me up Thank you. Appreciate you. Judge, are you still there? Because you I did tell you to mute. Just want to make sure the mute button is working. It's working. Okay. So um, it's eight people in queue. I see BG, Wise, Davida, Righteous, Corn, Shabak, I don't know, T May, Justin. If any of y'all are trolls, honey, just drop down. I don't have time, but this is going to be the last eight. And um, people who are already up here on the panel, if you already spoke, just drop down. Lou, you can stay up because you're in an, another <laughs> another country. We need to make sure you be able to come back to the United States. But I right, go ahead, re up then LaShawn and Friedman, and then I'm gonna bring some more people up. Go ahead. All right, appreciate it. 
What's up, Danny and Judge? Look, yeah, black people are being replaced, right? Through Cities for Action, right? Office of New Americas by way of HR 72 that's advocating for um, illegal immigrants and immigrants, period, to have a, a um, seat at the table in the executive branch, right? Um, of the government. Right. Most of these cities are Democrat led cities, which um, most black people, black Americans. Right. We're talking about descendants of American chattel slavery. I don't consider the rest of them black, maybe racially, but not ethnicity wise. Damn sure not culture. Right. But we are being replaced by them. Right. Through that policy, over one hundred and thirty five billion dollars are allocated to just illegal immigration, just illegal immigrants. Right. You had almost a little over three hundred thousand come in in the month of December, 11 million, I think, last year. Right. Those people are coming into black America. In cities displacing black americans right and those are democrat led uh, packs and in and, and organizations and 501c3s that is specifically for them but then they can attach on to our bills as minorities and our people of color and black and brown we know mexicans and hispanics have their own caste systems their own anti-blackness in their cultures right and they just want to attach themselves to us to, to benefit off it because of the the minority trope or the the the, the oppression Olympics they like to do, um, and we are even being replaced by with our HBCUs and have African takeover days, right? Our cosplaying in the government as though they can speak for Black Americans, uh, like the the man running in in, in uh, Illinois or Michigan. Right. What do we need a black history month for? There's no white history month. Right. Cooning and shit for them, which which we have those in our own communities. Right. Uh, by way of the talent and intent or D9. Right. Uh, that's really at the top. But, you know, they have meetings by having meetings by having galas. Right. And it's no real representation. Right. And those are the ones usually running for public office, mayors, um, 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 uh, county executives. Right. Um, majority of the time doing a bidding for who, whoever their donors are, right? Um, but yeah, we are being placed. And culturally, what I will say about culturally, uh, um, we were socially engineered to be this way, right? And drugs being funneled into our communities by way of immigrants, right? The Nigerian president in Chicago and, and the Jamaicans and, and Haitians in Florida and even out west and all that, Mexican games, all that. We were socially you can punch your hand down, man, but I can give you facts on all this. These people that were funding on heroin and, and crack and cocaine in our communities, yes, yeah, by way of the government, United States government, right? But um, these people don't have the same interests as us, right? It, they they just don't. They delineate. They have their own anti-black slurs they use for us, Jeria, Akata, Bantu, all this. Uh, we don't have those. What, what's the worst we can call them? A booty scratcher, right? But this is what the government wants us to replace. I mean, even by way of the music industry, because they don't have a, a real understanding of what culture is, right? Or what we've been through historically, right? A lot of them get pushed that trope that you, you just talk about, the ratchetness, and it's really them doing it. Like Nicki Minaj, she's Trinidadian. Like, y'all can keep it a buck. Oh, she's black. No, she says she's Trinidadian. She delineated her say, herself, so that's what she is, right? Um, what's the other one? Cardi B. That's an Afro-Latina, right? But they, these, these, and I'm not going to say it's not within our culture, but overwhelmingly, and no, it's not. That's not what we were, right? But we were being replaced in real time because as black Americans, we want to be so ingratiating. Oh, oh, they got, they got, they melanated, they black. But in the meantime, they coming out their mouth telling you exactly who they are. Oh no, I'm 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 Canadian. I'm African, right? And that's okay. Be proud of being that. I just want my black community to start delineating, knowing the truth. Your culture is fine for you to have your culture. Be proud, stand on it, right? I don't eat Jollof fufu, um, a goose soup, and whatever else. Well, Jollof, right? it might be, so but that's not that's not me. I'm on some oxtail, <laughs> you know, on oh God. But they got oxtails and too. Yeah. Them loose seasonings they be <laughs> But yeah, that that's what I'm saying. Lovely. That's Especially for them. The that's their culture, and I want them to keep it and be proud of it and stand on it because I'm gonna stand on mine, right? But I also want 
my community get more codified, right? Know, know, know your culture. Know, know what we are about, right? Don't, don't let this, this same nonsense be going on. But, but through Office of New Americas and Cities for Action, just to look it up, uh, it's on my page. I put it in the chat, right? You have over 200 mayors and county executives ushering this in, taking, taking, that, taking that money that's being allocated, right? To make these cities sanctuary cities like what's going on in Chicago. So they can bust these people in, right? But they're closing, and it's going to disproportionately affect us, right? Through housing, where uh, resources are allocated. These people are going to start running for seats like in Santa Ana, California, where they want illegals to vote now. These pathway to citizenships where, oh, go ahead and join the police force as an illegal, right? And, and, and you, the pathway to citizenship. I mean, so it, it, yeah, it's things we talk about, but we are being replaced, and it, it's it's not as, as as slow as you think, Queen. Right? This this is this plan is going to be metastasized, right? Is if I think if the Democrats get in office, so that's just me. That's just me. I appreciate that, um, Judge. How much time do you have? Well, I've been working on this for almost 77 years. I suppose I got a little wild off. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about the immediate time right now. but Well, um, there ain't no immediate time. I ain't going to stop being black in the next few anyway. So okay. as long as I'm black and maybe this is working it out, then uh, let's do it. Okay. This is what we have to do. You can't right. be tired if you want revolution. All right, because right, I don't want I don't want to rush people, but it's like I want everybody to be heard. Um, so I'm gonna go to Latasha Friedman, Devonte Righteous, BG. Then I'll bring some more people up. So go ahead, La Lashanta. So Dana, so Dana, you don't see Cadillac up here? Hey, yeah. Um, wait, when did I put you? When did I bring you up? I forgot to write you on my list. When did I bring you up? After everybody else. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I know I like. I have, I did, I have you down, but I, I gotta write you down. So yeah, I write you after BG. Uh, no, actually, you're after righteous, then BG. Um, so go ahead, Latasha. Lashanta. Wait, no, yeah, Lashanta. What? Who? Are oh no, no, no. I'm looking at the other law. Yes, Lashanta. Sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, I try to see your head, not your heart. But I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. I currently live in Horn Lake, Mississippi. Uh, one of the reasons why I moved away from Memphis, Tennessee is because the Africans from Senegal, they're taking over. They're taking over White Haven. They're moving into Westwood. Um, I didn't get rid of my land, <clears throat> but I just, the element is horrible. Um, they're opening their own restaurants, their own stores. They're absolutely rude, disrespectful. So if you can't respect me, you can't respect my dollar. And that goes for anybody of any race. Um, Office of New America, as Rhea uh, mentioned, they're out. If you don't see your state and city there, look up Office uh, for re re Refugee Resettlement. So look that up also because that's where I found the state of Mississippi. It was well hidden. Um, I've kind of ambushed our mayor here in, Ho in Horn Lake, Mr. Latimer, and I asked him about Horn Lake because there are a couple of cities in Mississippi that's on the list. And he emphatically said, hell no. So I went to West Memphis, Arkansas, talked to Marco McClendon, great guy. And I'm like, hey, we need you to stay where you are as a black man. Don't, you know, fall for the okie doke. He said he's going to look into it. But right now he has no interest in um, giving any refugees dollars. So I'm like, OK. And the Memphis mayor is running from me, but I'm going to catch him one day, whether it's at the office or at the grocery store. It doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> but there is untapped people that we're not reaching. And I've mentioned this in other spaces. And I go out middle of the night and speak to gang members and I find out who has felonies, who doesn't. And I get them to register to vote. I teach them policy. I'm telling them, hey, we're going to Chicago in August. Let's go, like get your money together, save your money up. Let's go to Chicago. Let's turn Illinois red. Let's get this done. So a lot of things that we need to do in my generation, because I'll be 52, is teach our younger people. Don't gatekeep. Share the knowledge that we took half of our lives running from and we finally fell into it. Let's teach those young men and women because they need to know. And once they learn, you'll be surprised at how they respond and my relatives are like, are you crazy? You're out. 
you know, in New Chicago, you're out here, you know, in Chelsea, four or five, six o'clock in the morning. But they're more respectful. I feel more safe with them than anything. So we need to reach out to them, teach them that, and not just teach them to, to teach people to vote in November. We have our two year elections. In Memphis, it's been for sitting on the city council since I was a kid. Those people, they don't do anything for our community. Vote them out. The black women that they have there, they have like the mammy type attitude and the rolling of the neck and want to do whatever they're told for a pat on the head. Empty those seats. Get people in there that's for your policy. So that's why I'm going out and teaching people and I'm spreading this to the room. Teach people in your area the policy. You'll be surprised at who will actually respond to you. And uh, just let them know it's not just an every four year thing. It's also every two year. And if they're not listening to you and doing for your community, these city councilmen, and aldermen and mayors, then vote their tails out and get people in those seats that are going to do for you. So that's all I want to say. Don't forget the Office of uh, Refugee Resettlement. Look that up as well. And everybody have a great evening. Thank you, Dana. And thank you, Jess Joe Brown. Thank you. I, usually people who who are actually like have organizations or they hold office or doing stuff, they come in and out, in and out with the facts. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. <laughs> well, let me make an observation. I appreciate that just that you do what you do. But the reality is, is damn few of our elected representatives and members have the nerve to go out and meet the people in the streets. They're scared of them. And that's what the problem. And what the people in the streets tell me is we've got nobody in charge. And if you're sitting at a desk trying to be an administrator for some bureaucracy, they may not put it with those words. You ain't shit. In other words, you can't get out of here and lead us because we won't follow you. So how in the devil are you going to straighten the city out? You need people who are in charge who can deal with the ordinary people out there. And coming up with a study, coming up with another program misses the point because that's just an opportunity for these crooks in Memphis to steal it. And they're not doing anything about dealing with the needs of the people like you are, my good sister. That is great. I love to hear that. And see, you are a woman and you can get out there and do it, but somebody needs to be fronting for you. So you don't have to do it. You can get them when they get brought to you and people can talk some sense. But you see these cowards we have running stuff, they're scared to do it. The chief of police doesn't know what the hell she's doing. The average cop is saying, you can't get me out there to risk my life for this bullshit. I'm not going to do it. And then nobody's trying to give them a cause to get fired up about to go out and do what they need to do. So thank you for going out and doing that. Thank you for your service. That is a very important thing. Now, yeah, that thank, speech. You, thank you as well, Judge Joe Brown. Um, we in Memphis love you. I was hoping you would get voted in. I sent you a DM because I do want to connect with you on some things. I want to pick your brain, if you don't mind, on some other things. Um, but yeah, we're, we're trying to get some, a committee together. One young man was a former GD. He's 20 years old. And uh, he's accompanying me as well. So we, we're really working at it. And my sons as well, they're 21 and 23. So we're um, trying to really get this done. But just check your DMs. And um, like I said, everybody have a great night. I have to go to a yeah, summer. Um, let, me I, listen, let me I'm, ask you to do something. Let me ask you to do something. I got a whole bunch of DMs. Yeah, I was going to DM her. Can you get with Miss Dana and get yes. with her? And she'll make the hookup. All right? Yeah, and then because I want to... So I do want to invite her on to the show as well. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll see you a DM right now. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. Um, all right. Freeman, then Davida, Righteous, Cadillac, and BG. Then I'm going to bring up new speakers. Go ahead, Freeman. Good evening once again, family. Um, intriguing conversation. This is intriguing because you've had elder energy on here. You've had youthful energy on here. Um, you've had some ignorant energy on here. Um, but you know, it, it all comes with the territory and I appreciate the way you hold your room and, and, and you hold court, um, no pun intended there for judge. Um, just, I, I, I want to hear people talking more politically purpose driven and the sister, the Jets was on, that was beautiful. Um, and I really don't have anything negative to say 
to what she said, except I caught something and, and I don't want to challenge her on it because I think she actually is dropping down. She said she might've had to get out of here, but if she's still here, I did want to ask her, she said she wanted to take some folks to Chicago and paint Chicago red. Um, and, and does that mean that she is a certified GOP? Is she a conservative uh, voter? Um, and are we are we still on that time of voting party or are we voting purpose? Because that's where I think we've, we've kind of got hoodwinked over the last about almost 60 years here as we've been voting party and not voting purpose. And if we just jump to the red side from jumping to the blue side, aren't we still politicking for the party or are we politicking for the for the purpose because if we're being replaced we're being replaced by the republican party just as much as we're being replaced by the democratic party they they used uh illegals or even immigrants with paper against us just the same so are we are we riding that wave of trying to flip out the Democrats only to jump in bed with the Republicans, you know, and I haven't really heard a lot of people talk about Cornell West recently. Um, is, is anybody giving Cornell West consideration um, at this point? You know, I know he, I know he's all lives matter and a lot of his shit, but for the most part, I still think that he's down for us as American blacks before he's down for anybody else. Um, but yeah, I just want to know if we're going to be out here politicking for parties or purpose. That's my big thing. Right. And I've loved, I've loved a lot of people, what they've said out here. It just seems like sometimes we, I catch things. I just, I caught the red and then that, that, you know, I'm not saying you MAGA, I'm not saying you, you, you know, doing all that. I'm just saying, are, are we sticking with parties or are we, are we going to, are we going to, I guess purpose? what you're saying is if we, if you're going to go red, go with the purpose. It's, it's about policy. So no, but I agree. It's always about policies. But it seems like even with the Democrats, for sure, even if you come with them with policies and agenda, they just want to ignore black people. And then, too, and judge, you know, you can um, contest to this, um, speak to this as well. A lot of times it's not even about the other side being better. It's just to show the people that's been comfortable. Oh, you could be replaced. But you're absolutely right. If you go red, and I do suggest go red, but you go red with a purpose and a purpose is policy specifically for our group. But go ahead, Judge. Okay. I had a major of political science at UCLA, so I'll speak from that. There is a practice that is not universal in the country with everybody except black people as an ethnic group. And that is periodically you just hold your nose if you have to and you vote for the other party to punish the one in place or if not to punish the one that's accustomed to getting you, to show them that they didn't pay enough attention. See, we're in a bad situation. If you always vote for a party, no matter what they do not do for you, and you always vote against another party, no matter what they may try to do for you, then neither party has an incentive to give you a damn thing because neither gets anything by paying attention to you. They just get your vote and give the effect of your vote away to people that they think are more valuable. And that's where we are. So right now, when you say paint the town red, that means just we've had enough disgust and it has dawned on us that they did a few things that merited some support at one point 50 some years ago. But in the meantime, we have had bad Republicans and we've had bad Democrats, but right now the Democrats are acting very much like they're trying to use us for no good purpose. And they're trying to put this cult on us that's against manhood, womanhood, childhood, the traditional family, and they're trying to emasculate the country and put something sick that is a nihilistic, self-hating thing in place. And we don't like that because we have enough problems as it is without making it worse. So with that said, yeah, vote red to punish blue. Um, now. all right. Um, uh, Davida, then Righteous, then Cadillac, then BG. Go ahead, Davida. 
Thank you, Ms. Dana. Um, and how you doing tonight, Dana and Judge Joe Brown? Thank you for having this space. This has been an awesome conversation. Um, I just wanted to add too about, you know, I'm in Atlanta and it's one of the sanctuary um, cities. Um, and I volunteer a lot with different organizations. One of my friends have, you know, one called We Thrive in Riverside in Cobb County. Um, and since the pandemic, and I'll, I call it the pandemic, since the pandemic, we've been fighting and going to like Cobb County um, uh, commissioners meetings every Tuesday. We um, fought for people because people lost their jobs for like 18 months, some people. Um, and we were fighting for mortgage and rental assistance for, you know, different people. I was invited last year through my friend's organization to go to the housing summit. This was last February 22nd of 23. And in that housing summit, we were invited to the state capitol, you know, down in Atlanta. And then after the state capitol, um, talking to all those politicians, we were invited to um, city halls for a luncheon, right? So these politicians, um, Democrat and Republicans, both, they sat there and they lied to us about this housing crisis we've been having for the last three or four years here in Atlanta and surrounding areas. So my problem with this whole thing is I see veterans that are homeless, that are living on the streets in wheelchairs right across from the courthouse where they evict people at. And they got money our tax money to put up illegals and please stop calling these people migrants because they're not migrant workers, right? Migrants come and they do farm work and then they go back home. They're not migrants. They're illegals. And it's against the law to come here illegally. We actually have a whole um, system for, um, so what they want to just throw away the, um, the whole immigration system. I'm not understanding, and 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 I, I I'm one of them people that always fight for my people, right? And just to see that they putting all these people on top of the people that's already been hurting for housing here in Atlanta. So yeah, that's all I wanted to add to the um conversation. And I want to thank y'all because this has been a very enlightening conversation. Thank you. I appreciate you coming up. Um, well, yeah, you, you're right on point, ma'am. And may I make a suggestion since you've been there? Uh, drop in and pay attention to Cobb County courts. I'd say in all of America, the courts in Cobb County are probably the most racist and corrupt in the country. Yes, sir. And you really need to look into what's going on there. And it's staunchly democratic in terms of the occupants of those offices in Cobb County. Now, Here's something that I said before. Um, we have to get into having a long range plan. And sometimes that plan requires that we get real harsh about it. You're talking about the veterans, but you have a gentleman who operates Martin Luther King's home church. You familiar with who I'm talking about? Yes, sir. I know exactly who you're talking and about. Right across the street from that magnificent religious edifice is a rundown hellhole with a lot of people out there in the cold, nowhere to go, in suffering, and that son of a bitch will not take his tired, preach a collar wearing ass down there and pay attention to him. And he's now sitting up in the halls of Congress. Yes, sir. That's Warnock. And I know Warnock. exactly. Yes, that's what you're talking about. These people's genealogy, if you don't know who these people are, then this is the reason why we have these problems. They're a part of the problem. I'm trying to figure out why people coming off their goddamn mic. So, well, okay. Can everybody please stay on their mic, honey? It's a lot of speakers, and I, I want the flow to not be interrupted. 
it's not church, so they don't do the amen thing and aggravate Miss Dana now. But Siri, it's not about aggravating me. I just Warnock, you don't need the peanut gallery. Go ahead. Warnock is ridiculous, but the black folk in Atlanta seem to have put him in. So why did we do that to ourselves? I mean, you walk in front of his church, and that's a disgrace. That looks like third world right across the street on the other side of that fence. So what in the hell is wrong with us? All right, I'm going to go on to the next speaker. Righteous, then Cadillac, then BG, um, then Judge Sarah. Then I got to bring up a couple more speakers, and then we'll close out. Go ahead, Righteous. Thanks for allowing me to speak. Are Black people being replaced by illegals, Black people, Chicago? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, hey, Dana. Hey, um, Judge Joe Brown and everybody else that spoke and in the audience. I'm going to try to touch on this real quick because I feel your vibration, uh, Dana. Okay, so... Uh, Judge, you were you were making a comment in regards to how we, we, we've got to be aware of who we're electing and how they could, um, you know, basically, you know, go chameleon on us and then just, just screw us over in the end. When when we bet them to the best of our ability and we, everybody's OK, they're good. As soon as they mess up, we can let them go. It doesn't have to be a tenure of 10 years, two or three terms. Once they make that mistake, they get the boot. Um, in regards to, um, I, I don't know, Judge. Sometimes when when you when you when you talk to us, your your terms are, for lack of a better um, term, they're kind of like antiquated pimps in the holes. Um, you know, the, I don't I don't really vibrate with that. And when when you, you were saying how you know how we're not being respected, I got to push back on that. Everybody wants to be us. Now, granted the sagging of the pants and all the rest of that, they came into play. But that was after the fact of like the Commodores, the OJs, uh, Switch, DeBarge. We had classy type of um, uh, an attitude. You know what I'm saying? That's what made us stand out. When they started letting people in, and you admitted to this, you said they was coming from every corner of the world, right? Well, when they came in, we weren't stuck on that. That's not us shit. So they impersonated us. So all of this, this debauchery and shit like, excuse me, I'm sorry, Dana, all of this debauchery and stuff that came into play, that wasn't us. So we don't want to wear that jacket. But I do understand what you're saying. Um, I'm going to bring it home. OK, so when people I live in California and when I hear we don't want to do those jobs, I could just slap a, I could just really just, you know, go off because peep this family. Everything that we did for free, they invented a machine to do. Then when that shit wasn't working, they decided, okay, we'll let other people do it. Thus the, the illegals that's coming in here now. Also, the term infrastructure, that really pisses me off because everything that we did for free 50 years ago, that shit was, sorry, that was solid. The only thing that's crumbling now is everything that we built. You let somebody else build some shit, something and you may have a longevity of two to three years. Everything that was done for free off our backs from this soil was popping, solid. So now the infrastructure, which is us not doing this shit anymore, 50 years, 60 years, yeah, shit will start breaking down. Um, and then, okay, I'm trying to get to everything that you guys did. Okay, so representation without taxation. I'm with you, Dana. Look. <sighs> How can anybody, whether you're racist, stupid, a moron or whatever, can can put their lips around saying it's OK for for them to let illegals in? I don't care if you're living in um, Iowa or North Dakota or whatever. It's wrong for people to get something that you didn't pay taxes for. That's just like me going into a store saying I'm going to buy this soda pop or whatever. I'm from Chicago, too, um, and saying I'm not going to pay the tax. Sorry. But, but you're going to give it to me. That's what they're doing. We're paying taxes. We don't even make it to Social Security um, ages to even benefit from this shit. And then lastly, um, I think it was uh, basically it. So um, peace out. Thank you, family. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Cadillac is next. Hey, Dan, can y'all hear me? 
<laughs> can I ask her a question yeah. before she goes? Go, okay. go ahead. Old Hold time, up, pal. Old time words, pimps and hoes. What would you call them? Well, we don't have the luxury of having those titles. Um, I don't know too many. I'm, I'm Black American on both sides, and I don't really know any pimps. I don't know any hoes. I can go down to um, Figueroa and see the, the, you know, you know what I'm saying. But I, I, I don't know of any pimps and hoes. Um, but I know what you're saying by that. But that's Big not Trump a pimp. We don't, we don't Big Trump is a pimp. Hold on. You a give second. me a minute. I'll... Yeah. He's, yeah. Yeah, I, that's what I'm talking about. No, let about. me it, say this. It, 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 hold it, on. If another person get all come off their motherfucking mic, I'm dropping you. Don't come up here with that. Okay. I'm just all right. Here, look, don't get enthused. Just chill a little bit. I was last in L.A. about a month ago. I grew up in L.A. I get back and forth out there on business. I do barbecue. In fact, you can go buy uh, D's Original Takeout Grill on 79th and Western and get some of it if you want to try it. I saw all kinds of hoes walking the streets. If you know what to look for, they're pimps too. We hear from a lot of pimps. They ideate on pimps. They talking about pimp your ride, man. It's pimping, man. All about pimping. How many hoes and bitches you got working for you, man? You know, and I hear that all the time on the streets. I get out and talk to what a lot of folk would be afraid to talk to, except the one sister just called in a little while ago, says she goes out and talks to them, the street people, the thugs and the gangsters, the OGs and the wannabes. So, yeah, pimping and hoeing is alive and well. You ever watch P Valley on TV, Pussy Valley? I used yeah, to have I love clients. that show. I hate it. I detest it and despise it. I used to make a lot of money representing pimps and hoes that actually were working out of down there. Also the strippers. And it's a disgusting thing. It ain't nothing nice about it. And the fact that they have glorified it shows what I was talking about when I said the rest of the world doesn't respect us because we glorify that now. 50 years ago, that would have been a disgrace. Now is you got a television show about it. So, and they, they ramp it up, take ratchet behavior and they make it okay. That's what the problem is. It does exist. And see, if you a pimp, if you a hoe, that term pimp has been around for, in English, I think it's about 1200 years old. And hoe, whore, prostitute, that's been around depending upon your translation, for about as long. So they're ancient terms, and we still have them. So what do we do about eliminating that cultural disgrace where instead of saying they exist, but we got to move around it, and maybe we can't stomp it out because it represents basically the second oldest profession after whatever the profession was that earn the money to pay for them but no, no I, see, I agree what Judge. are we going to do with that no, no I agree it was it was just in the in the reference that you 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 were um I was going to get into that Diana can you, I go it was I'm sorry it was just how you 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 know the con the context of what you were saying no I completely understand but it's it's just sort of like these jackets that we are continually um being put on us we can all say that's really not us. Now, maybe in the beginning, but like with everything, they take over our shit. So, you know, maybe in the beginning, yeah, that was us, you know, our stacked shoes and our leather, you know, our pimp cane and huggy bear and shit like that. But over the progression of years, that's not us. But I understand what you're saying, sir. So, but I'm going to go back down. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I, I get what you're saying, too, but I'm just trying to enlighten the people that are listening to get the word out there. See, we see, I studied propaganda at UCLA for about a year. The person that I was teaching assistant for had was a visiting Soviet professor emeritus from the University of Moscow. This person actually had run the propaganda department for the KGB and before that, the NKVD. So I got taught in propaganda by one of the masters of the game. And one of the things is that when you look at propaganda, what it's been doing, how they did it, and what the purposes are, you can see it because we have now started to think in terms 
that the propagandists have been trying to get us to use. And that is the bad problem when you start thinking in terms of the propaganda. Now, I'll pass it. We can talk about that All in right. another section. Yes, half an next week. I want to let us highlight. Hey, that's what I was going to speak on. Uh, when the judge asks, what do you do to uh, the pimps, the hoes, this and that, this and that, them people there in the communities where they at, they got a certain amount of influence. You know what I mean? The rappers, they got a certain amount of influence. They, they, um, you know, even the, um, the niggas who just got out of jail, you know, who went to jail, got long prison sentences, a lot of them dudes are glorified in the neighborhoods, you know what I mean? Because they was, was kind of standing on some business, even though it was some illegal shit, you know what I'm saying? A lot of them people come out of jail reform type shit. So, I mean, <clears throat> we just had a mayor, we just had, a, not a mayor, we just had a sheriff race here in my city, uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. And uh, the, the, the uh, black guy who's uh, white horn, he was a police chief, he was also a head of the uh, U.S. Marshals, stuff like that uh he he lost the election by one vote and this is a majority black city you get what i'm saying and one of the main influences here in this city like the day before he went out he young he probably like 29 30 maybe he went out and he you know tried to campaign for him a little bit this and that right so um after he lost the election you know everybody been talking about you know he need to campaign early for him you know what i'm saying you know the brother who um Got the influence. He a rapper, you know. He um do all type. He got a podcast. He do all type of stuff around the city. Got food truck stuff like that. He pretty much a hustler. He a DJ, all type of shit. You know what I'm saying? So with all his influence that he got, you know, I had had a conversation with him after he had did his live endorsing, or uh, pretty much, you know, telling everybody to get out the vote for him. I was like, bro, you telling these people to get out the vote for this man, but what have this man said he gonna do for the black community, even though he's black? See, that's the problem we got. We vote for people just because they black and they Democrats. You know what I'm saying? We don't ask them about their agenda. We don't ask them, you know, what I'm going to receive, you know, for my vote. You know, what you're going to do. You know, I advocate that they pay, you know, because the sheriff's office got a $70 million a year budget. I mean, what you buying? Guns, bullets, police cars. Uh, what else you buying? Like with $70 million a year. So I advocate that they go out here and get with some of these guys who can influence the community that's from the community. Like they say, cops or community already oriented policing, right? You will be policing directly from within the community, you know what I'm saying? Giving these people the tools and the and the and the money that they need to go out and reach out to the youngsters who are out here wilding out. You get what I'm saying? Because a lot of these youngsters will listen to these older guys or even these younger rappers and stuff like that, these influencers. So, you know, when they told me, you know, that's what when he asked me, you know, what he should, should so he tried to do a meeting with the with the guy who uh, his name Whitehorn, you know what I'm saying? He's just the black guy, you know, the black candidate who lost. Well, he actually won by one vote, but they got to do a re-election now, you know what I'm saying? Coming up in a couple months. But long story short, the man Whitehorn wouldn't even meet with him. He's been trying to get a meeting with him. You know, he's like, I'm not going to endorse him. I'm not going to do nothing for him unless he meet with us and I can give him these demands or see what he actually going to do for us. Because I'm not just out here finna do that and we can't get nothing in return. So... And I would ask you, Mayor, the same thing. You know, I mean, um, 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 Judge Joe Brown. You know, did you actually go out here and get with people like that who got influence in the community? Get them on your team, run ads, do campaign, you know, stuff like that when you was running for mayor. Because these people are very effective in the community, whether they on some bullshit or whether they on some. And I ain't gonna say the ones who on the bullshit go get with them. I'm saying the ones who actually reformed, actually out here trying to do the work, actually going to the meetings at the city hall, city council meetings, stuff like that. You know, and that's another thing that I see is that our people, we get up in these city hall meetings and we don't do, we be asking for, uh, oh man, it be raining outside when I be trying to catch the bus. Can y'all get us some stands so we don't have to stand in the rain? They ask for the dumbest shit. They don't, you got people out here dying. The you, you ain't advocating to give 50 cents towards preventing crime because the police and the sheriff, they don't respond to the crime. So if they, if you got these guys out here that's actively working, who you paying them, these influences in the city, wherever city you at, this shit could be implemented all nationwide. If you got these um, guys who you're actually out here in the community that's actually, you know, you're giving resources to actually go out and make this their job. You know, if you if you don't do your job, then, hey, you get fired. And we get somebody else in there who could actually go out. You know, this is the stuff we got to do, new stuff. You know, 2024 stuff. The stuff we, we've been voting since 1965. That is not working. We in the same condition 
in the, from where they was at 1965, the first thing we do gonna do is run out and march. Them people don't want to hear that. They ain't paying attention to that. They just want you to get out their streets and stop their comers. You know what I mean? So um, I had a, also had a conversation with my mother last night. She a Democrat. I asked her what she who she gonna vote for. Was she gonna vote for Whitehorn? She told me. I told her, well, you know what Whitehorn gonna do for the people. Well, I don't need nothing from him. I, I said, the people. What he gonna do for the people? They ain't even thought to think that far to ask or even question what this man is gonna do for black people. Just because he's black, just because he's Democrat, we gonna vote for him. You know what I'm saying? And that has led us to now, which we don't get no resources. They don't do nothing for us. You go to these city council meetings, they'll take your number down. They'll tell you, I'm gonna give you a call, but you won't hear nothing from them. And they'll look at you like you stupid, like you up there condemning them. No, we need some resources for the community. Y'all trying to stop crime. Y'all trying to stop killings and murders and stuff like that. What what? You ain't going to do that by actually just giving the police millions of more dollars and let them respond a little quicker, two, three minutes. The crime to be committed. Like, so we just sitting around doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Let's call it Senate. I'm about to land. I need one more second. Oh, don't land. Don't land yet. I got a question or two to ask you. Suge Knight. Suge Knight just came out. This goes to the topic of the room. Suge Knight, he got a podcast. You know, he locked up or whatever. Got 28 years, whatever. You know, he came out um, on the pound. His latest episode of his podcast he got, and he was talking about how the black actors in Hollywood are actually being, uh, they're actually going to Europe. They're actually going to Russia and all these, I ain't going to say Russia, but Africa. And we've been replaced in Hollywood in the music industry. they making all uh, the black actors, um, teach them the swag, teach them the lingo, teach them how to act teach them how to walk and talk like a black American and get ahead and do these films. So they're actively replacing us even in the movies. That's why Taraji, that's another reason why she came out and she was saying what she was saying, you know, because they got other people that they can replace you with. They ain't got to pay you no extra money. These people do it for pennies on the dollar. You know what I mean? Um, One more thing and I'm going to be quiet. Um, well, that's pretty much it what I had. Go ahead, Judge. Go ahead. You're from Shreveport? Yes, sir. I was born one in Dallas, my, but I've been in Shreveport since three years old. One of my grandfathers is from Shreveport. Okay, fine. Little connection. Um, what Suge Knight's talking about, point is, why are we even concerned with what these people do to distract us? See, when you're spending most of your adult life on fantasy, make believe, and distraction, you ain't got shit you can tell me. What are you doing in the real world? Have you ever had a real job? If you haven't gotten a real job in your life past 15 or 16 years old, you don't have shit to tell me. Now, yeah, you got to know the streets. You got to make a contact with the people out there. And if you're supposed to be doing something, you're supposed to be able to walk everywhere in all of your neighborhoods. That means if you live in the city, you're supposed to be able to go anywhere in the city and get respect. Problem is, is too many of the people we have elected can't walk out in the streets. Because, frankly, they wouldn't be recognized. Frankly, they'd get their asses whipped or robbed or something like that. And that's what the point is about. You're going to be the leader. You know, you walk through the valley in the shadow of death. You feel fear no evil because you're the baddest son of a bitch in the damn valley. That's what you got to be. That means you're the chieftain. And we lack that. Now. I understand what your situation is about the one vote and everything. You're going to have a runoff on that because there wasn't a great enough discrepancy. Okay. Good luck to somebody, but I think you're telling your mother right. And that's the way it goes. But your mother's probably younger than I am. And I can recall from 50 some years ago, 55 years ago, we were trying to spread the word, but nobody would listen. And the people that did listen got fouled up because there were some sleazy pimps, hustlers, con men, punks, 
and all kinds of other stuff that sold us out to these alphabet agencies. If they weren't already sworn officers of these alphabet <clears throat> agencies. So, I mean, keep up the work. Keep the faith in what you're trying to do. It'll be okay one day, but just be aware of the pitfalls. And it ain't something to be nice about because people die all the time. Less than used to die, but still too many. All right. Um, I want to go to BG. I think it's, isn't it me? No? No, it's not. Mm-hmm. You're after BG. Hello, Dana. Hello, uh, Honorable Judge uh, Joe Brown. This is BG um, coming out of Jackson, Mississippi. And um, can you hear me? I was just down yes. there a few, a couple of months ago. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, just to speak to the topic of the room, uh, are Black people being replaced by illegals? Um, I think there's an attempt to replace Black people, but what we got to really focus on is the people trying to facilitate it. Uh, you got a bunch of different organizations behind this, right? So even though we want to look at the immigrants and the migrants or whatever you want to call them, criminals, they have 501c3 organizations, nonprofits. You got churches, you got companies, you got businesses, you got politicians behind it. But we focused on them. They are not the problem. It's the people who are helping them do this, right? So even if we deport all of them when Trump gets back in, uh, what's gonna stop these people from just doing it all over again, like a like a big cycle, right? So the problem is it's a bunch of people, they're not immigrants, right? It's a bunch of black Americans, right? You know these people, you work with some of these people, right? Everybody here works at a job and most of you know a black person who's a backstabber or somebody who's a liar or a double crosser. But I think people need to really understand people will not hesitate to put their burden on you and abdicate their responsibilities to make their lives easier. They won't they won't think about it. They won't let think me, twice about it. Let me give us a solution. I everybody, people to come in. This is a solution. I was defense lawyer on quite a number of these cases who went to trial. I want every one of them, but there were some tough cases. I'll tell you one of them. A guy was walking down the street. He was in another town on business. And as he was walking by this bank, a robbery was going down, armed robbery, gunshots were fired. And the perpetrators ran right in front of him, within five feet of him, broad daylight four of them, and the FBI got his name as a witness. Well, they had a new clerk with the FBI, and she screwed up, and instead of issuing a subpoena for him as a witness, this dingbat, just performer, issued a warrant for his arrest as a suspect. Man hasn't done anything. He's the one that the Justice Department is dependent on to make the case against the four-armed robber. He's in Memphis. His wife of 30-plus years is charged with harboring a federal fugitive. We can't tell the jury that it was a mistake because at the time he was a fugitive. We can't even talk about what's going on relative to the relationship between the defendant and her husband of 31 years. The jury can't find out about it. But now if they can prosecute a man's wife for harboring a fugitive whose fugitive status was due to a bad mistake by the FBI, what the hell do you think's going on with every son of a bitch that's given one of these illegals one iota of help when it comes to being prosecuted under the same federal offenses that are the same statutes that are still in existence 40 some years later for harboring a federal fugitive? If you crash the border, you are a federal fugitive. If you give aid and comfort, if you conceal or you give assistance to 
then you harbored a federal fugitive. That is a felony. So every mayor, every congressman that helps out, every alderman, city councilman, everybody that's helping these illegals from the president on down is arguably guilty of the federal felony of harboring or giving aid and comfort to a federal fugitive. Every last one of them. And if they refuse to issue or prevented process from issuing when somebody is in that status, then that becomes part of an ongoing conspiracy, which is a more severe felony. Every one of them needs to be prosecuted. Maybe that would solve a few problems in the future by saying, hey, you got five years on a minimum sentence you can throw away, and that would be out of 60 months you'd get for it, that would be 56 to 58 months you'd be in federal custody. Let's go. All right. Um, I want to get to Judge Sarah, and then I need to drop everyone down and bring up some new people, and then we're going to close out. Go ahead, Judge Sarah. Okay, thank you, Dana, for letting me in. I came later. I appreciate you so much. Oh, good talking. It's good seeing you, Judge Brown. Okay, so I want to address the, sure. I want to address the um, question: Are black people being replaced? Replaced as what? As the lower caste? As the group who was unequal? Are we being replaced as the group who's never been equal under the Fourteenth Amendment? Edward Bloom is advocating for his group. While our legal professionals who are credentialed fail to use the law of the land, the Constitution, to advocate for Black Americans. These legal professionals, they are using our pain and neglect to earn money. Um, and, you know, it's this thing called benign, benign neglect. So the, the, the neglect is not benign. The neglect is malignant. Google the word. Um, replacement is less of a, a concern for me. What's happening is discrimination. We're being put at a further disadvantage, which amounts to a constitutional violation. <laughs> um, to prioritize non-citizens in a constitutional, to, to prioritize them over us is a constitutional violation. At some point, we need to address those issues um, intelligently with less emotion or jealousy, but holding the government accountable for the continued constitutional violation. Um, and I just want to speak briefly to the pimp or hold. Maybe I didn't get that. But by definition, being plump is pimping the pain of Black people. By definition, Kamala Harris is hoeing her perceived Blackness. So those are the pimp and holes today. Um, so Judge Brown, um, speaking to the lack of, um, again, what I'm saying to you is, and forgive me for being annoyed, because it's not that complicated. It's simple. And we talk about everything, but what needs to be said and what needs to be done. Again, while Edward Bloom is advocating for his people, as he should, doing his civil duty, what is happening with our legal professionals? What are they doing? How are they advocating for us? I mean, I don't think it's the other man. I think it's the man in the mirror. And when we finally re receive, understand that, it ain't the other man, it's you and I. If you're sitting here waiting for somebody to give you something, hand you something, you're going to be waiting. You have to be active, involved. Um, real quickly about um, Trump, I'm MAGA, and again, we're not taking opportunity. Donald Trump is going to be the president of the United States, and what we as Black people need to be doing is letting America know that we were very instrumental in re-electing Donald Trump. See, we don't have political power because we don't know how to gain political power. We're going to put him in office, just like we put the Antichrist Joe Biden in office. But we're not wielding our power because we ain't here too busy talking about things that aren't important. Anyway, um, Judge Brown, please speak to what I what I said about black uh, legal professionals not advocating for black people. What is happening is a constitutional violation. We're not equal in this country. We never have been. It's funny. The other man laughing at us because they're using the 14th Amendment, which was enacted for us against us. And we ain't even smart enough and intelligent enough to recognize what's happening. I'll land there. I appreciate you, Dana. And Judge Brown, feel free to answer. Speechless, brother? Imagine that. My answer, I'm not speechless. I was trying to get unmuted. 
My answer is, if you're worried about it, prepare yourself so it becomes very expensive to treat you that way. In other words, treat me like that if you dare. That's what we have to do. You have to be able to vest consequences if you want to get respect. Um, we don't teach children to stand up to bullies. We lead them to expect that somebody will stand up for them. And I think that spread to us as a people. We won't stand up like we ought to. And it defeats us. Now, standing up to a bully means you have to screw up enough nerve to bust him right in his mouth. He may wind up whipping you, but he's got bloody lips, loose teeth, or a sore jaw, or a black eye. And he'll think about it the next time. Japan didn't beat us, but they went from being considered little short, thick glass wearing buck tooth little midgets in our consideration to freaking us out uh, with kamikaze, bonsai charges, bushido, and now we eat sushi and we practice martial arts and karate. You see, and everybody's got either a Japanese car in their driveway, most likely, Japanese or Chinese products in the kitchens, most likely, or they're from Germany, and we had a bout with the Nazis. So you see, even though we won and they lost, they certainly generated respect. That's what we have to do. And the, the three words that Dana didn't want me to get into are very simple words. There were three of them. And that's what black people resorted to because you could get the means in any grocery store, pharmacy, gas station, hotel, motel, and most stores. Back then people smoked, so there were books of matches. And as H. Rap Brown used to say, we got Yeah, this. actually, don't say those three words because you're on YouTube. And I know, kinda... but I, it, I'm going to just clean it up. I'd rather time. him address my question Listen. about the liquor black professional. That's what I was now, talking here's about. What, See, yeah, I'm going to go to law school because I don't wait for people to do things for me. I go get yeah. it. And so since yeah. the, the current legal black professional refuse to advocate for black people, I'm going to take my old ass to school and go to law school and take care of mine. Because I'm, I'm, I'm a conservative. I don't wait for people to give, people to I, give I, me I got anything. You. I okay. Got you. But you see, here's the thing. There is a difference. 55 years ago, the militants, the radicals, were students. They really had to bust ass in order to get where they were. They had to have a drive that a lot of people lacked. They had to take risk, and they had those three words, and they had the same initial, B, B, B. In Montague the Magnificent, a DJ out in Los Angeles popularized the term, the initials of which were BBB. And during the 65 August uprising, they all said that is the slogan, and that spread around the country, and people did the BBB. And that's why we got the civil rights stuff, not because somebody demonstrated, but because the people did the BBB thing. Now, from that group of smart, vigorous, bad acting, prepped intellectual, wannabe revolutionary type, the student is degenerated into a boule little punk who runs around trying to audition for Atlanta Housewives. It is not cool. Right. We have people who sell out and are scared to go deal with their people in the streets. 
the student used to be off the streets. He was just one of the smart ones that had to drive to make it. Now they're little pampered lap dogs, poodles. And they want their bellies scratched. And that's what we have for our so-called leadership because they gravitate to the office. Look at Cory Booker. Look at Chicken Al Sharpton. Uh, look at the gentleman, the lawyer that you expressed disdain for. Is that I think leadership? we should look in the mirror, Dr. Judge Brown. I think we should look in the mirror instead of pointing. Well, I look in the mirror. It's what I think I, we should I, do. I think we should look in the mirror and say, well, what, am I motto. contributing? Am I doing I, the most that I can yeah, do? Yeah, I know, I, but I got a motto and I live to it and I'll back it up. Uh, yea, though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, I fear no evil because I'm the baddest son of a bitch in the goddamn valley or close to it. I've been around a long time, and one thing my old man and my grandfathers taught me, and to put it in modern terms, it would be learn the manly art of self-defense. That's the old-time way, but in modern terms, know how to get your John Wick on. And if you know and learn how to do that, take your martial arts, learn how to deal with modern weaponry, Ain't nobody going to mess with you. And you can spread that skill and that attitude and stuff changes. Instead of using this stuff to kill yourself off, use it to set up an aura of defense so that it becomes that matter that I just talked to, uh, to somebody a few minutes ago about even if you don't win, you become very costly to mess with. So they leave you alone and you can start spreading the word and you'll even get respect from your own people. I can walk anywhere in the city of Memphis. Ain't nobody gonna bother me. Now, all right. Um, that's what you on. gotta do. Um, I need to move on to Derek and the Cronian. Uh, Madison, I brought you up, but you dropped back down. I'll bring you up. Corn, same thing with you. So what I'm gonna do is Derek, the Cronian, Walter, and then I'll bring Madison and Corn up. You can put me down, Dana. You put me down. Thank okay. You, oh, <laughs> Justin, Dana. yeah. This is this is your second time up. Um, yeah. I may I may swing back to the repeaters. I don't know because it's it's getting kind of late. I know I I've been wanna... waiting on here for a few hours. Yeah, but you did speak, and I kind of want I, new speakers I didn't get to the, speak. I didn't get to speak. No. Yes, you did. I, what did I? I didn't speak. You didn't speak. Um, no. for three hours ago. No, I didn't. Remember, yeah. I was on. I, Give I him a chance service. to speak. Give him a chance to speak. Justin, I have you down. on my list, but oh no, no, no! He, I'm sorry. No, you didn't speak because I wait one second, Judge. Damn, you didn't <laughs> speak because I scratched you off because you must have dropped down. That's right. So, um, Derek, you couldn't get him back. Is what happened. Can you? Can you, you let me talk? Go ahead. I just cleared it up. No, you didn't. Derek, if I could go the after Derek, and that then be... Justin. Okay. So go ahead, Derek, and then the corn, then Justin. Sorry about that, Justin. Good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening, Judge Dana. Uh, so I just want to speak on that whole thing of uh, the pimps and, and holes things. I relate to that. I don't think it was any problem with you saying that, Judge. Uh, I come from the streets, and so uh, you know we can relate that to what we're going through with our own government. Is they're pimping us in a lot of ways, right? And uh, we're we're unknowingly hoes, <laughs> to, to, you know, to, to, excuse my French, but, you know, that's kind of how it's going. But I just want to cover a few points on the whole topic of uh, all legals, you know, uh, replacing us. And I, and I believe they are. Uh, I believe a lot of Americans, not even just blacks, but a lot of Americans are being uh, somebody used the word ethnocide on uh, social media before. And I like that word. I think they are committing ethnocide. And, and here's why. Um, the, the legals are taking over because we have become complacent as as, as black people. And uh, a lot of us are hardworking. A lot of us have paved our own way. Uh, some of us are still doing it, but uh, we, we've become complacent. Uh, and we have basically, some of us have basically started getting too dependent on the system. We're too dependent on these things. And we know what happens when you become a, a leech or you become too dependent on something. People get tired of you and they want to cut you off. 
They want to get, they want to pull you off. They want to pull you away from the, from the tit. It's, it's just like a mother, a female dog, when the, when the puppy's hanging on the tit too long, and she, she get them off. And that's what's happened. They, we've got too complacent. And uh, the deal is also a lot of black people here in this country, we know our worth. We know what we've been through. We know how we've been put down and misused and mistreated and devalued. And so we know our, our worth and they don't want to pay that worth. So what they do, is they're willing to go all the way across seas to get some people who will uh, accept it because they've been their living standards have been, uh, you know, very, uh, very low. You know, it's just not good. It's subpar. And so they're willing to come in and they're willing to take those jobs. They're willing to do all these things that, you know, some black people are not willing to do. And I don't even think it's always that we're not willing to do. I think it's just they just tired of us and they just want to replace us with people that they can save a dollar on. Uh, and I know because I have friends uh, from Mexico. I used to go to Mexico with them. And uh, I, I can speak a little Spanish. So they thought that I wasn't even black. They thought I was like Colombian or Cuban. And so they would talk about black people around me and they would say things like, you know, the black man is a snake. Black man is no good. He's lazy. The black man is, um, you know, relying on the system. Uh, you know, just all kind of things that I would hear them say. And, you know, I would kind of laugh because it was like, you know, wow, that's, that's, that's pretty bold, you know, for them to think. And what, what, what brought them to this, to this summation about us. Right. But then I started meeting a lot of immigrants from all around the world. And I, I even was in a situation where I help, was helping uh, a few of my, I call them my brothers, but they were trying to get naturalization here. And I was helping them, right? They had a black lady and she told me, she said, look, I want to show you this, but I don't want you to, you know, nobody really knows this and just kind of keep this low. She showed me a tape that they, this was back then in the nineties, they, when we had VHS, it was a VHS tape that was showing, uh, they were talking about the different races that were here in the country. And they were talking about blacks and they were and they were uh, basically letting the immigrants know what type of people we were. We, they were already. That's why they come over here with this air of, of, of uh, dissidence toward us, because they they already are being trained against us. They are already being uh, mentally kind of groomed to think a certain way about us. And I've seen this in so many ways. Right. And so the, the they, they, they they don't if somebody raises somebody up to think a certain way, they're going to think a certain way. And that's basically how I say, you know, so they come here. The, the America gives them all these benefits that that we've been cheated out of or that we haven't taken advantage of or maybe not even had the ability to. And uh, and it's just so sad. And so the Dems are using them not only just to wash a cultural washout, they're also using them to vote for them and keep them in power. They're also using them for cheap labor to in, in these uh, big conglomerate Fortune 500 companies are saving a, a, a buck. <laughs> so, yeah, of course, they're going to replace us. Right. And, and, and I'm mad at black people because we aren't doing our due diligence to do our homework, to to uh, push hard. Just like the judge said, you got to make them respect you. We have to make them. We did it in some era, maybe before us and based in the, in the civil rights era and some of the other eras. But we've got, we've gotten complacent along the way. And we've gotten too complacent on the benefits. And I just want to touch on one more thing, and I want to let you know somebody else get up. But I heard somebody brief, uh, bring up Raphael Warnock. And it's very interesting, Raphael Warnock. This man, so this man was only used by the Democrats to actually replace or knock uh, Herschel Walker out of the way. Uh, and, and that's basically what he was used for. Now, I will say this. Um, I won't say why Herschel, uh, you know, didn't win or whatever. But I will say that the people of Georgia, they should have known, they should have seen this coming. This this man's wife warned everybody about Raphael Warnock. She said, this man is trifling. He's no good. He's a liar. He'll say anything to get what he wants. He's not genuine. He's inauthentic. And if you didn't get the message, that's your fault. But we are so complacent. We are so complacent and so ignorant to what this government has been doing to us. And that's why I don't understand why black people so easily fall for this stuff. And it really it pisses me off. And, I, and I'm a barber. So I talk to people and I talk to a lot of my clients and I, and I talk and most of them are black and I try to educate them. Right. And I do the best I can. And like I said before, you know, some grasp it, some don't. But that's our major problem. So the answer to your problem to your question. Yes, we are. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um. I, the cone, whoever dropped out, Justin, you're up. And then I'm going to go to Walter. Then I'm going to go to can I, Mia. Can I make a brief remark? 
the gentleman. You ever seen that Richard Pryor thing? He did a skit. They even have the video on it where he's talking about the foreigners, the new foreigners. They supposed to be some new ends. And he said they sit around practicing saying the N word. And he says, now when you go out and you say it and you get your ass kicked, you know you got it going on now. See, that's what we <laughs> kind of have. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, Justin. Hello. Thanks. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Uh, Justin Neal, Hamilton, Ohio. Parents from uh, family from Talladega, Alabama. Uh, but. I'm, you know, yes, we are being replaced by the illegals, but is that necessarily a bad thing? Because the way I look at it, we was enslaved for hundreds of years and I'm an accountant. I got my master's and bachelor's in accounting. So I'm business. I was the director of finance at Arizona PBS and you can't enslave people for hundreds of years and expect them to work after if you are slaves for hundreds of years, you need to be kings after. So whatchamacallit, the workforce, this all DEI talk, that's all distractions is trash. We're not supposed to be working anyway. So if let them take the jobs. That's the way I see it. And all black people, descendants of slaves, we are dealing with trauma. I, I, I'm on long-term disability right now because I have what I call nigger dreams. My ancestors are disappointed with me because I'm going to work and working for these crackers. Which call it? why are you doing this? How much anxiety does this workforce give you? How much are you going through as a black person knowing what we've been through in this country, what our ancestors have been through in this country? What the hell are you doing? Which call it? nah, it's, it's done. It's time now. If you want reparations, like like y'all been saying, you take it. You take it. Which gonna call it FMLA? That's short term disability. You they can't even fire you for twelve weeks. What the hell are y'all doing? What's your thoughts on that, Judge? Well, my thing is usually when you're self-sustaining and self-sufficient, you have less to worry about than when you are dependent on something. Um, yeah, but we're talking about these insurance companies. That's who's paying long-term, short-term disability. So yeah. do we know how much they benefited from slavery. And, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, but the point is that's 150 years ago. The last yeah, still time dealing I with had the some, problem. the last time I had some overt racism was in Hollywood. All the 15 years I was out there, worst I'd seen ever in my life. And I still find that wherever you are on this planet Earth, and I've been all around the world a lot, it's basically the same wherever you are. Ain't nothing for free. Ain't nothing fair. And it's actually kind of ruthless. So when it is, handle it. I mean, don't expect anything to come. Be able to earn it, take it, keep it. Might makes right. Smarts are smarts. Smart people, strong smart people get ahead. Weak people get used. That's the way of the world. It always has been. Now, if you're altruistic, you can do things to help other people out, but never ever count on somebody doing something for you that you don't earn. So I think that that's I think that we agree with that. And I'm saying that we have earned this. If if you no, got a job, talk, and, wait a minute, no, let me can I can I say I'm not no wait a minute. Let me finish mm -hmm. this one. Yes. I you're not talking about the same thing I am. I'm not talking about we've earned it because we suffered so much in this country. Suffering has an interesting value. You know what it is? Zero. Mm. 
But I think that in our current American system, with the health system the way it is and the focus on mental health, we as black people, descendants of enslaved Americans, we need to better ourselves. And I think that one of the best ways to do that is to take care of our mental health. And one thing that I've found is that the system that we are in right now, which allows us to take short-term, long-term disability, gives us that opportunity. I mean, I'm on disability. So let me ask you this year. question, Justin, because yeah. you said that you want long-term nigger something disability. What, it, what was that? I said I have nigger dreams. <laughs> so, so pretty you, much, so, I'm, I'm on long-term disability right now. I get paid $5,000 a month uh, in disability payments through the insurance company, and that is once a month for the next two years. And that's that's going to give me the time to take care of my mental health. Well, what's wrong? Well, okay, so what's wrong with your mental health is that you have nigger dreams. What are nigger dreams? So that's dreams where, I mean, my ancestors, they whipping me. So that and you got proof for FMLA to get paid 5000 a month. First of all, I didn't think FMLA paid that much. They, they pay you 60% of your income. So that means yes. you had to be probably making six figures to yes. get 5000 from FMLA. So you yep. left your six figures because you was having nigger dreams. Yep. And you told the therapist that. Yep. So I mean, I have you, trouble sleeping. Me, I have anxiety. Me, wait, hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. Send me your email. Message me mm -hmm. so that I could go to your goddamn therapist. <laughs> hey, and, and that's the thing. And I didn't even have to go to. So a how did to get how did you opinion? know you had how did you know you were suffering from what was it nigger dreams? Uh, I, hey, it's just what I had. I mean, I go to work. And I feel like shit that I got to work for these people that don't know what the hell they doing in the first place. Mm -hmm. I'm smarter than everybody that I work with at Arizona PBS. Uh, let's see. They don't know what the hell they doing. So, so you got depressed because you're smarter than everybody else. And you started having nightmares of what? Of being chased my as ancestors. a slave? No, no, no. My ancestors being disappointed with me okay. for not fulfilling the, the promise. Which means that you had to go on disability to collect 5000 a month for two years. And after two years, your mental health will be back on track to where you could go back to work. Yes. But imagine somebody yeah. earlier said we got 40 million black people in America. Imagine if all of us had nigga dreams or something like it or actually just took the time. To well, I, I honestly, I think you're full of <laughs> shit. I don't think you're I'm getting 5000 No company okay, we, we, is paying we can someone... Talk. Five thousand dollars a month. It's I can tell insurance. you. I can tell you right now. No insurance company is point. Or were you a CEO? Were you the CFO? No, I was the because director no, of no finance. No insurance company is director going to pay finance. you five thousand dollars a month in FMLA. Director mm -hmm. of finance. Talk, I'm no longer on FMLA. That. FMLA only lasts twelve weeks. So FMLA is twelve weeks. So that's so My short so term not is your, over. It's not your job. It's the state. The state of Arizona. It's no, it's the you insurance. 5, insurance. What insurance? Long-term, short-term disability insurance. That's through your employee, employer. Yes, yes. You just okay. So, long-term, short, short-term disability. They're not paying five thousand because that. Yes, part they of are. FMI, FMI, wait, wait, wait. Would FMI you like me to show you a bank hold statement? Hold on, hold on, hold mm -hmm. on. FMLA. No, we don't need said, your bank statement. <laughs> FMLA, FMLA is federal so that you won't lose your job. But when that expires, then they can let you go. So why they're not going to, they're not, you're full of shit because no corporation, especially health insurance, because I work for the health insurance, Blue Cross Blue Shield for 20 years. They're not paying no goddamn body and they don't give a shit if you the CEO, they'll fire you for two years. 5000 a month for short and long term. Now, if you would have said the state was giving you that check, then I probably would believe you. Other than that, you're full of shit, Justin, because you was having nigga dreams. How about... I got let go from my job during my short-term disability. So and then who's fucking paying you? I'm, I, it got transferred over to long-term because it don't end. Because if you're on disability, when you get let go, 
it don't just stop like that. Yeah, you're already it on it. Stop. It does stop. It does. I can prove to you that it doesn't because I got let go from my job and I'm on long term right, so disability me, right send me, now. So send me copies of your okay. of your long term with the amount and with the approval letter. Send it to me right in my Twitter box, in my Twitter okay. email box. Okay. Yeah. And, so, and, and, then and honestly, the I, and, and mm-hmm. honestly, I wouldn't. I, when you're able to go back to work. I wouldn't hire you because I'm like, listen, you're a fucking liability. Now you're going to wake up and you're going to tell me you'll be having cracker dreams. Yep, yep. Cracker and that's why in that, in any job that. that would do that, I would sue them because that's discrimination. No, no, it's not yes, discrimination. It you can't, you can't, yes, you just I said can, that you, you wouldn't hire qualify. me because I was already on no, disability. No, you know why? You know why it's you're not discrimination? Because when you apply, you don't qualify, sir, because the qualifications for this job position you have to have, uh, um, you cannot have any type of mental breakdown in your history. There are jobs out there to where mentally you have to be mentally sound and you are not. So no, you cannot, you, you cannot sue. You can't. However, you probably want to get sued because you're doing fraud. You're doing disability fraud. Uh, it's fraudulent. not disability fraud. How is okay. it disability fraud? Because you say nigga dream, sir. There's, there's, there's no such thing. There's not there's not a diagnosis for nigger dreams. Now, you probably would have got away with it if you would have said cracker dreams, right? Maybe, maybe some white people were harassing you on the job. But you said nigger dreams because the ancestors were disappointed in you because you're the smartest person in the room and the corporation didn't see your potential. Who the fuck you think you're talking to? And I'm sleepy, so my mouth, my mouth is very loose right now. So I never heard it nigga dreams. I I think it's I think you I think you need to go back to sleep, sir. So let's let's say, let me say this. I was harassed racially. I was called the N word at work by at who? ASU by white by people. My boss. Yes. So then Actually, why, by didn't Asian have, woman. why didn't you have cracker dreams? <sighs> why why nigga she dreams? wasn't white? I said she was Asian. So why you ain't have um chink dreams? Because that's not what I had. How the fuck you know? You said you had dreams. You was you was being harassed by somebody Asian, not by a nigga. No, so I'm then saying. How can it be nigga dreams? You're confusing my words. You're confusing my words. If it was an Asian words. person harassing you. You're confusing my words. No, I'm not I confusing think. shit, sir. You're confused. You're the one allegedly out on disability for mental issues. So you said it wasn't white. They were Asian. But you're still having nigger dreams, even though it was an Asian person giving you the fucking nightmares. I that doesn't make no sense. But thank you, Justin, and you have a good night. Um, uh, let me go to Walter, honey. Walter. Good evening, Dana and Judge Joe Brown. My name is Walter James Hart Jr. I'll be a little funny here, just to get us back on course to all the kings and queens out there. Hello, uh, peace and blessings. Uh, I, I'm on here because uh, I was listening to uh, Joe Brown uh, uh, talk about pimps and hoes. Uh, I have a past. It was 30 years ago. Extra, extra, read all about it. Walter James R. Jr., uh, running for mayor, uh, at, was in a prostitution ring. You go to my feed, you'll see, I mean, you go to my uh, post, you'll see things I post. You go all the way to the end, you'll see uh, uh an actual newspaper front page with me and Trump on there. Uh, and, and I'm going to say something about it, but I want to go to the topic. Are black people being replaced? by? So I'll give Judge Brown credit on one thing. It's that one thing I learned 30 years, you know, being in prison for pimping. And I learned from an, an older guy and a girl, actually it was a woman, that taught me the game. Uh, I, was, I went to college, Southern University, was training dogs for the police department. Was very good at training dogs, left college, started my own business in 1987, Hearts Dog Training Incorporated, started making six figures my first year training dogs. I did that for five years, was meeting now 20. Now keep in mind, I'm 21, carrying a gun legally. I had a CCW permit back when really a lot of people couldn't get them. It was home business and bank, is what what it what it had on there. And uh I was a, uh, a strong leader then. I believe I didn't believe in this system. I've been unaffiliated pretty much my whole life. I'm, I'm sorry. Do you have a question? Because I'm I'm getting tired. Okay. Yeah. Here's here's the question. 
So when you get in trouble, number one, you realize that you are a part of anybody taking your place. Because in Detroit, I grew up in Detroit, and we know that a lot of the Arabs and stuff like that took our stores. And you can see a lot of this stuff going on all over the country right now, gentrification and all that type of stuff. Uh, there's going to be a movie on me. My movie producer is on here. My partner, Madison Lee, who didn't get a chance to come up. Shout out to her, Judge Brown. You need to get with her. She has really got some nice, hot projects. But anyway, to make a long story short, my question is, yes, we when we make mistakes like I did in our lives, what you do is you you challenge your children. I have five children, and they all, my, my babies are getting ready to graduate next year. And they always try to challenge me on things and they always try to do better than me. So I've ran for city council of Detroit, Gaston, North Carolina mayor, always lost because of my past. But it doesn't stop me from trying to be better each and every day and showing my children don't make the mistakes I made because even your own people won't uh, give you a chance as well as uh, they'll ridicule you about your past till you die. But you don't give up and you don't get in trouble so you won't have to go through what I do. So I try to mentor a lot of people, to, uh, a lot of youth and stuff in the, in the community to not go, go down the road I went. So you can make a positive impact of your past and you don't have to be tormented. And I've been self-employed my whole life. I thank God for that. I didn't have to uh, worry about a job when I got out of prison. I was a professional dog trainer and, and it was a blessing. And I'm a land there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, real quick, dog grooming, dog trainers, dog walkers, y'all making a killing. And I think I'm going to start doing dog massage therapy. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, self perseverance. And 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 you have you, Walter, qualify for nigger dreams diagnosis so you could get a check. And you said, you know, F that you are a man. Let me pull Bye. up, you know, Vote my for a real nigga. straps. Vote for a real nigga. Justin, Good honey, and I went, Justin, Justin, I went to your page. Your account says it's suspended. I don't I know, know what because you're doing I've been giving that real. too much free time. I've been giving that real. I'm no, telling people not. what they don't you, want y'all to know. Deceiving the public. No, no, no. No, no, no. Who? What black person ain't got generational trauma that they're I dealing don't, with? I don't, I don't Generational trauma, sir. Yes, I you do. It sounds like no, it. No, do Look not. at how I'm you handle with people. You I'm talk a like a bitch. Like you. You're weak. You're weak. You're Justin. weak. Look you're at weak. how you are as a moderator. You're, you're weak. Bitch. Nigga, you you got nigga dreams. You can't tell me shit right about now. I listen, corn and Madison. Y'all been waiting for a minute, and I had to, I brought you up, and for some reason it dropped down. Um, I'm gonna go to T, Mia. And then I'll go to um, Madison and Corn, and then that's it. Uh, let me unmute. Go ahead. Um, T, go ahead. I can't. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. All right, I don't know yeah, what happened here. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, go ahead, Madison, and then Corn. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you both, Dana and uh, Judge Joe Brown, for holding the room, allowing me to speak. <clears throat> it's not an easy task. I'm a former uh, CBS radio personality and CBS News. And so I just wanted to address the, the topics at the top and also what's been discussed in the room as quickly as I can. Are Black people being replaced by illegals? Um, <clears throat> a lot of that is political. I think that both parties are using Black Americans as proxies. And I found something interesting on the fact sheet uh, on the White House website on how this administration has advanced equity and opportunity for Black Americans in our communities. That's the heading. But at the bottom of the page, they list restoring fairness to our immigration system. They talk about Haiti, the Muslim ban, the African ban. And it's like they're grouping us all together. We have not delineated ourselves. It seems like we're just now starting to do that. So they are looking at these people as Black Americans or potential Black Americans. But I find it telling that we are not, nor have been concerned about all the European immigrants that a lot of us went to school with. I went to UCLA with a lot of them that are overstaying their visas with impunity, living their lives. The government knows where they live. And they keep us worried about the Southern border 
Um, and we didn't give a damn, and Republicans didn't either, when Obama was deporting everybody. He was even vilified and called the great deporter by Republicans. So I don't support, I'm not supporting Trump nor Biden, but for the people who are disgruntled by the Democrats, me being one of them, somebody said earlier, we can decide to vote. And we do. It's like when Jim Clyburn went down South, South Carolina, and Biden was losing, and all of a sudden, and why are we just now starting to exercise that power with a candidate like Trump? We could have picked any other candidate in either party or even threatened to support Marianne Williamson, who who supports reparations and has come up for a number with a number. And she may not win, but we could certainly split that damn Democratic vote until they actually bend to our demands, which leads me to the question, what are we actually demanding of Trump? Or is it just his conjecture about immigration? Uh, which he probably won't live up to. And he's now trying to sabotage immigration because it's his biggest playing chip to get into office because the slow ass Biden administration just now figured out that this is a problem for their constituents and for voters. So Republicans and Democrats have finally sat down to agree to the most sweeping immigration reform that we've ever had. It's almost draconian. And they, and now Trump is trying to sabotage that by telling his portion of MAGA supporters not to vote for it. You know, so it just just some some things to think about because sometimes we see things on the surface, but we're not critically thinking about them in my estimation, you know, and we're not dissecting all the layers that go along with it. And and that brings me to, you know, there was something dangling that came out about P Valley. I'm a filmmaker and I'm an activist. So I exercise my activism through my artistry. I hear a lot of complaints about the industry. I also heard that this is the shiny object distracting us. And it very well can be. I heard that today. I do want you all to know that there's some black folks out here in Hollywood trying to hold the line. It's a hell of a balance. It's not easy for any of us to get something made here. Even a world-class director like Ava DuVernay had to look outside the studio system recently. She has a first look deal with Netflix, but they couldn't get her film done in time before the election. She produced Origin. I suggest you go see it because it talks about Instead of talking about racism, she talks about the fact that America has a caste system. We are second class, if not third, or becoming fourth class citizens. She likens that to the Holocaust and also to the Indian caste system that is still prevalent today. So it's something that makes a bridge in terms of people having this understanding. You look at a show like P-Valley, like uh, Judge Joe Brown talked about earlier. Yes, it takes on historically negative stereotypes, but the truth is these stories and people exist in our communities. The, the real question is how have we as a black community addressed it? Frankly, I'm not sure how we're doing that in terms of tackling these issues head on because some of them seem so daunting, which is part of the reason I became a filmmaker because that's what can move people. Sometimes you have to meet people where they are. You know, Unlike a lot of these shows, that show, if you watch, actually watch it, they don't just show the streets, drugs, pimp and hoe and the rest because I hate shows like that. But it seems like we eat them up. So the way to get through in Hollywood is to, you know, this brilliant young black writer, she provides a creative avenue to approach these, this disturbing subject matter. So it's kind of like a reverse propaganda. It's right underneath their eyes and they're not getting it. So before we throw the show away, you might want to take a look under the hood because what it does is it shows these people and then it shows how the barriers of systemic racism got them there. And it shows their resilience. And it shows them trying to work through and get out of that life. So that's part of the way that we can reach our young people too. We, we may have to use some of these 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 characters to get be, beneath the, the 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 character themselves to get our messages across. You know, it's like that spoonful of sugar. You know, when you know old school used to be, you put a spoonful of sugar and some castor oil or something to get that medicine to go down. Well, some of this art is doing just that. So I just want. Everyone to just just pay attention and, and look a little bit closer. And thanks for letting me speak. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. Uh, you went to UCLA. Yes, sir. I went to Michigan State and I went to UCLA. So which one did you graduate from? Both. Or did you go to both? Both. Both. Okay. What theater arts? No. UCLA? No, actually. Well, I took behavioral psychology in undergrad and then post grad. I took. Um, the business and management of entertainment so that I could learn the business aspects of, of, of the entertainment industry versus just trying to be in front of a camera. No better place to go. Now, 
I said what I said because for a long time I represented the real world people that actually work down in Pussy Valley down in Mississippi. And uh, I was on retainer to a number of strip joints. That's been 35 years ago in Memphis. And I think it is irresponsible to glorify that stuff. Um, I see no redemptive value of it. It ought to be presented as it is. It's a poison. It's an aberration. And people need to be discouraged from doing it rather than having it glamorized. I saw Hollywood get corrupted when they were going broke, when color TV in the late 60s was kicking their behinds and all of the movie studios and they were making enough movies so each studio would be able to provide its associated theater chains with two movies every Thursday, two more every Sunday, and some cartoons and sub-features. It was very expensive. I remember since I took a few classes in television and motion picture production and my good brother was taking them out there. He graduated summa cum laude from UCLA and Cal State at the same time, magna cum laude in geology and petroleum production. Now, um, bottom line is that they wanted to get a cash flow. So they figured instead of doing something highbrow for black folk, they would appeal to the lowest common denominator. And literally I attended a couple of lectures where they talked about glorifying pimps, hoes, drug dealers, and all of the lowest of the low and how that would likely bring in income, which they did. It saved the movie industry. They diversified and they went from 50 cents, uh, walk in anytime you want, get two movies. They went to a buck and a quarter and a buck and a half. You walked in before it started and you left when it was over. And they made money off of black exploitation. And I saw it go downhill from there. And in the 15 years I worked with CBS and Paramount before that, I thought there were some detestable people who were not founded in the real world. So you have to be careful of them. And by the way, when you start succeeding, start putting yourself money away and get your contract. So it gives you the right to inspect their books. They won't let you look at their tax records. Get yourself 150K to do a forensic audit. Jump in line just automatically every time uh, the year comes by so you don't have to wait so long and your key you want is uh, a percentage of the unadjusted gross from the first dollar and get that in your contract and maybe they won't do you so badly and when you catch them they'll give you a real good comeback offer so they don't have to pay up what they use you for but it's an interesting industry all right yeah. um i will say as far as um pussy valley and i want to move on a coin um i agree with both y'all stance on it i personally like the show but um i'm an adult but um and one, but one of the things I did like about the last season, and I'm looking forward to season three, is when they highlighted the suicide with uh, black men. Um, that was very deep, and the acting was superb. So um, I get it, what they were trying, what they're what they're trying to convey, because that that not that industry is not glamour. It is it is dark, you know, and you they're actually peeling back each individual in their lives because you know so you know being in that industry well who are they when they leave that strip club what are they going through what are they dealing with and the location so you know i appreciate that show but i totally get what you're saying judge at the same time but it does hit on a lot of issues that particularly black americans deal with on a daily basis um, I want to go to Corn, then T, and then Judge, you do the closing remarks. Hey, Dana, may I say something real quick? Uh, um, 
I don't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to say real quick that thank you, uh, Judge Joe Brown and Dana, for all of that advice, because it, it is amazing. I know exactly what you're talking about. I don't do material like that, but I try to. This particular show was just a little bit different in that regard because it, sh it doesn't glamorize it. It shows you how horrible it actually is. But I'm doing the hidden figures of auto racing. And I've got my my executive producer is the is the second richest. You know, he's a black billionaire, David Stewart. And so we are trying to avoid those pitfalls by keeping as much in-house as we can, but we know we've got to go to the studio for distribution. And so that unadjusted uh, AGR is that's very important. Thank you for that advice because I know that they will, they did it on the movie Lone Survivor that I was on as well. They made 220 million and said they never made a dime. So thank you for that reminder, sir. Auto racing. So is Lewis Hamilton name going to be? <laughs> In that movie. Lewis Hamilton is actually a friend of one of our executive producers. He wants to act, so we will probably have him do a cameo in it. This is based on an award-winning do PBS documentary that Ruby D and Ossie Davis voices. It's called For Golden Glory. I've got the rights to that and to the companion book, and you can find it online for free. It's called For Golden Glory. These brothers were in the backyard of the Indy 500, built the cars in the in the at nighttime, had to dress like janitors in the daytime. These cars broke speed records and nobody knows their story. And the cars won the Indy and they had their own car racing circuit with over 25,000 spectators from around the country because, and they, they, they broke these records with homemade cars. I'm so excited about it. It's called Erased, E-R-A-C-E-D. It's a triple entendre because it's about racing. It's about raced and they were erased from history. And those are the projects that I'm interested in. I've got IndyCar as my sponsor. I've got Firestone as my sponsor. And Triple A was the agency that kept them out. And you know how many black folks got Triple A? So either they can come on board and do what it is that they can to help make this project, and we can talk about the strides that they've made, or they can stay on the sidelines that they have been, and we're throwing them under the bus. Oh, you know what? I just followed you, but I'm going to send you a message because I would love to interview you because um, that's a great story. So I appreciate that. Um. By the way, look at that old movie they did, one of Richard Pryor's first ones, where he was a moonshiner, or at least running whiskey for moonshiners, and he got into the stock car racing. And I ran into those group, that group you're talking about, or at least got the mention from it. Uh, Indianapolis gave me a tour of that racetrack, and we talked about some of the history. And right. somebody I wanted me to invest in some of the uh, black folk that were trying to get involved in the open wheel racing. Yeah, that, I, I that movie is, is Grease Lightning, and my executive producers yeah. have teamed up with that family. Wendell Scott is his name. That's and, it. Yes, and they're doing animation. They're going to follow up on that story, and they're doing they're getting NASCAR involved. And because they didn't even give him his trophy, because if he got the trophy, he would have had to kiss a white girl. And he won that race and they gave him half the money, didn't give him his trophy and let somebody else get the trophy instead. So we're doing that, the animated version, so that we can show these kids how many great people in history we've had in sports that, sports that we aren't in anymore. Even the Kentucky Derby, black, black jockeys won the first like 18, I believe, and then all of a sudden they disappeared. So these stories have to get out there. All right. Mom, um, I need, I, no, I mean, thank you so much. No, one little quick, one little quick remark because I'll forget it. it. Oh, yeah. I'll forget Appreciate this. Since okay. you're doing this on and you've got Hamilton, do something about that travesty that Formula One did to deprive yeah, him of his eighth right championship. Now, I know, but give I'm her contact information. It. I won't remember it, but I'm just telling her. I right will now, remember sir. it. I, I'll that's it. That's her. it. Got, move on. Move on. Yeah, so go, I want to go to corn and I want to go to tea. We'll and I go to corn. Out. Right. We'll go. Let's go. Let's go. Ahead, Let's go. Dana, Dana, thank you so much, Judge. Thank you so much. I'm not going to be long. I don't want nobody to have a big dream on me or nothing. Um, one thing that I did want to touch on, going back to my colleague, Natasha, um, who was talking about her ancestry earlier. I'm also American Indian um, as well, Judge. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask uh, you and Dana while we're up on stage is we do have a petition for misclassified uh, North Americans and misclassified American Indians like ourselves as tie in to the question, are black people being replaced 
by uh, illegals. I don't really uh, subscribe to the word illegal. I don't think people can be illegal. But, you know, as a person that lived abroad, I think you can't go somewhere um, unlawfully. Um, but within our petition, it does address a lot of um, the Indian treaties that our families um, are connected to. Uh, so we wanted to ask, I specifically wanted to ask if um, y'all would be able to read, sign, and potentially share, retweet our petition. That's all I had. I don't want to keep you out too long. Okay, no so you have a petition, a petition? Did you put it in the message below or something or whatever? Yep. Yes, ma'am. If one of my colleagues could uh, just put that below, just so it's uh, closer to the top. Okay. okay. No problem. All right. No you problem. just at so me, at, at me with the petition and at the judge, and we can re repost it out. Absolutely. I, I'm going to follow you up both now. Thank you so much, Dana. Thank you so you much, welcome. Judge. All right. I want to go right. to T. Go ahead, T. From YouTube. Hey, how you doing, Miss Dana? How you doing, Sir Joe? Just Joe Brown. All right. Hey. Okay. First thing first. Yeah. Uh, Negro Black Americans are being replaced, but this is all falls on generations of propaganda. You can always go back. You can go back to the Golden Sun or something like that with Eddie Murphy. Uh, even look at some of the George Clark Van Damme movies. They always was pushing this feel bad for the foreigner and, uh, uh, you know, that type of agenda. So this has been going on for years or whatnot. The second thing is, uh, the sec the second thing is that, uh, you hear the narrative that blacks are lazy and, uh, this and this and this and that, they don't want to work. So, so that's why we bringing the illegals over here. Well, my thing is this, my question is to the whites and any of these other blacks just going out here saying that, oh, blacks are illegal or, or lazy or whatnot, that's, and they don't want to work these jobs, so that's why we having these illegals come over here. Okay, so at what part in history did, did we uh, start getting lazy or whatnot? Because uh, it must have just started just recently. And then second thing is, if I if I pick a Jezebel or whatnot, a slut out here or whatnot, she out here sleeping around, and cheating on me or whatnot, and she ain't no good. Whose fault is that? So when I go to say that, and, and did I did I know she was a a a, a Jezebel, and I picked her anyway? So whose fault is that? And when I go to say that, I'm using that analogy to say that if blacks were so called lazy, whose fault is that? It ain't the blacks' fault that they was lazy or whatnot. I mean, maybe now it might have been, but where did they get their laziness from? And I would go to say that uh, it was passed on from the white man. You know what I mean? And uh, another thing is that it's really so it's, it's really crazy to me the same way that the drug epidemic affected the Negroes or whatnot back there in the 1970s and 1960s, whenever it really started hitting the black community, is the same way it's affecting the white people right now. And they all strung out on opiums. So what do the white people think is going to happen with immigration? Same way the drugs did to the black community. It's going to be the same thing. That, uh, 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 illegal immigration is ripening the uh, jobs out from black people up under their feet. It's going to affect the white people, too. Another thing is they try to this is a narrative they try to push is that the black people are lazy or whatnot because they that's their excuse to bring these people over here to take us out of position or whatnot. But they the whites or whatnot and liberal blacks. I ain't trying to put it on. Uh, I'm really talking about liberal blacks and liberal whites. They're the ones that's cool with the uh, illegals coming over here. But they try to push the lazy narrative or whatnot because they get federal funding to bring these people over here or whatnot. The second thing is they're not trying to, they're basically doing it saying that we're lazy because they don't want to look bad and basically make it seem like they turning on the black people. So instead of them just coming out saying we don't, we basically trying to misplace y'all and we need a new voting block. They use the, the justification of saying that, oh, they're lazy or whatnot, when that ain't really the truth or whatnot. And then if you willing to trade your own Negro people out and even some of your own white people or whatnot out, what good are you going to be able to be for any of these illegal aliens that's coming over here? So the fools or the illegal aliens is coming over here because they've been used and and that's pretty much all I had to say on that. And then something else Judge Joe Brown has said is that uh, he was saying that the pimps and the hoes and whatnot, they uh, they uh, they don't respect 
they don't respect the black community or the Negro community or whatnot for that. And I agree with him on that time, but uh, they don't need to respect us no more. They don't need to act like they like Negro black Americans no more when we go over to their countries. They don't need to act like they cool with us or whatnot, because guess what? The border is open. They don't need to be, you know, cool with us and act like they down because they can come over here and walk over here and get all these free handouts and give outs that the uh government is getting out so the gig is up they don't need to be uh be friends with us or whatnot but i want to hear what dana or judge joe brown gotta say um you said a lot and also one more thing i'm sorry miss dana i mean to cut you off one more thing i uh uh when did wendell scott that nascar racer he was a, a also a a moonshine runner or whatnot i learned about him i'm 37 i knew about him about when i was about 13 or 14, I was looking up, you know, looked up to my papa. He built cars or whatnot and was into uh, NASCAR. So I just like me and my papa, we history heads. So I just learned that in history or whatnot just to try to uh, try to appease him, you know, just to try to be that, that, that good grandson, the, the smart grandson that he raised or whatnot. But uh, I don't I don't really I don't really need no uh, no uh, black. Uh, movie to see no black movie. I don't want to see no black Jesus movie. I don't want to see no uh color purple movie. I don't want to see none of these old 13 year slavery movies. I want to I want to see a movie about illegal immigration in the in that border. I don't want to see I don't I, I'm getting tired of all the pro black the pro blackies because most of these pro blackies is the ones that got us in this position or what not where this uh where this border is open and you know i'm i'm for i'm for america first when i'm for trump i've been rolling with trump since 2016 i didn't fall for the little the little get up and the little gig they was trying to run saying he was racist i've been rolling with him but truth be told black people um they need to go ahead and keep letting them come over here because you, you you'll start blocking the punch or you start putting your defense up and start uh, blocking your face when you get punched in the face. Black people and Negro Americans ain't been, and, and uh, white Americans, they ain't been punched in the face enough to where they understand the block or whatnot. And they need to go through the pain and suffering or whatnot. And it's going to be a lot of people that's going to be starving, homeless, and dying out here. And maybe you'll stop thanking everybody just because they look like you and they black like you or they, uh, they talking, oh, this abortion rights stuff and uh, my body, my choice. Maybe then after you starving and you hungry and you poor or you don't lost your uh, kids because they send them off to these endless wars. Maybe you will start realizing to vote with your brain and not your heart or whatnot. So, no, they need to go ahead and let these illegals come over here and take everything right from front of these American blacks and these Negro uh, blacks or whatnot. Because if you don't want it, they dang sure want it. And you maybe these Negro blacks wake they, uh, wake they a asses up or whatnot. I'm listening to y'all Thank you. Appreciate that. No, thank um, you for being patient. Yeah, no, thank you for waiting too. And I want to say thanks to everybody on YouTube. Love you guys. Um, thanks to everybody that was listening and to all the speakers. Love you guys. Um, appreciate everyone tonight. And I'm tired. Like, I'm never doing five hours. This is five hours and 30 minutes. Like, this is a lot. And I should never said, oh, just you have time. I'm just going to stick to the three hour mark. Um, every Tuesday, either 4 or 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, three hours. That is it, honey, because um, this is tiresome. I'm tired and I have a headache. But great discussion, you know, from everybody. Great input. Um, great connections tonight. And that's what I think X should be about and is about networking, connecting, sharing ideas, having disagreements agreements all that and um so i just want to say i appreciate everybody in the jumbotron go to judge joe brown get you some barbecue sauce jjbbbq.com um you can also purchase it on amazon so I, it was in the jumbotron all night with the links go to amazon just type in judge joe brown barbecue sauce pops right up or we'll go to the website so you could more you could buy the chicken links and all that it's delicious so i want to promote that um, you could catch Judge Joe Brown live again, but it will be on the website, therealdananetwork.com. I need to put that eventually in the Jumbotron too, start next week. Um, so every Thursday, the judge um, does a show on the website, uncensored. And there's a couple of people that was up here today. I will be reaching out because I would like to invite them onto the show as well. And you can go to my YouTube channel, The Real Dana, on YouTube and subscribe. And Judge Joe Brown YouTube channel, The Real Judge Joe Brown. 
23. And with that, Judge, please close out the space. Okay, let me unmute. All right, I'm unmuted. That was a very good one. The time passed very quickly for me because it's interesting getting the perspective of a lot of people. I've noticed over the last several years, there's been a drift in opinion. And this kind of discussion we had tonight would not have happened several years ago because everybody was uptight fixed in, locked in with their worldviews. Now people are showing that they're beginning to examine them. That's a good thing. Remember, never try to keep somebody from saying something. Because if you restrict one person's rights to speak, you will also ultimately be restricting your own. We arrive at consensus, and consensus is based on the free exchange, the open exchange of ideas put forth vigorously. Argument is not a fight. It's a method of testing ideas, modifying them or solidifying them, or finding that there are better things. So, Keep on doing what you're doing. Life is not fair, but learn how to deal with it. So with that, time to get on up out of here. Good night, everybody.